Hi, this is Gautam, your instructor. I'm a data engineer and I do have 10 years of experience in big data domain. I just created a 17 hours of full length video course for big data engineering. So this course includes all the concept of big data, practical as well as theory. And this course also includes interview preparation, project explanation, resume preparation, and then interview question and answer discussions. So this video will be very suitable for beginners especially. And even intermediate level people can also learn this course. So data engineering is one of the leading tech stack in the market, even almost in the last 10 years and till now, data engineering is leading in market. So you can refer websites like Glassdoor to get this information. So data engineering career choice is one of the best choice that you have made. So now let's get into the topic. So YouTube has a restriction that I cannot upload a video with a length of more than 12 hours. So I just decided to make this as a two part of video. So part one and part two. So make sure you watch both the part of this video. Let's get into the topic. This this uh, session is like a, an, an overview, a demo of what is big data. It's completely a theory session. It's not a practical session. Okay. So a big data, which is very uh, familiar terminology for all of us, right? So a big data, people used to say, your colleagues and your friends used to say big data technologies. Uh, and, and they used to say two particular terms, Hadoop and big data. Okay. So people who are very new to this, People will be uh, the one question people used to ask me when I start this particular session. What is the difference between Hadoop and big data? Some people are saying Hadoop and some people they are saying they are big data developer. So we are uh, hearing these two terms very frequently in the big data market. So what exactly the difference between these two? Okay, so I will tell you that. Okay, I will start the uh, session with this uh, difference between first of all. Okay, so here Hadoop as is a solution. Okay, solution of what? Okay, so since you are new, you may get this question. So Hadoop is one solution for data related problems. For now, you can keep this only in your mind is fine, is wide enough. And big data, as you know, even you are very new to this, but you may are, you may aware of it, right? So big data is a problem, okay? So we don't want to jump into the solution. We will first start with problem. We understand this problem and then we can move on to the solution okay even if you take this problem right so all this problem started with what what is the scratch for this problem it's data right the scratch for uh, a big data is data right okay now the question is what is data okay so data is all about collection of information right so information so I have a data which is a collection of information so what you will be doing with this data as a human, you can say what, what you will be doing with the data. Okay, so with the data, I'm saying just, I, I'm, I'm just giving my information to you. I'm saying that I'm Gautam. I work for so-and-so company. So this is my information. I'm just giving it to you. And what immediately you will do, you will store my information. And that's what the mission will do. And that's what the applications will do. And after storing the data, what you will do? Okay, uh, I means you get a chance or we get a chance to meet each other uh, somewhere in the uh, meetup you are seeing me and then what you will do, okay, this is the guy who used to upload videos in YouTube channel and you recognize me and you know, you come to know my name and you are saying, hi Gautam, how are you? So you are giving a greeting to me, right? So that means you are processing with the data about me what you have already stored in your mind and that means you do process. So with the data, uh, so the missions and applications also will do the same. So with the data, I can do two things, store and process, store and process. That's it. Now, when you get a problem with storage and when you get problem with processing, okay, and the data is called problem data and that problem data is called big data. Okay. So this is a definition of big data. You can keep this as a definition as well. So problems, problem with storage and problem with processing. So this problem is something because of my data is a problematic data and that is we call them and that we call it as big data. So now the question is what what problems? So the problems are infinity. Okay, so we do have some myths like wrong understanding. So that also I'm going to clarify. Okay, so I will tell you what are all the wrong understanding that people used to have when they come into big data and even people who has some experience in big data still they used to have these kind of uh, wrong understanding and myths about big data. So I just will clear you all those stuff. So one such thing, um, a myth is like I'm going to tell you now. 
so here when i say infinity the problems can be anything with the data okay so when you take problems the very first problem for people used to tell me is volume okay so when when i go for some meetups or some uh, universities or uh, technical workshops when i ask what is big data to the audience they used to say immediately uh, huge volume of data is called big data okay what problems you will solve with big data people used to say volume problem so people used to think volume is the only problem and that we can fix with big data technologies and but that is it's not completely true when you say only volume it's false so we have so many problems in data and we have so many solutions in big data to solve that so many problems so volume is not the only problem we have and if you take any leading use cases in any big companies to small companies where they use big data go and ask them tell your use case so they will be telling the use case only out of 10 companies two companies can tell you or two use cases can explain you the the, the problem is volume but the remaining eight companies or eight use cases will be different problems you can you can you can state the statement like this big data can solve any problems volume is one out of that any problem is correct statement but when you say volume is the only problem that we can fix in big data is totally wrong okay so this is the first myth that people used to think about big data so volume is one out of n problems so what problems we do have uh, with the uh, big data so we have a problem with value the quality of data and uh, we have the problem with visualization and we do have problem with velocity the speed in transaction and speed in processing is called velocity and then we do have problem with variety structure semi structure and unstructured data processing and then we do have volatile viability so all problem statements has been means they used to it's it's a trending uh, terms so any problems that you bring you have to convert it to some synonym so that the first letter should start with v but that is a trending terms uh, so all the problems will start with v but still you can say storage issue processing processing issue instead of saying velocity you can say speed in transaction it's up to you but these are some terms that people used to use so we do have these many problems and for these problems in big data you have solution okay and one more thing i want to tell you as a data engineer i am not here to support big data or i am not uh, marketing big data technology so you have any solution uh, and that can be fixed outside the world of big data and the cost is still low or the product is free yeah you can go ahead it's not a mandatory thing that you need to always go with big data technologies only okay this is also one statement i wanted to tell you okay fine now uh, we do have these many problems as i told you and one uh, one scenario that i wanted to explain you here again the point is coming for the volume again so this is a scenario that happened in my life 3 years back i have attended an interview it's a it's a it's a banking company so in the interview uh, the the interviewer asked me the question so tell me about your project i started explaining all the stuff what i have done in my project with spark hive and hadoop i explained everything and uh, and en at end i also explained uh, the volume of the data that i used to have so my volume of data it's around like 25 gb by end of day for one country so this is what i told him but he was not satisfied i am not sure whether he is trying to test me but but this is what happened i I'll, i'll tell you that i asked him like uh, he said i am not satisfied I asked why uh, he said 25 gb of data is what you are processing for one country by evod this 25 gb seems to be very less right so why then you are coming for big data this is what the question he asked then i told him the problem is not with volume in my project the problem is the existing technology the processing speed of of the uh, data was slow so the data storage was not a problem in the previous technology the data storage is still fine with the previous technology we migrated to big data only for the processing speed so i told him volume was not the use case in my project the problem is velocity that's speed in processing but still he was not satisfied because he was very keen about uh, the size after giving him lot of examples but he was still not satisfied but then i asked him a question so 
can you tell me your use case so then the interviewer like he started explaining a uh, use case he said like we do have some different data sources and uh, and there is one such uh, project in which we have almost 100 gb of data even more than that by end of day for one country he said so then i said like sarcastically i said oh, in that case you want me to exp if if i say more than 100 gb you will be satisfied so then he laughed so then I, I means then he said but still 100 gb is huge compared to your 25 gb right that's so this is what he said then i i gave him a scenario i told him if you are attending an interview in companies like google and facebook if they ask you the same question what will be your answer he said i will say 100 gb then i told him for facebook and google Per second, they process petabits and petabits of data, and of course, they are also using Hadoop and big data technologies. And for them, your 100 GB is very low, right? And they will not be satisfied with your R volume, right? So this is what I told him, and then he laughed, and then he moved on to next question. So why I'm explaining you this, right? So still now, people used to ask me in interviews, like people are asking me about the volume, but I really work on Hadoop projects only, but my volume is very less, and uh, I'm not confident to say that volume. So my friends, like they are, they are really working on big data for two to three years, and then they they are trying to move on. And in the next interview, when they ask for the volume, they, they are processing like more than 100 GB per day for one country, but still they are like not in. They are they don't have the confidence to tell that my volume of data for per country per day is 100 GB because they think 100 GB seems to be very low. So that is not the case. For that reason only, I am telling this. This will build the confidence for you. See, even you process 10 GB of data, you can still say, I process 10 GB in big data. Now, now if I am asking you a question, what is the size of big data? So, you, you are, there is 10 people sitting here, I am asking. So, people will say different sizes to me, right? One guy will say 100 GB, one guy will say 200 GB, one guy will say petabyte, yottabyte and skettabyte. So, your current technology gives you the means your previous technology gives you the answer for the question imagine i worked on oracle and uh, i means i'm just saying an, an example in oracle i'm not uh, means uh, in my oracle system if i process more than 10000 tb of data i'm getting an issue less than that it is working fine then for you for your technology 10000 tb if you cross then you can bring big data into it so if you if you see the use cases of different companies go to their engineering blog if you see facebook will say i use big data and my data size is petabytes and and there is one more small startup company they say we use big data and my data volume is just gigabyte that's fine so their existing technology has given the problem with that particular size that's it so the answer for the question what is the use case of the volume i mean why what is the size and why you moved to big data the answer is with your previous technology so in my company i worked on oracle in oracle i was not able to process more than 100 gb so i would have moved on to big data that's it statement completed it's not like you have to say more than petabits and petabits of data that doesn't matter i mean it it's, doesn't make sense okay so when when someone tries to get this from you and they still not satisfied it's their mistake okay so uh, even you process just 1 gb of data which was not possible in your previous technology and you are doing it big data that's fine your 1 gb is your use case actually so that means like you have 5 gb pen drive and i'm asking you to store 6 gb data is not possible right so for that 5 gb pen drive the balance 1 gb data is big data that's it okay so the scenario I just explained you, the reason I wanted to build you the confidence that volume is not the only problem, we do have a lot of, lot of other problems. Okay, fine. So now uh, we, we, we kind of understood uh, uh, the problems, what we face with data. And we do, we are facing all these data problems, but the reason is like the application's usage, right? So the, the, we got the same application in mobile and in desktop and in the laptop, tablet. So people usage means the usage of uh, uh, having the data usage got created. So both in front and back end, we got a lot of problems and people invented such technologies to solve it. And if you take, we do have more than 10,000 plus solutions for data under the big data technology okay so we do have 10,000 Hadoop is one such technology like that we have Spark, Kafka, Strom, Flume so we have so many other technologies and that uh, they have invented to solve different different problems for the different different uh, means uh, data layers okay so now we are coming to the one more uh, next point like uh, people used to ask me like who are you I used to say I'm a big data engineer 
and then uh, in my team I do have some testers and BSAs they used to ask me okay so you say that you are a big data engineer so big data means problem that means you, you, you gonna build a problem <laughs> means sarcastically they used to ask me so I'm telling you why people uh, gave a name as big data and that's what I'm trying to tell you so uh, we do have 10,000 plus technologies in market and they wanted to bring the, that into a one market like we have C, C++, Java and we call it them as programming languages, right? So similar to that, we need to give a NFI term to all these solutions. So they came up with the problem name itself as a market name. Big data is a problem name. But the thing is they don't have any other names. So they just gave this big data as a technology name, the market name, the designations name. So they, they just gave the problem name as a solution name and that's it. There is no big uh, history about the word big data and all. Okay, fine. Now uh, we discussed like uh, what is big data and uh, what the main two problems and then under those two problems what are all the sub problems we do have and then what is the naming history of big data. Fine, so this will give you an kind of and kind of an overview of stuff and big data what type of uh, 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 like layers that the big data has okay let me remove this okay data layers so in big data you have technology for storage that means databases and file systems and in, in big data you have technology for processing for data processing and th these are called state so this is one data layer storage layer processing layer and we do have technology for data testing and we do have uh, for visualization and we do have technology for data science machine learning and artificial intelligence etc so we call it as analytics and we call processing as analysis and we do have technology for automation scheduling etc so many so many layers so big data also covers so many layers so you can ask me a question so these layers are already there right so we do have for storage we have oracle and mysql for processing we do have some processing frameworks like informatica and etl but still these layers also supported in big data as well but with the different technology names okay fine and i have a separate video uh, like explaining you the different layers of data okay so i have a separate video i've just given that video link in the description box you can have a look so big data also support these layers but in my upcoming video for each layer i will give you the example of big data technology and i will explain you that but that i will do in a upcoming videos but not now fine so the next thing i, I want to explain you the uh, history of uh, hadoop Okay, so the agenda is not exactly to explain you the history. The reason is something else. I'm, I'm, after explaining the history, I'm going, to, I'm going to explain you something else. So uh, the agenda is not exactly for you to know what is Hadoop and how means for this session, who created it, how created it. It's not required, but with that, I'm, I want to explain you something else. Okay, fine. So Hadoop, uh, like in 2002, Google released a paper called GFS, Google File System. Uh, it's to distribute the data. And in 2004, Google released another base paper called Google Map Reduce. This is to process the distributed data. Okay, it's, the data is already distributed in GFS. So to, to process that data in a distributed in a parallel processing, they got GMR. And Google invented these two base paper in these two years. So in mid of 2005-06, uh, Hadoop has been invented by duck cutting so he invented this so he's an ex-employee of Yahoo he has his, his own company I will tell you the company name so Hadoop has two projects HDFS and then MapReduce so GFS to HDFS and GMR to MR and Hadoop has so many other sub projects but that was not there in the initial releases and even now Hadoop when you install Hadoop you will get only HDFS and MapReduce some people might have a question now I have I have heard something called Hive, Scoop, Pig, so and so so those things have been invented by different uh, contributors, different group of people and different companies and they give support to run it on top of Hadoop okay but duck cutting invented as Hadoop only these two projects okay fine so one more interesting fact I want to tell you here is so this GFS is a paper which is released in the year 2002 itself right and uh, Google by the time they have already implemented it they just released the paper only and imagine when they have started 
thinking about the idea of this GFS. They released in 2002. That means when they have started it, that means it's touching 90s, 1998, 1999, right? The technology which we call so modern today has been invented like 1998 and 1999 itself. So that is a generation, technology generation gap between big companies and two assets always happen. One more example is I, I, I think like Android application and a solid application, a phone what developed by 2012 or 13, I think so. But by the time Google said it is 10 year old project, that means it's, it's like, uh, it's like uh, 10 years old from 2012 is something again it's touching 90s so by the time only we started using this the, the Nokia Nokia black phone right it's like a brick okay but that that's there uh, uh, it's a technology gap it always be there but that's fine I just it's an interesting fact I just added it in between fine so this is the uh, history so after inventing this Hadoop Ducketing announced this as open source so open source okay people who are very new to open source i will just take five minutes of time to explain you what is open source so people who is aware of open source maybe you can skip this part and you can you can forward the video and see the next thing what i'm explaining okay so open source is something what if i ask what you will say the the source code is free okay then people will ask me if i give my source code for free then how i will be getting money right so if i'm giving my code for free then how i will get a money okay i will explain you how this works it means in a very layman term i will explain you so if you invented some uh, hadoop like this you have invented so what you will do uh, so i want to give the, i want to sell it to a company then what you will do you will up, you will book an appointment to google or facebook and you will go there you will give a presentation and you have to first of all get the appointment and then they have to like your project and then only they will like they will say like okay i can take this but it's like you have to go to the doorstep of each and every company and you have to explain them, right? But open source will work in reverse. So you have your own website, imagine Gautam.com and I release my code and company started looking into my website and they, and they like my code and they download it and they will use it. And then they will come to me and they will say like the code what you have in your website is really good. I will give you funding. You give me this project and also you, 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 you create such projects for me. So this will work like this, okay? So it's like you give things for free and companies will come back to you. They will pay for you to give such support to their company. So this is what open source. This is how open source will work. And now there is a point like how many companies will trust my website, Gautam.com, right? No one will trust, right? So how come uh, the, the website can have virus contain, containing code as well, right? So we have some uh, community they will give license to the open source code. So one such community, very famous, you might have heard about it, Apache Software Foundation. So it's like ISO. Uh, in India, we used to get that ISO, right, for the company and the product. So similar to that, these guys will give you the license. And this Apache license was trusted by the whole world of IT giant companies. They will trust this. And each and every company, they have their own research and development, right, team. So these research and development team used to always monitor this Apache website and any new source code comes to it, they will download and they will explore. And if they love it, they will approach back to you and they will they will give you the funding for you to create such projects and give support for them okay so apache software foundation to which duck cutting released it so he donated this project to asf apache software foundation so maybe you can ask me if my project is there in apache software foundation but it was not liked by any companies then what it's 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 kind of an um, um, it's kind of like loss for me no it's not loss if your project is in apache it's like it's like a huge uh, recognition for you if your, your project is in Apache you can add that in your resume that will give you like more opportunity with respect to job as well fine and the people who release their project in Apache it's not like an one person it, it could be a group of team or it could be a company as well okay fine so now now comes so I told you right I'm explaining the history not for really to know what is this Hadoop and when they invented it, right? So uh, there is a different thing I want to explain based on this. So that different thing is, now I am a company. I have my own company called A and it's an IT company. I want to do this Hadoop stuff. Okay, Hadoop is an Apache Software Foundation. So I, I wanted to use this code to in my project for my client. Now the problem here, Apache Software Foundation will not give any support for your uh, for you. 
it's 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 a community that's it you can download the code and you can use it and that's it they won't give you any support so that means uh, if you if you do, if you take any companies even the products means the code the hadoop is very wonderful project and it's it's worldwide used by people and it's a hit project but still there is no support i can't use it so downloading apache i mean hadoop or any any component from apache is just useful for you to test in your personal laptop or you can do a small proof of concept to poc but this is this cannot be implemented as is in your project the reason is as hadoop as a product that doesn't have any support from apache if you have any technical issue or if you have any infrastructure problems you cannot go back to apache it's like a stack overflow you will be having some command where you can raise your question and people who have time they will come and answer you so that means as a company ceo or a company architect i cannot use this now this is a problem so the company likes hadoop but there is no support so they can't use now someone is coming in between to solve this problem so what this guy is doing okay this is this this is like uh, i'm okay gautam so what gautam is doing so gautam is downloading the hadoop code had the complete hadoop stuff and then he's learning in and out what it has and what company requires so he's asking to this guy what you need in this hadoop apache hadoop so he's he's is replying back i need support okay so what this guy is doing he's hiring some people under him okay and then he is explaining what what are all the things in hadoop and how to, what are all the problems will come how to fix it how to create a cluster how to provide an infrastructure all things so he is building a team and they call themselves as a support team now i am releasing this particular hadoop whatever i have downloaded and i created a support team and whatever not there in hadoop okay security is not there i will add ui is not there i will add infrastructure is not there i will create a cluster for you so i will build this as a package i am releasing it in the name of uh, gautam data box you can ask me what this gautam data box has it has hadoop that's it but i am giving support so now i formed a company called gautam and i am there to sign an agreement with this particular company a saying that i will give support you can use my hadoop i will give all support so here this gautam data box is completely free but for the support but for the support the client has to the company a has to pay for me okay so now they call this as commercial hadoop so that means what i am doing is i am providing big data as a service hadoop as a service so in real time big companies will not use apache hadoop or apache spark or any apache big data component so they will use some company who provide support to it and we call them as a commercial product so to explain this only i have explained the history of hadoop but this is the same case for any other component spark or anything else so i will explain you such commercial uh, enterprise or enterprise edition of hadoop okay there are some companies who is doing this cloudera so cloudera is the company was formed by the ducketing who is father of hadoop okay with some group of engineers as a partners and the second leading company in providing big data as a service in market hartan works first is cloudera and recently these two company has been merged and the next company is amazon and uh, there is a company like uh, google is also doing this sorry uh, uh, microsoft is also doing this had IBM is also doing this and there is a company called Mapper is doing this DataBricks all all these guys what they are doing is they just download the apache products and they give some add ons and they they will create a support team and they will sell the product and they have uh, all these what all these companies are doing is they are providing big data as a service that's it so cloudera product name is cloudera vm Hartanox product name is HDP uh, Hartanox platform sandbox development platform yeah D for development HDP Amazon they have their own big data services EMR Microsoft is HD Insight if you have a Microsoft Cloud account Azure you can use this HD Insight IBM uh, they have their own uh, big data as a services Big Insight mapper they have m3 m5 m7 and extra kind of versions databricks is again a databricks sandbox 
So uh, what, what all these people are doing, I'm repeating and again and again, they are providing big data as a service. They have Hadoop, Spark, all big data components. Mostly they will build as a package and they will give you. And uh, these products are, uh, means you have trial versions and free versions. You can download and you can use it. But for support, you have to pay for it. Okay, so you can ask me, okay, if I want to learn it, uh, learn Hadoop or Spark, any component in my personal laptop, uh, which uh, distribution you would uh, suggest? So I will suggest always Apache. Okay, so Apache is what I will suggest always. So these uh, flavors, like some companies will, so I worked in Cloudera, Hartanox, EMR, and I don't have uh, experience on these three. I worked on this, I worked on this, I worked on these two. So I, I, I'm not sure which distribution I will be working in my next company. So so it's like Apache is always a common one. And even if you, you can do freelancing as well, but these are enterprise editions. So it's not uh, that much easy. And uh, you, your laptop requirement, hardware requirement is also important. You need at least more than 8 GB of RAM at least to deploy all these enterprise editions. But what these things are doing, the same thing you can do with Apache as well. But the problem here is you have to install you have to configure everything you have to do but here everything it's like a, a switch you can on it everything will be get started so Apache is what I suggest, but then uh, at end, like uh, five minutes, I will explain you how to project it in your resume. That I will explain you as short. I will explain you uh, that I will. So that will be the next part. So uh, I hope you understood this particular thing. And now coming uh, to the next slide is next thing is prerequisite. So the prerequisite is not for Hadoop, it's for big data. So you need to know Linux. So what level of Linux you need to know as much as possible you can learn is fine. Okay, so as much as you can learn is fine for it. So Linux is very important and then knowledge on SQL, uh, SQL, structured query language. It's like DML, DCL and DDL commands are wide enough. You don't want to go for uh, stored procedures or triggers. So PLSQL kind of stuff is not required. Basic SQLs are wide enough, joins, subqueries and insert, update, delete. So that level is wide enough and then programming language okay the next myth people used to say uh, we need to know java only then we can jump into big data it's not like that it's like 50 50 so sql uh, 50 percent and then uh, programming language 50 percent and then yeah, linux also plays an important role so it's a mix set of thing okay it's not like you need to know only sql you need to know only java it's not like that and even in programming language it's not like you need to know only java any programming language is wide enough. It's not always to be Java. That's very important. It's again a myth got created. Big, even Hadoop, you take Spark framework or Hadoop framework. You may be very new to this, but uh, you, you may be asking a question like always he's saying Hadoop, Spark, what is this, what is this? So Hadoop is one framework to solve a data problem and Spark is another framework and that also will solve the data problem. It depends on the purely on the company solution architect to decide which one and some people can use will use both okay but i will explain you everything in my upcoming videos okay so if you take a uh, programming language wise java is not only thing that you need to learn so but the preferred language i ask you to learn is java or python okay and there is one more language uh, like people started using it widely scala but any framework that you take supports all these three so you can pick any one and you can be uh, means you can learn it but it's 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 if you go for an interview and you are a big data developer but they are asking with java but that's still fine you can attend the interview it's not like i am a big data developer but i worked in python so i cannot attend that interview don't do that okay it's it's my advice don't do that so big data developer is what the priority for the company when they go for interview but the jd has java but don't get confused okay please attend it so many people are doing this mistake okay see you can easily migrate your scala knowledge to java and python knowledge to java if the company asking you java it's all about clearing that interview that's it once you get into the work you can easily migrate your knowledge but that is what people are doing the mistake and they are losing the opportunity from uh, opportunities that comes from the big companies and big product based companies so don't do that okay you attend it still you attend it the priority is big data not programming language okay okay so you know big data and how you are applying it through what the communication medium is what they prefer java you say that you know java and attend it and then you can convert the things whatever the question they ask from scala to java python to java you convert the knowledge that's it 
fine so this is what the prerequisite site and the next thing with respect to uh, uh, job but this uh, i will be making such separate videos for jobs and interview preparation and all but this video as a whole i want to give you so i will explain you in short now coming to the experience for the freshers okay so for the freshers taking freshers for big data things are happening now but but still you need general it experience at least one year or two year general it you can be from testing support or data side or mobile computing cloud web is fine but you should have some one to two years of general it experience and then you can learn big data and you can move on to this field next for experienced people yeah the same see so far you have been for mainframes for 10 years and you are been in uh, for etl for 10 years or 5 years and you were been in testing for 10 years is still fine so uh, big data is like a multi tenant uh, uh, market it's not like people only from java can enter into it or people only from sql can enter into it it's not like that so once you enter into big data you will come to know that and people ha means who is in, in the interview panel right so imagine big data uh, as a as a companies people started using big data from the year of 2014 only so uh, my passed out year is 2013 and i have seven years of experience now for now see uh, uh, here uh, if you if you take uh, uh, people started using big data from 2014 from 13 to 14 a lot so if interviewer is having like 10 years of experience and he or she cannot say that my experience has been started as big data developer no they cannot say right so what i'm trying to tell you is so it's not like your previous experience should be a big data developer or your previous experience should be only in java or only in um, sql it's not like that see you can be from any technology it's all about you learn big data you do some POSs, and then you prove them in the interview that you have the knowledge on it and that's what you have to do so don't hesitate so if you are trying to move for some different technology like data science or big data or cloud computing you can pick this that's my option means that's my suggestions for you okay so this is what i want to tell you with the job perspective and uh, when it comes to resume yeah i want to tell you one more thing so they can ask you this question in the interview what was the distribution hadoop distribution that you have used i explained you right cloud era heart and works amazon emr so they are called the distributions okay that that's what the distribution that's what the environment so when you say apache right apache is what i told you to use it when you are in the learning phase but when you say apache people will think apache was not apache hadoop or apache big data services are not used by real time companies right and that means he is not having knowledge and that's what people will think so you have to say the cloud ra heart and such environment so the environment is different the content inside the environment is still same okay so you can download cloud ra heart and you can give a try you can learn it and you can you can do uh, you can explore and then you can attend the interview and when someone is asking you this question which distribution of hadoop you have worked you can say cloud ra you can say heart and you can say mapper right it's things are same okay so we don't know what distribution they are using right it's it's all about they are just trying to test you whether you worked in real time distribution or not end of date is a black window that's it it's everything is a linux commands trust me <laughs> once you get into the project you will come to know the roadmap for big data engineering and in recent days like so many of them have asked me like how to start with data engineering and especially how to start with big data engineering so if you are looking for a career change and uh, data engineering is a very good choice to pick and uh, if you are very new to this particular field and you are like uh, planning to change to this data engineering domain and you will be getting a lot of questions right like how to start where to start so i've just created this customized roadmap for you and i will explain you i'll just go through these steps in total i'm having eight steps and uh, you can you can see here like i have uh, specified the du duration so like you can just sit two hours daily and you can prepare for your data engineering role so that it will just take only two months for you to complete uh, uh, to complete the complete stuff of uh, uh, prerequisites and uh, the actual thing for data engineering okay let me go through uh, by step by step <clears throat> and this is gautam and i'm working as a data engineer uh, so i'll be explaining you this content now fine the very first thing uh, like uh, data engineering when we say data engineering like people used to think it's only big data engineering but it's it's not like that any data related technology that you go ahead and you work with it and you are a data engineer you work for oracle you work for informatica some abinacio some etl tools or 
out you are still a data engineer but uh, the data engineer uh, when we when we say data engineering uh, under data engineering the modern spec is big data so if you are in a place to choose a new uh, career or, or you want to just uh, switch from your existing like people used to come from mainframes testing support and uh, you just wanted to enter into data engineering and data engineering under data engineering you have so many tech stacks as I told you not only big data we have other data technologies as well but in data engineering picking up big data is a is a demanded skill so that's the reason like people used to say data engineering means big data it's not actually uh, the true statement uh, like since it has the demand people used to think like that so but i recommend in data engineering i ask i'll recommend you to go for big data tech stack only okay so let's start here so the very first thing like what you have to start with is linux so here the big data environment is completely linux based it supports windows but thing is that is just for uh, a support they have given but in real time or the complete big data environment and setup will be get installed on top of the linux environment only so it's always good to have linux knowledge and any flavor of operating system you can install in your mission like linux in linux we have ubuntu red hat SUSE, centos so any OS you can install you practice with the basic cell commands and cell scripting is wide wide enough and it hardly takes you like one week of time for you to spend just to learn Linux and uh, so the very first step is completed and the second step learn SQL SQL so database language so rdbms relational database management system so sql is very important here uh, because like uh, and and what level of sql is important if you see like uh, create insert delete joins sub queries and uh, uh, that's that's wide if enough and and uh, queries like ranking and ronum functions so these are some uh, range based uh, functions so that's enough you don't want to go for tr trigger stored procedures we don't have such requirements in big data so sql based some tools we have in big data and for that reason only we are asking people to have sql as their prerequisite so for this you can install any of the rdbms database like mysql and oracle and you can practice some basic sequels so i will prefer you to go for uh, mysql database flavor of sql okay so the the sql what you type in mysql is little bit different what you type in oracle so i'll recommend you to go for mysql sql just install mysql practice some basic sql and if you're already aware of linux and sql you can skip these two steps okay so the second part is done so again for learning sql it will just take two to three days it's wide enough for you to complete uh, the topics what i told you right uh, only you can concentrate on that and third and third step is learning programming languages so this is something like people used to be like worried but I'm, I'm i'm strongly telling you that you don't want to get a panic or you don't want to worry because programming language is one of the uh, must a thing that uh, a developer should know whether you are into data or outside data because uh, programming language became a basic prerequisite for many of the tech stack and when you take programming languages in big data three leading programming languages are there java python and scala so out of this you can pick any one so it's not mandatory that i have to learn all it's not required you can pick any one out of this three and then you can just java or python or scala just pick any one and the topics what you need to uh, cover in these languages the core the basics is very in enough so you don't want to go for uh, if you pick java people used to think whether i need to learn ui a web interface or network programming or any other additional uh, window based application programming you don't want to learn such things even threads are not required so what you want to learn i have made a separate video uh, called uh, programming languages for data engineering so i have given that link in the description box of this video you can just go ahead and see like I have mentioned what are all the topics required for you to learn but again I will, I will just give you the topics here as well so you need to know for example if you pick Java you need to know like uh, what is Java the architecture of Java advantages disadvantages and so on so the use cases and then move on to variables data types if loop for loop the conditional statements and loopings and then uh, coming to oops concepts so you have that seven oops concepts class object inherit and so on so and then collections like map list set jdbc connectivity program and then string handling exception handling that's it and file handling only these topics are enough for you to jump into any data related technologies 
and for this hardly it will take one week a time i can say you one week two hours daily one week to 10 days it's wide enough for you to just learn a programming languages okay and that is hardly enough so you can tell me like uh, i'm not telling this for a specific area of people i'm not explaining this roadmap for a sql developer i'm not explaining this roadmap for a programmer i'm not explaining this for a cloud developer i'm just explaining the roadmap very common that anyone can pick even a fresher can able to use this roadmap whatever i'm explaining here fine so the third step is completed next fourth step entering into big data tech stack so in big data you have so many tech stacks but in real time what actually we are using is hdfs hive this two components from hadoop and then spark batch and spark sql so these two components from spark so there is only two uh, framework we use in real time Hadoop and Spark in big data we are using. So in Hadoop, HDFS and Hive is very widely used. And then in Spark, Spark Badge and Spark SQL. So only these four tech stack is wide, wide enough as a as a very beginner and very newcomer to this field. So these four topics are wide enough for you to work even in the projects at the day one. Okay, so here I just want you uh, want you to recommend some something. So I have a video called What is Big Data? I, I, I'm, I'm, I will recommend you to watch this video. So I'm, I'm just giving these video links in the description box of this video. As part of this roadmap, you have to take a look on those video as well. And then second, I was unboxing the Hadoop framework. In Hadoop, uh, we have HDFS Hive. So means we are not only having HDFS and Hive. In Hadoop framework, we have almost like eight to nine components, out of which only two is enough for you to get start. Okay, even in real time, we are using only these two. Maybe you can check with any of your big data developer friends or or connections in your LinkedIn, what tech stack they are using. By default, they will be telling you all these four and they will, no one can remove anything from these four, but they can add something newly. But these four components will be default in any projects you go. Okay. And uh, if some people are very much already aware of what is big data tech stack, some people can ask me, what about no SQL database? Okay. I have not included that here because out of 10 projects, only two or three projects will use no SQL and even no SQL. You can learn even entering into the project that that is not going to be the very strong component in your interview conversation. Okay. So, okay. Coming back to the list of videos, what you have to see for this step four uh, to get start with the step four. So I have explained uh, what is big data 40 minutes video. I recommend you to completely watch that video that will give you an overall understanding of what is big data even a fresher can able to understand that and this will be your very first video to get start with big data and second uh, Hadoop uh, framework so I have just uh, explained each and every component in Hadoop as like a one-liner so that is very much important for you to uh, look into it and then again the same way i have uh, there is a video spark introduction again in spark also i have explained each and every component of spark and the one liner and also some some kind of an introduction i have given so these three videos i will highly recommend you to watch okay before getting into deeper into these concepts okay and for uh, hive spark batch spark sql again i have a video so the playlist links are there in the description box for spark i have a separate playlist for hive i have a separate playlist and for hadoop also i have a separate playlist where you can pick all the uh, where you can find all these topics if one or two topics what was not there in the in my channel just you can check with some other channels or some other uh, in google you can check but for sure i'm telling you as a whole as a whole co concepts of topics of big data i am gonna soon soon upload a lot of videos in my channel please stay in touch with my channel and the playlist okay so now you are into this and you are practicing all this and even i have a video for hadoop installation i have a video for spark installation so these uh, like one two three four five videos are wide enough for you to get start working on uh, the samples and you can start learning on the stuff so these uh, five videos are really uh, very helpful for you to uh, kick starting the stuff okay the next thing gather knowledge on etl concepts okay wh what is etl concepts so in in we have etl extract transform load etl is something like data warehouse so in data warehousing we have some concepts so these concepts you have to uh, very well aware of so uh, the etl concepts are general it's not specific to big data or specific to any other existing technology it's a common for example what is data replication and what is lambda architecture and what is type uh, like we have uh, uh, like different types of data that has been get categorized in the data warehouse so what types of data 
what is type 1 type 2 type 3 so what is mean by types of uh, type 2 data we used to say sometimes this table has type 2 data and sometimes people used to think what is type 2 even though he is a big data developer he used to be very familiar with uh, data warehouse concepts but this is not going to be a very important uh, this is not going to play a very important role in your uh, uh, job search or in your interview or even in the real time work but knowing the concepts will help you to understand the requirement very easily just google for etl concepts data warehouse concepts you will get some blogs or books just go through it that's what i just wanted to tell all, all data related term, terms as i told you what is uh, data replication what is data normalization what is data denormalizations so something like that okay and then uh, uh, moving on to step six okay cloud so uh, basics of cloud so in uh, we have some cloud providers like AWS and uh, Microsoft Azure and uh, Google Cloud so pick any one I will recommend you to go for AWS or Google Cloud which where they are like in demand and market and these cloud computing is again uh, it's act as a side dish uh, so big data and data engineering is your main dish so knowing cloud computing will always act as a combo technology that's it and it's a, it's just a side dish so just uh, just you can explore that I have the complete playlist of AWS videos as well I'm just sharing that in the description box of this video and again sixth point is something that you don't have much time or something like that then you can skip this but this will act as a combo and if you see my combo my resume title will be like this big data with AWS uh, developer so this is what my title in my resume so this will act as a really good combo but usage of cloud is uh, uh, like literally increasing nowadays so knowing this will be an added advantage for you and then uh, moving on to uh, step number seven okay so working on project challenges and optimizations okay so uh, like you will be starting working on the, some use cases some projects some real times once you are done with step number four then you will be moving on to work with some real projects with small amount of data that you have so here in the interview our 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 point of view on the candidate is not how you are explaining the project so that is not what we are actually looking into it so what actually we are trying to get from you is just explain your project architecture in just two minutes and what what else you have to explain me a lot is the challenges what you have faced and the performance optimization what you have done so that is what we are expecting from you because what you will say like a project architecture will be like this there was a source and we migrated to destination and we write this park jobs we write hive jobs and this is what everyone will do what challenges you have faced and what optimizations you have done so that is what required so you have to just check in google uh, list of hive optimization list of spark optimization list of hadoop optimization just take some topics and and work on those pieces and add that in your resume will really give you a very good uh, uh, view for the interviewer okay so getting uh, uh, selected the resume selection is very easy that anyone can do because HR will not check all those stuff so when it comes to the technical person right so we'll be uh, much concentrated on your performance optimization challenges not the project architecture what you are going to explain because that the same tech stack is what everybody is using right so that is very important thing to notice and uh, I'm going to make a separate uh, list uh, set of videos on this step number seven soon okay just uh, touch with my playlist I'm, I'm i'm already the contents already it's just i have to make a video and upload so that is what uh, it's still in my queue but i'm gonna do a lot of things in the step number seven and then when it comes to step number eight prepare your resume and attend interviews okay at the end of second month so the duration so at the end of second month you can start preparing your resume just telling you like uh, 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 prepare your CV by end of the second month of your preparation everything is done so for sure just uh, build your own uh, encouragement and then uh, be brave and start attending interviews by preparing and resume just upload it just attend give a call see like everybody will have a dream company right so so a lot of people I've seen that even after they are done with their big data course or they do it for six months even one year but still they will be hesitate to attend interviews the only thing what they used to say what they used to ask me is am I ready you are all always ready see you have done everything only when you go to the project right you will you, for sure I am telling you this uh, most of my uh, 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 people who I have helped them to enter into data engineering they just called me and said uh, after I'm getting into the project I didn't feel anything different 
that's what they told me the same life cycle is what happening and the same thing only the tech stack was different and that's it so this is the you will be feeling very comfortable once you enter into the projects okay so people will be there to guide you people will be there to teach you so that is how so the day one they will not ask you here is your laptop sit here write me 200 lines of code and 45 lines of sql query no one will tell you like that so that's a reality even experienced people have this question so that is the thing because technology is new so people are very panic so you don't want to get panic and all so just uh, complete your cv by end of your preparation and then upload your resume to job portals and start attending interviews so i'm i'm sure that you will not be uh, means i'm telling the reality i'm sure like you will not be get clicked immediately in the first two interviews if it happens then yeah i will be very happy for you but the, those two three interviews will give you the experience on how to attend next interview right so don't waste your time so once you have done with your preparation start attending sometimes what people will do they will just think for one year and then they will start then they will fail for three times then they will learn from the failure but what i am trying to tell you don't wait for one year to two years just to see the failure anyway like the worst thing what will will get is failure then you can step in immediately right so then learn from failures and then start getting into the success so and this roadmap is very common and there is no uh, experience based i am not explaining even for fresher to 15 years of experience candidates they can use this roadmap to start their learning the big data stuff hadoop distributed file system so which is the very first component that we should learn before getting into hadoop ecosystem or before getting into any other big data technology okay so uh, before uh, like uh, getting into the actual uh, video I'm, i just wanted to tell you a few things so this video going to be a lengthier video it will be more than one hour and one and a half hours more than that so i'll recommend not to skip this video i'll just recommend you to completely watch the video which is very very important and i will tell you like where and when this htfs will be very useful for you first okay if you go for any big data interviews in the interview perspective you will not get any much question from HTFS one or two questions and that's it and even after entering into the project so you will not uh, do any kind of uh, major activities in the HTFS because HTFS is just a file system to store data but understanding the HTFS file system is very important with respect to have the architectural thought and the design of the cluster which will be very helpful only when you understand the distributed file system and how the data is getting distributed so all these things is very much important for you to plan the design of the cluster and architecture and also optimizing your job okay fine so if you take hadoop hadoop consists of only two projects okay so one is hdfs which is derived from gfs google file system and then there is one more module in hadoop called mapreduce which is derived from google mapreduce so this is invented in roughly 2002 this is 2004 so from these papers they have released the paper in these year and from this they have invented this uh, hdfs and mapreduce and they named it as hadoop okay so dark cutting is the guy who created hadoop and uh, like he his the base paper for hadoop is gfs and gmr which is released in these years and if you see uh, like hadoop is it just has only two projects when i say this people will get a doubt like when we see or hear about hadoop they say something like hive hbase scoop uzi so many other things right so so hadoop has only these two projects but hive hbase are dependent on top of hadoop so hive is used for data warehousing scoop is used for for data transfer so i have uh, the video to explain you like all the hadoop components in one liner i will share that video link in the description box of this video okay so hive scoop uzi those components are built on top of hadoop so if i want to install hive uzi scoop hbase then i need hadoop first so i have to go with hadoop and then i have to install all these components on top of it on top of the hadoop hbase hive scoop uzi invented by different companies and different contributors on the whole we call everything all those components along with hadoop we call them as hadoop framework okay fine so now we gonna jump into this htfs hadoop distributed file system so before getting into this i just wanted to explain you some of the frequently asked the questions by the user whenever i teach them htfs so these are like you may be from mainframe you may be a support engineer you may be a java developer you may be a data warehouse guy or you may be a fresher so these questions uh, like will help you to understand what i'm going to explain next in htfs okay first of all what is a file system 
So you are saying HDFS, right? Hadoop distributed file system. So you are asking me this question. So first of all, what is file system? So daily, day-to-day -day life, we are using file system. So if you are using Windows, then you are using file system name called NTFS, New Technology File System is your Windows file system name. And if you are using Linux, then the file system name is EXT which is extensible file system and then if you are using Mac then it's Mac FS and even in your mobile you have file system for Android and iOS operating system you have a file system so a file system is a layer that acts between you and your uh, mission or I can say between the software and hardware so the file system is used to read and write the data from and to the hard disk so you have a mission and you install some operating system and that means a file systems will be created so you, this is your hard disk you write some data it goes to file system so this line is file system actually it goes through file system and then to your hard disk I'm I'm just creating an 1 GB of word document then that will be get stored to HDFS via this file system so this file system will help you to read and write the data from and to the hard disk so when you install Windows OS you will get a file system when you install Linux OS you will get Linux file system okay so now if you see some examples for this file system ntfs ext and then there is two more file system hdfs is hadoop distributed file system s3 is similar to file system but not exactly uh, which is an object store in uh, aws amazon google cloud and google has google cloud has its own file system google file system and similarly facebook has its own file system in their server so everybody has their own file system but there is the difference between your uh, windows ext and hdfs and s3 if you see NTFS and EXT they call it a, we call them as standalone file system HDFS and S3 we call them as a distributed file system I will explain you the difference between these two when I come to fourth question okay next what is block okay so block is a concept that that is there in all the file system including your Windows Linux and even HDFS so what is block now imagine so this is your file system and then there is a hard disk so you want to store a 1 GB data into your Windows file system so that goes via this NTFS and then to your hard disk what this NTFS will do this NTFS will not store your the complete 1 GB file as a single file so it won't be in that way it won't be get stored in that way this NTFS will split these 1 GB file into small small partitions and they are called as blocks imagine so 1 GB data when it goes to NTFS it gets split into like five six files so the six file is your 1 GB file so in your hard disk this 1 GB file will be get stored as six files okay so what is the need of it so while why we have to uh, uh, divide this as a chunks like a blocks like a partition why is required why this is required so when you divide this as a block and then the, your read and write will be very easy and then it won't consume a lot of time and that is the reason of having this block concept in all the file systems now based on what these uh, blocks counts are created now there is a size for block in each of the file system if you take uh, like Windows NTFS the block size is 16 KB and if you take Linux we the block size is 512 KB okay so that means you have 1 GB file 1 GB divide by if it is Windows 16 K now imagine you are getting some number so I'm, I'm giving a rough number I'm, I'm, I'm not like super fast in that calculation okay so here like you are getting imagine you get like 50 files 1 GB divided by 16 you'll be getting more but 50 files so that means you'll be having 50 blocks okay so this 50 blocks will be get stored in your hard disk and while reading the data again the NTFS will merge all the files and give it to us a one single document and in Linux again the same like 1 GB divided by 512 KB and that many blocks will be get created in your hard disk okay and similar way we have the concept of block size in HDFS also I will tell you when we move on to HDFS let me remove this so now you are understood with the concept of block because I'm gonna explain you the same concept when we move to HDFS so that time you need to know what is block okay now next client and server so we are aware of it right so what is client and server it's very basic client 
is a mission which send a request server is a mission which send you the response like when you uh, trigger www.facebook.com that is your client you, your mission is a client mission so the request goes to facebook server and it responds you with the facebook page right so client and server that's it simple definition so this is a client which sends a request to the server and server will response Right. Why we need to know this before getting into STFS? Because big data world is distributed environment. Everything is distributed over there. So the basic of distributed environment system is client server. So we need to know that, right? So that's the reason I'm just giving you the definition of client server, which you might have been already aware of it, most of the people, but again, I'm giving it. Next, types of file systems. We have two types, standalone and distributed, I told you already. So what is the difference between standalone and distributed? Okay, let me uh, give you an example. Let me remove this. Okay, so now um, you have like three Windows installed mission which is connected in a same network or connected in a LAN within the same network. Now this is your, all these are your Windows missions, okay? So these are your Windows missions. NTFS is installed in all these missions and they are connected. Now there is three HDFS mission they are also connected in LAN. Okay, they are also, it's, it's in the same network. And this is HDFS. And now we call this NTFS as standalone uh, operating system, uh, sorry, standalone file system. And we call this as distributed file system. Okay, so this is standalone file system and this is distributed file system. And now with, with respect to the diagram, I don't see any difference. But how come you say NTFS and EXT are standalone file system and HDFS and S3 are distributed file systems? Okay, now, so there is two type of people who always use the word distributed computing. One people like who come from data engineering side and or data, any data developers, data science, data engineer, data analytics, any people. And there is an, another set of developers who come from network and infrastructure engineers. So both these two set of developers they call a computer like they use the word distributed computing so now we need to know like what is the very the important thing like how can we categorize this into like ntfs and htfs how come they are standalone and this is distributed file system with these perspective in in their perspective for these developers now imagine uh, f from the network side right so when they when they uh, see these two clusters for them they are same because uh, network engineers will just check for the topology of the cluster when I say topology physical stru uh, structure of the network is called a topology okay so the topology as I told you like uh, uh, it's like how we design a lab they they used to they have different types of topology like bus topology star topology in network world they have these concepts so for them if there is three node and they are connected in a LAN for them that is distributed computing okay from network perspective but for the data engineering perspective I will not call this NTFS cluster this group of NTFS missions even though they connected in a LAN I will never call them as distributed the reason is data engineers will call a particular uh, cluster uh, only if the data get distributed they will call them as a distributed cluster or else they will not call it now if you see I'm I'm storing 1 GB data in the first node of NTFS and this 1 GB data will directly get stored only on this mission this 1 GB will not be get distributed to these remaining two missions two are one but it will not get distributed any data that you put in this first mission will be in in the first mission only it will not be get distributed but when I when I load a 1 GB data in my HDFS mission or in the S3 what will happen right this 1 GB will not be get stored in this one node this 1 GB will be get divided into small small blocks as I told you already and these blocks will be get stored across the missions like this so imagine like this 1GB is getting stored in HDFS and it, it created like uh, 5 blocks for this 1GB data and this 5 blocks uh, will be get stored in a different mission. So for me as a data engineer, I will call this as a distributed cluster, not this one, the NTFS one. Because here the computer, the cluster, the infrastructure is distributed but not the data. Okay, but for the networks 
engineer infrastructure is what he will see in both the cases the infrastructure is distributed so he will call that as distributed cluster both the computing for him both the uh, the first diagram and the second diagram for him it is distributed like ntfs and htfs both are distributed from the network engineering perspective only he just uh, checks for the infrastructure okay so this is the difference between standalone uh, file system and the distributed file system okay next question types of distributed system okay now we just discussed about the dis difference between standalone and uh, distributed now in distributed we have two types so one is called master and slave cluster master and slave and there is one more called peer to peer there is two types of uh, cluster computing the, the the physical infrastructure of a distributed cluster there is two types one is master slave and peer to peer in master slave your 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 mission will be like this your your the missions like the computers in the cluster will be like this so there will be one master who will be communicating with all the slaves and there won't be any communication between slaves okay the communication happens only from slave to master master to slave so these is master mission and all these are slave missions the technology which comes under master slave in big data hadoop comes under master slave spark comes under master slave and most of the uh, like demanding technology in big data comes under master slave only so peer to peer what is peer to peer so there is no concept of uh, master slave here so each and every node in the cluster they act like a friends there is no master there is no master i mean slave it's masters masterless slaveless concept so here each and every node connects to another node something like this so first node will connect to remaining three and second node will connect to two three and four so each and every node knows the status of other mission if you see in master slave if this node goes down the remaining three missions will never come to know that the fourth node is dead only master will come to know but here in this case if this mission is down the remaining three nodes will come to know that this mission is dead so example technology for peer to peer there is a no sql database called cassandra which comes under this peer to peer and both this cluster type has its own advantages and disadvantages with respect to master slave uh, the, the the main disadvantage is s p o f the full form is single point of failure the reason of single point of failure is s p o c single point of communication if you see there is only one master it's a centralized system if this node goes everything is gone so nothing you can't do anything so the this only one master right so we call them as single point of communication and here because of this you will be getting single point of failure and in peer to peer there is no uh, need of uh, like there is no spoc that's there is no single point of communication and because of that there is no single point of failure <coughs> now so how come then Hadoop Spark and all like they are using master slave you are saying this is a disadvantage right but we have solutions here I'm going to explain you that in upcoming like in some time later now in the same video so if you see in Hadoop especially if you take Hadoop the versions that we have in Hadoop Hadoop 0 Hadoop 1 Hadoop 2 and Hadoop 3 so totally we have these many versions Hadoop 0x 1x 2x and 3x so 0 and 1 they are completely outdated and two and three is what like people are currently using in the real time and mostly like three people started using three and if you see there is an architecture difference between one version one till version one and then uh, like there is a difference architecture with respect to the set of two and three okay so two and three like architecture will be same zero and one the architecture will be same but between these two the architecture is different for both htfs and map reduce and i'm going to explain both version one and version two changes in this video because you need to know both and we are not in the version of hadoop 70 or 50 we are just hadoop 3 version is four four versions like it's it's an it's an up uh, like in the queue right we just used only four versions so it's good to know like what was there in like previous version and what was the problems we faced and then what was the solutions that we got in the later versions so i'll be explaining both the cases now and I, i'll be explaining this like how to how in hadoop they are giving the option of uh, uh, avoiding the single point of failure i will tell, tell you in the architecture video and means architecture topic in the same video fine now next question is 
what is process a program in execution is called a process you run a java code is a process you 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 just run a run a movie player is a process you you just do something in the google chrome is a process so for each each and every process there will be a background process right and that's the next question so daemon process so the background process is called a daemon process if you take the process hadoop hadoop is a process and for which there is a five daemon process which is a background process so i will just name it as jp1 jp2 jp3 jp4 jp5 so j for java p for process so everything in hadoop is a java so we the, the process that runs in background is a java based process so for example like if you go for task manager right you will be seeing some background process right so when i click task manager like uh, some antivirus updates will be running some microsoft updates will be running or you, you, you some chrome uh, a process will be running in background for each and every foreground process there will be a background process right like that when you start this particular process called hadoop in the cluster there will be a five process that will be running in background and each of this process like the full form of j is java p is process so we have these five process and each of these process has its own unique characteristics and this five process is actually what the backbone for your hadoop cluster which is running and today like i'm going to explain you the first three process which is belongs to hdfs and the last two processes belongs to map reduce so this is something we'll see in upcoming videos but today we are going to discuss about these first three demon process okay fine now the next question is cluster and node so here after we have to use this word term cluster and node you might have noticed that i have i am using the word cluster and node in the previous questions right so node is something your one laptop is called one node uh, either it could be a physical machine or it could be a virtual machine like i am getting an uh, one machine from google cloud or aws cloud or azure i am getting one instance so uh, whether in windows or linux either it could be a uh, physical machine or virtual machine if one machine is called one node like you have three three laptops or three desktops or three virtual machines then we call them as three nodes so group of node is called a cluster so in the interview they can ask you like this how many node cluster it was there in your previous Hadoop project or big data project you have to say in dev environment we used like 50 node cluster in the in the production it is like 200 node cluster and for testing in my own laptop like I used one node cluster or three node cluster so you can you have to say like that so cluster node the terms are very important to use and please don't use the word client and server in big data environment even though it is making sense for some 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 extent we should not use that word because people will not believe us if I use that words people will not believe that we have the real-time experience okay so that's that's all like uh, it's the, the terms and uh, stuffs like that which we have to use properly right so that's the thing fine okay so the last question a API client API application program interface we call them as application program interface any request that you send to your mission it's an API I want my mission to run a movie so there is a media player in which i am going to see the movie and that is that means the media player is your api the application program interface now i want to uh, make my mission to print hello world you can use notepad to just write hello world and you can see not then notepad is a api you are sending a request or you can write a java program to print an hello world or you can write a python program then you are using java api then you are using python api so the request which you are sending via some medium and that's an api and that api is a process okay so that's why people used to say like which api you used to develop this we used to say java api we used to say python api something like that aws api google api something like that okay so don't get confused about the api api is all about a process which handles your request okay fine now we all into the into the like uh, the FAQ, faqs are completed even if i explain something technically and you couldn't understand it please mention that in the comment box i will give you the answers fine the clarifications instead of saying answer i can say the word clarification i can clarify you the doubts if you have now the I, i'll just want to explain you two concepts before we get into hdfs first block I already told you what is block but in HDFS what is the block size I said for Windows it is 16k for Linux it is 512k and what is the block size in HDFS okay so here 
uh, one block size equal to 64 MB is default till version 1, Hadoop version 1. Okay, and after Hadoop version 1, the default block size for HDFS is 128 MB. So, when I use the word default, that means it's highly configurable. You can change this number. So, uh, like uh, it again depends on the data volume and the jobs you're going to start. Um, those things I will tell you in the MapReduce video. Now, so if you want to change this number, it has to be like like divisible like multiple of two okay so it should be like 32 mb 64 mb 128 mb 256 mb 512 mb so it has to be in that way okay so now this is one concept that we need to know and the second concept is all about replication this is very 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 important concept because not only in hadoop we have this we have this concept replication in any big data technology you go even we have the same concept in traditional rdbms and data warehouse also fine so now imagine that you have three nodes and as I told you in Hadoop the data will be get distributed. Now I am loading 1 GB data and this 1 GB data is getting distributed like this B0, B1, B2. So this 1 GB is split into three partitions that is three blocks and it gets stored across these three nodes. Now all of a sudden if the second, third node goes down what will happen to this B2? You have these two blocks but that's fine but my file will be get like fully qualified only if I have this piece also right so then this B2 is lost so now the replication is introduced in Hadoop not by any other external technology Hadoop itself has the concept of the replication that means creating copies for your blocks okay so for one block we the, the default replication strategy is three so for one block the default is three replica so you can increase and decrease this that means if you are loading 1 GB data into the cluster, then you need 3 GB of hard disk to store because replication is 3. Now, if we have replication, then how the data will be get stored? For example, like this B0 and B1, B2, and B2. And the very important rule of replication is same copy of block will not get stored in the same node. That is very important. Then what is the use of like if you see if I have two B2 here, if this more if this mission goes down, what is the use of having two B2 in the same node? Right? So that is the rule. So same blocks, copy of blocks will not reside on same node. Okay, so now if you see here, even though if this mission goes down, you need a B2, but that's already there here and here, and then you need B0 from this node. You already has them have them in first node and second node, and you need one more B1, like yeah, the third one, third block which is reside in third mission, and you have the B1 again here and here. So your user will never come to know that the blocks are dead and the machine is dead because you have copies here. The Hadoop gives you the concept of replication. So here the replication means how you have to say, right? So if you have three copies like B0, B0, B0. So one actual plus two copies. So that is how you have to say. So totally it is three replica. Okay. So I don't want to confuse you, but there is a difference between copy and replica. Okay. The actual original piece of block, we call them as actual data and you are creating two copies of it and totally it is three replica. Uh, even in the real time, people used to say three copies, three copies, but yeah, it's fine to say like that, but actually uh, copies is two, but replica is three. Okay. That's how it is. Okay. So don't get confused. You can even uh, just remember in your mind saying that three copies it's also fine and good but I'm just telling you the difference between the word replica and copy fine now back to the uh, the this point like I, if I want to store 1 GB data then I need 3 GB of hard disk and what about the price of hard disk here this is this was the question when I was into big data like roughly uh, like I, I'm, I'm around like seven years of experience when I started my career in big data i started my career in big data by the time i was working as a freelancer in a startup and there like i will be working on like uh, set up, setting up the cluster and doing all the etl stuff and the things and sometimes like clients will be asking me this question repeatedly like uh, when i say clients my clients are not from uh, uh, my clients are not as a company they are some individuals maybe they are software engineers who work for another company and they couldn't complete the task so they give to us so that is what like my very first uh, startup they work as a freelancing stuff okay so uh, they will be asking me this question without knowingly like uh, what they are asking 
and they will ask me this even in interview people ask this question to test you if I want to store 1 GB data and replication is 3 and that means you want me to provide 3 GB of hard disk right yes and what about the cost okay now here I am repeating I am gonna make an another question for the people who ask this what I am gonna say is I am going to remove this replica because it's configurable let me let me put it as 0 that means you will not have any copies only the actual data will be there that means you will be having three nodes and in this three nodes you will be having b0 b1 b2 that's it now i will be asking them a question like what happen if this node goes down and what is the guarantee or how the data loss has been tolerated here or how will you recover the data or what is the solution that you will be providing for me if I remove application so this will be my question to the clients okay so here this question is valid right because they have the data and the application is provided by Hadoop and they are worrying about the hard disk size then that means I can remove the replication now what will be the guarantee for the data when the data loss happens or some fault happens what is the fault tolerant mechanism here nothing because I disable the replication right so now the answer what I will get from them right they will be saying like we have some external technologies which will create the copy and store the data this is what uh, you believe me or not like this is what what the most of the answer I got from uh, my freelancing uh, clients like they will be saying like there is an another external technology to which we can attach our Hadoop cluster so that th that technology will do the copy so what I was telling before is Hadoop itself is doing that then why should I have to disable the replica in Hadoop then I have to go for some external technology in which I have to pay for both software and hardware license right it's valid right so then after I'm saying this people will say oh yeah okay I got it now so in Hadoop the software is free it's there is no license because Hadoop itself has the concept of replication the replication is also free for you the only thing you don't need any external technology to do the replication part the Hadoop is doing it all you what you need to give for me is the hard disk that even commodity hard disk when I say commodity the affordable price for your company even you order some some hard disk in Flipkart and or Amazon and then add it to it and add to your cluster <laughs> that's it right so replication is very important to avoid data loss and to build the ability to the cluster of tolerating the fault which we call them as fault tolerance replication why I'm explaining you this much because replication is very much important it's there in all the technology like any data technology you go we have the concept and you will be having the same doubt when it comes to replication so I'm trying to give you the clarifications here fine so we have done almost like we can jump into uh, the HDFS architecture like read architecture write architecture and then we'll be discussing about the types of nodes and types of cluster and that's it now so Hadoop distributed file system uh, distributed apologies for my bad handwriting file system okay so now imagine I am in my client place okay so uh, my client is asking me to install Hadoop cluster I have to do a multi node Hadoop setup now they are asking me what are all the things you need from us I'll be asking them I need they how I'm asking to the client how many nodes you want how many node of cluster you want my client is telling me like I need five node of cluster and then like I'm, I'm, I'm just giving them like a question like what RAM configurations you want what hardware configuration you want so they are saying some numbers now I ask my client to create five virtual nodes in AWS or Google because I can even do the multi node in physical laptops and desktops but I cannot take the missions anywhere I go if it is virtual mission it will be easy for me so I'm, I'm just asking them to create as a virtual missions five virtual missions now the next question my client asks me like what OS you want us to install on that so if you see Hadoop supports on Windows Linux Mac but in real time most of your servers are Linux so it's always good to learn big data technologies in Linux on top of Linux so don't go with Windows and Mac uh, Mac is also fine it, it has the flavor of Linux but Windows I will never suggest you to do that even though it supports because in real time that is not the case and you will be getting a lot of challenges and uh, issues when you do the setup in Windows okay now I'm asking them I need five missions node uh, with Linux installed now my client is client created the nodes so I have five nodes here one two three four five 
and how to be a master slave architecture so out of this five node you have to decide one node for master and the remaining four nodes are slave that you have to decide and master node machine should have always good amount of ram like comparatively high configuration compared to any other nodes in your cluster now in all these machines are just ext machines there is no hadoop installed yet all these are when i say ext they are linux machine the file system of linux is called ext right so that's why i say uh, ext and um, now you want to download hadoop from internet in apache website you can download hadoop so while while downloading hadoop people will ask me such few questions so whether uh, there is a concept of uh, downloading hadoop for 32 bit operating system 64 bit operating system there is no such thing it's only one hadoop file you can download for linux or windows or mac it sits on both 32 bit and 64 bit os and they will be asking me another questions like is there any hadoop for master slave master version of hadoop slave version of hadoop there is no such thing it's again the same hadoop software uh, your configuration will make this machine as master and the remaining machine as slave you have to do such configurations okay so these are all some basic things like people ask me before downloading hadoop so i'm just clarifying you that and i you remember i told you there is five process jp1 jp2 i'm not going to give you the exact name for now there is a there is a unique name for all these daemon process i'll give you later now you have five daemon process out of which three is for hdfs as i told you and two is for map reduce now here i'm going to explain first only these three daemons in this video so here each and every process has its own characteristics right so now we have to decide a mission like which is master and which is slave i will make this mission as master and the remaining mission as slaves and um, let me give some number for it like zeroth mission and 1 2 3 4 and uh, like each of this mission has its own process like master mission process name called jp1 that is this process and in all the slave mission the process which controls the slave is jp2 so you have to configure and uh, configure this node in hadoop for running jp2 and you have to configure this node in hadoop to run jp1 the node which runs jp1 hadoop process is master the nodes which run jp2 hadoop process is slave okay so it's like jp2 in all the slave node and very important like people sometimes used to uh, virtually uh, get this image like this 2 jp2 jp3 jp4 jp5 no it's not like that in all the slave node the process is jp2 fine okay now i am going to start the read write architecture for you i am going to explain that before getting into that uh, how to connect the cluster to read and write so directly you can connect to this node for example i can directly connect to this node um, and you can trigger the read request and write request but in real time they will never allow you to connect the cluster node okay in real time they will never ever allow you to directly connect the cluster node you can't connect any of these nodes so they will create you a separate like like a firewall kind of node so we call this node as an edge node so now we'll be having developers who is working on hadoop cluster writing some programs or sql queries so they all will connect to this node they will remotely connect this edge node and from this edge node they will trigger all their hadoop jobs map produce jobs hive job connecting to hdfs running spark jobs anything they will do like this only and uh, no one will have the access to connecting the slaves and master machine directly in real time but you are creating the multi node cluster on your own then you can connect the slave machine without even having the edge node concept okay so the edge node is a best practice concept because we we can't overload or uh, the overload the hard disk or overload the traffic by directly connecting this and that's not a best practice and that's the reason they go for the concept of edge node okay and i'm going to give you more example to give you the understanding on this edge node if you take facebook.com so you have your own mission this is your mission and in which you go for facebook.com right so now in your mission like you are triggering facebook.com and this facebook.com which which runs on your mission for facebook server your mission is edge node okay your laptop is edge node for facebook okay so you are from your laptop the data goes here and then from facebook server it will be get distributed there to their file system so your mission is edge node for facebook because we have millions and millions of Uh, uh users who 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 just like that connect facebook server every day right so directly you can connect to the facebook cluster 
it has to be go via from your machine right and that means your machine is edge node for them all your read write happens from your node only right and the same way it happens here and again more understanding i'm going to give you on this and sometimes people used to ask me whether this is so if if any data that get distributed in the cluster also the data will be get distributed on edge node they will ask me this question so your edge node is will not contain any of your hdfs data the data that goes from edge node will never come back to your edge node so the data that you sent so you have 1gb data here and you upload it to hadoop and that data will be get distributed only to these four nodes not back to your edge node i am going to read the same with this facebook example you are uploading your profile picture right so you have the pic here you are uploading that to facebook.com after uploading the profile pic to facebook.com is that profile pic coming back to your node hard disk no right i am uploading something in google drive after uploading the uploaded data gets stored in your laptop no it goes to the cluster right and that means the data that you load from edge node will be get distributed only on these four nodes not back to your edge node okay so edge node will act like just like a firewall uh, like like kind of an uh, node a rough node a rough node just to communicate read and write just to have a kind of a best practice so i hope uh, like you remember i means you got the point of what is edge node is so i am going to explain you the read and write architecture from the slave node directly uh, because that will be easy for you to understand as i told you if this is your personal cluster then you can directly uh, connect to your slave machine itself if i am a ceo of facebook then I, why why should i have to go with facebook.com to upload a picture i can even directly connect a slave machine and i can upload my picture also right i'm just i'm just kidding but that's possible but i'm just kidding so uh, like um so i am going to explain you the read write architecture with the by connecting the slave node directly but not edge node but architecture will not get changed for edge node or connecting the slave for read and write will not change your architecture will not change this is for only better understanding for you i'm i'm going to explain i'm going to do in this way let me wrap this okay okay fine so uh, let me change it i'm sorry yeah here it is okay fine so now um, uh, you have 1gb data so first you have to store it local in this machine just you have a pen drive and connect uh, the pen drive to this node and just store your 1gb data somewhere in local okay in ext i'm storing it in ext and you can see here one more point i just forgot to say so all these node has two file systems now ext and hdfs so in all these node now you have two file system ext on top of ext hdfs ext on top of ext we have hdfs so that means before installing hadoop there was only one file system called ext after installing hadoop on all these node now we got hdfs in all these nodes now that means you have created a distributed file system on top of standalone file system okay so just to install any distributed file system you need a standalone file system first so any data that you load to ext then that will not be get distributed but in the same node hdfs is running so now instead of loading the data 1gb here if i load it to hdfs then that data will be get distributed now you can ask me a question uh, in, in while sending my read request how can i say whether this data has to go to linux or the data has to get distributed in hdfs that i will tell you okay so there is a separate command for you to connect with hdfs to upload to download to do anything with uh, hdfs file system we call them as hadoop commands you have to use this hadoop commands to uh, upload or distribute your data or download the data from file system and those things so any command any file uh, for read and write that goes via hadoop command then the request will go to hdfs only not to your ext okay so it's something like you are uploading okay this is your machine laptop in which you have uh, ext and now you are op uh, like you open your browser facebook.com again the same example now that means on top of your ext facebook file system is running ffs facebook file system it's running because of facebook.com all right now from your laptop you are uploading a data into facebook and that means that goes to in facebook file system the data will be get distributed so i am uploading my picture to ext your data will get distributed no 
now from ext i am uploading to facebook.com now from facebook.com your profile picture will be get distributed to across the node in the facebook cluster okay so that means i am having ext on top of i have hdfs now any data that goes to hdfs from the first node the data will be get distributed i hope you understood this fine now you have 1 gb data here and then i have to upload this to hdfs now i am triggering a command some hdfs command i trigger some hdfs command to upload this 1 gb data now on top of this node let me change the color okay so on top of this node a process called client api will be get started so client api is nothing but hadoop client api this api will remains in the same state until your write request get complete okay so whenever you trigger some request a client api will be get started and you can ask me a question do i need to send a request only from first node always no you can send request from any of the node here so in the same node also uh, like three to four developers can trigger a request and that many client api will be get created now sorry now there is one more developer who triggers a request from here then there will be a separate client api will be created here okay it's not because i'm i'm doing it everything from first node don't think only from first node we can send everything it's not like that now you are sending a write request okay so now this client api will redirect this write request to master node and very very important thing is so here this client api will inform to the master like what is the operation that the developer wants to perform right and what is the file size 1 gb and what is the file name okay test.txt that's it so don't think that data is transferred to master machine no your data will be in only on your first machine's local file system only that is ext so your data your information about the data is what going to the master not the actual data that's very important to understand so once the master receives the request what master will do right it will generate something called metadata metadata is something about data about data so you have your house address right and in college and school you have your roll number with the roll number we can get your data and in your company you have employee id right so with the employee id we can get all your information right so something like that so any write request you send immediately jp1 will prepare and metadata for every write request and what this metadata will have i will tell you so it has some informations like the first information metadata will have the block information now after receiving the request what jp1 will do it will create this metadata the very first metadata that it will create is after receiving the file it will see what is the file size okay 1 gb and then what the jp1 will check for is what is the block size you have given in the hdfs as i told you if it is version 1 64 mb version 2 means 128 mb now we are going with version 1 only the architecture is version 1 so that means 64 so what hadoop will do it will divide this 1 gb with 64 mb and that means you will be getting 16 blocks so this number is accurate that means from b0 to b15 you will be getting 15 blocks now this 15 blocks is what it will get distributed here but still yeah uh, the the metadata creation is in process till the action is not happening now the very first metadata is uh, jp1 that is the master daemon will decide number of blocks need to be created for this particular write request for the file second replication so for each block how many replication need to be get created if you take b0 and what is the default replication i told you three replication so what jp1 will do for each block it will create three replica b0 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 and then again for b1 it's again b1 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 something like that so that means so b0 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 to b15 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 and last final metadata is placement allocation like where this first copy of b0 has to sit where the second copy of b0 can sit where the third copy of b0 can sit till b15 it will decide which node it has to go and that is happened with the algorithm there is an algorithm called rack awareness policy so with this rack awareness policy uh, the with the ip address of all the slave node and it uses that with that ip address what hadoop will do it will allocate the blocks to the respective nodes now that has happened uh, like with the algorithm but just to for the diagram sake i am going to give the location now so imagine if b0 gets stored first copy gets stored in first machine second machine 
third mission, third copy in third mission. Then B15 first copy gets stored in second mission and second copy of B15 in third mission and third copy of B15 in fourth mission. I have, I have given the number here if you see here 4, 3, 2 and this is 1. Okay. Now, this metadata will be get created by JP1 and this metadata will be get stored in EXT of master mission. That means local file system of master mission. Very, very important. Metadata will not get stored in HDFS. Metadata will be get stored only in EXT of master mission. Okay. Now, this information after creating master will send this as a response to the client API. So, the response is, so this is your response and this is your request. So, the response is B0, B0 to B0 till B15, B15, B15. That means it has to first split 16 blocks and then it has to create replica and then it has to place the respective copies in the respective node. So, it is 1, 2, 3 and then 234 okay 234 now what client api will do right so now client api will take this 1 gb data from this node and then it will cut this into blocks and then it will create replica and then it will transfer it to the respective nodes okay now let me change the color okay so now if you see for doing that what client api will do it will create a separate process called pipeline we call this as pipeline and this is a wireless process uh, so here this pipeline will do this process like it will cut this 1 gb into 16 blocks and then it will drop in each of it will distribute the data so this client api is what it will distribute the data so first this sorry pipeline so pipeline is what will distribute the data first pipeline will uh, see like what are all the blocks i have to drop in first node it will check that so if you see here only b0 uh, i am not going for all the blocks let me consider only b0 and b15 okay so because else the diagrams will be very clumsy now i have to drop only b0 here and then this pipeline will continue to second node if we have blocks to drop in second node if there is no block to drop in second node then it will skip the second node and directly goes to third node if third node has something to drop okay if we want to drop something in third node but not in second it will skip so now but but now we have something to drop in second node if you see here second copy of b0 and uh, first copy of uh, B15 I have to send, I have to uh, distribute in second node. So B0, B15. And from again, uh, from second node, this will go to third node because we have something to drop in third node like B0 and B15. Okay, B0, B15. And from third node again, the pipeline will be get extended to fourth node because I have one block B15 in fourth node. Okay, B15 here. Okay, now once everything is done, there will be a heartbeat communication back to each of these nodes uh, saying that, not heartbeat, like um, acknowledgement, acknowledgement, saying that a copy is completed successfully based on that the pipeline will, will inform to the client API uh, the, the right is success. Now based on that, uh, the request goes to master, the acknowledgement goes to master saying that right is success. Now entire communication will get killed, stopped. Everything is done, right? Now, if you see here, we just completed the successful write architecture. I haven't included the failure case yet, but successful uh, write is completed. Now, if you see, uh, there is no, the communication between master and slave happens only client API, right? And you see, the, there is no communication between slave and master, right? So, imagine client API will, is one, the process will create only when you have read and write request. Imagine I'm not doing any read request, write request for past two to three days. And then in that case, there won't be any communication between master and slave. No, it is not like that. So whether you are doing this or not, whether you are doing write or read or not, there will be a communication always between slave and master. So that means if you see here for every three seconds, for every three seconds, slave will communicate to master for every three seconds. It's seconds. Okay every three seconds slave will communicate to master and we call this as heartbeat heartbeat so based on this heartbeat only master will come to know whether the slave node is dead or alive imagine if this particular node is not sending heartbeat for next three second means master will decide this particular node is dead and what action has to be taken the master will do that okay i will tell you that i will tell you that later now this is called an heartbeat communication okay now if you see uh, so far what we have seen uh, like if you take data perspective 
uh, there is two types of data one is block which gets stored in my slave machine and then metadata which gets stored in master node okay and types of node that we have seen so far is uh, slave node and then master node and now we are going to introduce failure cases okay so there is two types of failure network and software failure which is temporary failure and hardware failure which is permanent failure now if you see here blocks are get stored in slave node and slave node can face these two issues right so slave node may get down because of network or software issue or temporary hardware issue and even metadata gets stored in master node and master node can also face these two problems right now we are going to get um, we are going to exp means we are going to discuss about those failures in both master and slave now let me take an example okay this node this node fourth node has b15 if you see here b15 because that's what the metadata says now this particular node is dead okay this particular node is this particular node is dead now master will come to know that there is no heartbeat comes to uh, like if it is dead there, there won't be a heartbeat right now master immediately will come to know okay this fourth node is dead so that means one copy of b15 is gone and by that time there is a read request coming for master node for reading jp50 sorry uh, block 15 so this particular one copy is gone but still you have two more uh, copies right so here one b15 there and, and and there is one more b15 here so in second node and third node you have uh, two copies of b15 so master machine will get this copy and give it to the user so user is happy so user will never come to know out of three copy of b15 one is gone user will never come to know that but here one copy is gone now due to replication the fault tolerant is there but Hadoop will try to give you one more concept called automatic failover automatic failover that means it also tries to give this copy back to you so that means Hadoop will tries to satisfy the number of replication that you have given all the time it always tries to satisfy you by giving three copies of data even after failure okay so that means this master machine now try to create this b15 back in some other node okay now i told you right you remember the rule same copy of block will not resign on same node will not reside on same node and that means now tell me which node out of one node is fail now you have only three node out of which this three node which node doesn't have copy of b15 this node right this node there is no copy of b15 you see here metadata b15 reside on 2 3 and 4 4 is dead and i need one more machine which doesn't have the copy of b15 yeah this machine now what master will do right master will create a process it will take a data it will copy uh, the b15 either from third node or from second node and then it will paste that data in the first node because this node only doesn't have the copy of b15 so what it's it's doing a copy paste operation jp1 identifies this fourth node is dead and it's trying to uh, recover all the blocks which is down in the fourth node to a new node by taking a copy from the different copy replica now here jp1 takes a copy of b15 from third node or it can even take it from second node and paste it to first node after pasting it here the metadata for b15 from 4 it will be updated to 1 first node that will be get updated because uh, like you vacated your home but then you have to update your address also right same thing so once the block is moved for a different node the address will be get updated in the metadata so this is one case i am going to tell you so this is a hardware failure permanent failure now i am going to explain a scenario for temporary failure please listen properly okay now imagine uh, I'm, I'm taking uh, this node okay second node is dead now second node has two blocks b0 and b15 now okay imagine the fourth node is not dead okay so to this here I, I'll write back to 4 in the metadata now second node is dead and now this is a temporary failure that means the node can come up anytime okay now uh, this node is down there is no heartbeat so master identify the second node is dead then master will try to recreate this two blocks b0 b15 in a different node right so out of these four nodes second node is dead and now i have to copy this b0 to a different node now tell me which node doesn't have the copy of b0 fourth node there is no copy of b0 in fourth node you can see here one two three only there is no four now what jp1 will do it will take a copy of b0 from here or from first node and then it will paste it to fourth node 
and here address will be get updated to 4 from 1 to 4 in the metadata now again what uh, master will do it will then start taking a copy of b15 from different node so b0 it has been copied in the new node now my address also updated now what is the next block that it has to recover is b15 before recovering b15 this node is coming up this node is coming up that means it's temporary outage only suddenly the machine started responding the heartbeats so in that case master will not copy this particular data it won't copy because heartbeat reached so master will come to know okay this machine is live then why should it out it has to copy this b15 to a different node so the copy for b15 will not happen to a different node okay now here there is no problem but there is one small thing you have to notice here now after this machine comes up you will be having a question like what about b0 that gets stored in this node because uh, 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 this node is dead and then we copied the b0 to a different node and metadata also updated now again the machine is coming up and then like what about this b0 in this node right so this b0 will not be considered for any future request that comes from the user by jp1 the master machine will never consider this particular block because master machine whenever the request comes it will just check for the metadata only in metadata there is no entry for b0 in second okay this is second node i'm sorry so here four needs to be updated here okay this is one okay so now master will check whether second node has b0 in the metadata there is no entry for second node b0 here it is one four and three only okay so that means uh, the, this b0 is unused so who will clear this b0 you have to take care of clearing this and we don't know which block is moved and which block is not moved we don't know so the one suggestion i'm going to give you is whether it's a hardware failure or software failure temporary or permanent whenever the node goes down even uh, the node goes down in temporary make it as permanent and remove the node from the cluster add a new node to the cluster at the same time remove and add so that the automatic failover will happen in the new node and i will i'm going to tell you one more thing so if you see here i will i will just draw here if you see here you have b0 b0 and then b0 and there is one more node in this we have b7 now imagine like there is uh, two nodes which is which is down like if this particular b0 node is down you what hadoop will do it will try to create the copy of b0 in the node which doesn't have b0 this node right now this node is also down so that means this b0 has to be get uh, it, it has to be get created in an, an another node right but if you see this node and this node already has b0 and there is no new node to do a copy so what i told you hadoop will always tries to give you three replica but in this case what you will do so when there is no new mission or when there is no mission like without having a copy of b0 then hadoop will not do the automatic failover it will just keep only these two copies it will not bring back this b0 because there is no node to copy this bring back this b0 right after two to three days you are adding a new node means then this b0 will be get created in this new node automatically and all these automatic failovers are automatic you don't want to do anything from your end the only thing what i'm suggesting you is whenever a node goes down permanently or temporarily make it as a permanent outage and add a new node anyway automatic failover will happen by the time if user request a block it will be there from other replicas so there won't be any outage for you okay so with respect to slaves we discussed both now master so master mission is only one node right so if it is goes down temporarily then all the read request write request hive job map produce job any job that runs on hadoop will be get killed immediately so that's why a client will ask us whether hadoop cluster has ha what is hache high availability they will be asking this to us so till hadoop version 1 uh, there is no concept of hache there is no high availability in hadoop after hadoop 1 from hadoop 2 we got the concept of high availability but till in version 1 if master goes everything is gone and there is one more point here if master machine goes down temporarily and then i can repair it and bring back it and then again i can rerun the jobs but imagine what happened if hard disk itself got crashed temporary outage the metadata file is gone right see even you if, if this particular mission is crashed uh, in hard disk and you create a new master mission what is the use metadata is gone 
metadata is gone completely and that is what is the use of having all this b0 b1 b4 nothing i don't know which block stores in which machine so when this particular node goes temporarily is fine but permanently this hard disk is got crashed then the entire metadata of the blocks is gone so that's the reason people will be taking some multiple copies periodically for this metadata but in hadoop version 2 we got the fix for this metadata safeguarding also okay i will explain you that so now we discussed about the failure cases and how to rectify for slaves but master i have i'm here to say and uh, there is one more thing two more points to discuss in this diagram about the read request so i explained you write request what about read request read architecture is very 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 simple so the same client api instead of write it will be read and again the request goes to jp1 jp1 will give you the metadata information as a response to the client api and the client api will read those blocks directly from the nodes so the pipeline process not for read the pipeline is only for write so pipeline is only for write there is no pipeline for read so client api will directly read the data so here if you see jp1 is sending back the response with replicated details also that means while while reading for example uh, i'm i'm giving b0 as 1 so client api will not read all three copies what is the use of reading three copies of data client api will read any only one copy only but if that copy is not available during the time of read it won't complain back to master immediately it will skip that node and it will take the second copy and that's the reason jp1 is sending the complete replicated information of the block okay and finally one more point what happened if i write the data my write process is happening at the time if something happens i explained you the failure case of slave only after write what happened during the write it's very simple imagine so the client api is writing the data to the second node so ma ma metadata has been created it, it's something like i have posted you the uh, letter but in the receiving side and the day on the day of receiving you you have shifted the house so that means while creating the metadata uh, first node second node was in live but while writing the second node is gone so immediately your write request will not be get affected so this pipeline will send an negative acknowledgement to master saying that i was not able to write it in second node because it is down so that means immediately jp1 will update the location detail of second copy of b0 to some other node and then the pipeline will continue your write request will not be get failed your write request and read request will be get failed in two cases uh, in the case one all the nodes are got failed your write request and read request will be failed and in the second case the process the client api process which runs your read and write request got killed means the write and write request will be read and write request will be failed example you are uploading a video in youtube during that time the internet connection is gone what will happen so this client api is your machine and from the machine you are uploading your video to youtube during that time internet connection is gone your client api is gone that's it so this client api the one who handles the read and write request from the requested node so if this client api itself got killed this particular mission is dead or this particular mission is got shut down and then your read write request will be get stopped okay your read write request will get stopped only in two cases i repeat in all the nodes were gone down your read write will be failed or the client api which process handles the process got failed it the read write request will be completely failed okay fine i have explained you the cases the complete cases of uh, uh, read write and failure cases and for slave we have the solution and i explained you now uh, coming back to the master node so what i will do let me save this file in some name okay now i am going to explain you like in hadoop 2 how they have rectified the uh, like like Uh, ha how they implemented the high availability cluster concept okay in hadoop 2 they implemented the support of having more than one master so there is three process for hdfs right so i will give you the name now uh, jp1 we call them as name node jp2 we call them as data node and jp3 we call it as secondary name node and we have two more process jp4 uh, we call them as job tracker in version 1 uh, and resource manager in version 
okay and jp5 task tracker in version 1 and node manager in version 2 sorry sorry for the spelling mistake okay so the so this two daemons is for map reduce as i told you already uh, for uh, in map reduce alone the daemon names has been renamed so in version 1 it is job tracker in version 2 we call them as resource manager in version 1 it is task tracker in version 2 it is node manager but the, these names are same in both hadoop 1 and hadoop 2 secondary name node is not much important for us to uh, explain or for us to work it's all about the dummy node which uh, which keep the uh, state of name node in sync so so and very importantly don't think the secondary name node is what they have implemented to bring this HA concept okay don't don't think in that way people used to mistake when I use the word secondary name node and that is the reason I didn't give the daemon names before secondary name node is not what you are thinking so if the actual name node that actual master goes down secondary master will come no that is not the thing okay so this is this is not the daemon which is doing that magic okay so secondary name node is completely different it's a naming convention issue okay fine so these are all the daemon names so hereafter instead of using jp1 jp2 i'll go with the daemon name so in hadoop 2 they have implemented the concept of having more than one name node that is one active name node and uh, n plus passive name nodes you can have how many passive name nodes you want but if you see here i'm i, I am having four masters out of which one is active at all the time so two active is not allowed at more than one active is not allowed at okay and now you can ask me who is doing this check and who is electing this passive active who is doing that see for example if this active goes down immediately one passive will become active so this election is done by which process so there is a process a technology called jukeeper this is a cluster coordinator technology this jukeeper is a process that runs on all the name nodes that you have it monitors all the name nodes okay now if this particular active name node goes down an acknowledgement like the heartbeat communication will not happen so immediately what jukeeper will uh, do is it will come to know that active name node is dead then it will elect one active out of this passive name nodes that means second node so jukeeper is doing that so who is doing that so jukeeper will is it acts as election election commissioner and if the active cm is gone it will make the next passive cm chief minister or or some leader as an active person okay that is done by jukeeper so jukeeper is also multi node it's not one node a jukeeper will be running on more than one node and uh, sometimes people used to ask this interesting question to me you said hadoop is master slave and there, there is one more cluster type you said the peer to peer jukeeper clump comes under which type so jukeeper will not come under master slave or it will not come under peer to peer zookeeper is a cluster this is again a cluster that comes under uh, leader follower we call them as l and f leader follower and that means if this is the jukeeper which act as a leader and the remaining three jukeeper act as a follower now this leader is a jukeeper who act as an election commissioner to monitor like if this particular active name node goes down it will pick the next passive name node as active now you can ask me a question what happen if the leader goes down in jukeeper so immediately the next follower will become a leader so we don't want to build one more uh, system on top of jukeeper to monitor it okay so here uh, name nodes cannot be elected automatically but jukeeper has that functionality to do that okay so this is an extra information i'm giving it to you so zookeeper is a process which will elect the active passive name nodes as uh, and other than that your slave nodes that is called as data nodes or remains same there is no big uh, there is no architecture change in data nodes but what data nodes will do right if you have like uh, uh, one active and two passive name nodes how many name nodes you have for that many name nodes like uh, they will send the heartbeats like this node will send it to three name node and this second node will send it to three name node third node again fourth node so only active name node can perform read request uh, a write request and any job request only active name node will do that okay but the remaining data nodes will just receive the heartbeats and they don't do anything now that's very important to know at any point of time only one active name node is possible and we call them as fencing that is taken care by jukeeper okay now so what about the metadata here 
so all these so this is uh, active name node is the one uh, like who have, will be writing metadata right now imagine if this active name node goes down next this name node will become active so they have uh, they are keeping this metadata in a centralized mission and they call them as journal node journal node so all these uh, name nodes will point commonly the metadata from this node called journal node okay journal node also you can have more than one node so that the metadata will be created like number of copies will be created in the journal node so the metadata which will which will be in shared state okay so this is how the ha is implemented so if someone asks you like Hadoop has ha like high availability if someone asks you Hadoop is high availability yes you can say they are high availability cluster okay so this is what with respect to uh, Hadoop 2 implementation and now we are going to the end of the topic like types of node and types of cluster first of all types of node types of node Hadoop version 1 let me take Hadoop version 1 so master node first uh, node name is master node master node means the node which has the process name node plus job tracker I, I, I we didn't see what is job tracker yet but job tracker is a daemon in MapReduce similar to name node like they are like king and queen so name node is king in the entire Hadoop like job tracker is like a queen in MapReduce combination of these two daemon we call them as master daemon and then slave daemon so what is the slave daemon name data node which is jp2 and combination of data node and task tracker which runs in a mission is called a slave node okay so uh, like data node is slave for name node like that task tracker is slave for job trackers task tracker that comes in map reduce we'll see there and then checkpointing node checkpoint node checkpoint node which is called a secondary name node okay now the same thing let's see in hadoop 2 okay so you can ask me whether like i will tell you this in Hadoop 2, you have the, co the the option of HA, high availability. That means you can have more than one name nodes to avoid the downtime of name node. But it's optional. I want to install Hadoop 2 without more than one name node is also possible. Without HA, you want to install Hadoop 1, sorry, Hadoop 2. Hadoop 2 is possible. Okay. So here, Hadoop 2 uh, without HA. Okay. Without HA. Okay. So that means like uh, master node master node so here name node plus so as i told you in hadoop 2 job tracker daemon name is uh, renamed to resource manager and then slave node the slave node configuration is data node plus task tracker daemon name is changed to node manager and then secondary name node is same name this is hadoop 2 now if you are so with this you have to go for designing the types of cluster now let me take uh, Hadoop one cluster type first one single node what is single node single node is otherwise called as pseudo node pseudo node pseudo means false why we are saying false node single node as a false node because in single node you will not see any data distribution and you will not see any replication why then we are using single node is for testing purpose for learning purpose okay so single node means all daemon running in a single node name node data node task tracker job tracker secondary name node all five daemons running in one node is called single node and there is no distribution no replication and that's why we call it as a false node and what is another type single node then what is next distributed node distributed cluster so this is single node cluster add a word cluster here there is another type called distributed cluster distributed cluster means having more than one node so in Hadoop one you need to have like five nodes at least to create a multi node cluster a, 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 like a best practice multi node cluster you need to have five node at minimum okay so here one node you have to dedicate for always for master like name node and uh, job tracker and one node you can dedicate for secondary name node and uh, we have three slaves because we have three replica default right so three slaves data node task tracker data node task tracker data node task tracker so one is master one is secondary name node and the remaining three is your slave you can have any number of slaves so what about you with three node also you can do multi node but this is not uh, like suggested you can do for a POC purpose like testing purpose you can do like what you can do right you can install name node job tracker and one slave 
data node task tracker and one node for secondary name node and one node for slave only like this also you can do in the same master machine you can run one slave machine it is possible so this combo is possible right so that what 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 else like what else you can do right uh, one node like for master only name node and job tracker and the secondary name node daemon is like only this daemon is running right the machine is dummy so we can utilize it run one slave here and there is one more slave data node and task tracker so now you have two slaves one master in this case you have uh, uh, again two uh, like two slaves one master and in this case again you have two slaves and one master but here master is overloaded in this type because it's the master machine also has the slave right so all these type of uh, multi nodes you can do for testing purpose because you can you can't go for 5 node 10 node 20 node and all you can even do multi node in two nodes also okay but uh, if a recommended uh, uh, decent uh, best practice wise minimum number of nodes that you can have as a very clean distributed cluster for hadoop one is five because three replica so three slaves one master one secondary okay and uh, there is one more point to note you can't split like data node in one node task tracker in another node that you can't do slave node means data node plus task tracker that's it but in master you can install a name node in one machine job tracker in another node that is possible i've told you combination is master i told you but now combination of these two node is one master there it's not two master it's not active passive okay it's not that one so in overloading name node is not recommended so give one node for name node daemon one node for job tracker daemon okay so or you can even install it in same node but uh, what i'm telling you is you can split these two demons but you can't split slave demons data node task tracker you can't split okay now i'm going to explain you the multi node for uh, uh, hadoop 2 ha i'm going to explain you the ha cluster design for ha you need to have more than one name node so let me keep only two one is active name node one is passive name node and then resource manager can run on the same node in which the name node is running or you can have a separate node for resource manager as i told you you can split name node and job tracker in two different machine and job tracker is renamed in hadoop 2 as resource manager so you can even run the resource manager in the same node like active resource manager passive resource manager or you can have a different machines for resource manager only for resource manager also you have the concept of active passive and then you need to have uh, like uh, at least three zookeeper node so izk the node which helps you to elect the active passive uh, name nodes in case of failure and then journal node journal node you can have two or three this is to have your metadata in a shared state and then data nodes data node and node manager right uh, there is no task tracker it's renamed as node manager that's all and you can ask me what about secondary name node you said secondary name node is there in hadoop 2 okay secondary name node uh, when you install hadoop 2 with ha right so this is with ha secondary name uh, like hadoop 2 with ha high availability means secondary name node will not come into picture passive name node will take care of the secondary name node job also okay and if you install hadoop 2 multi node without ha without ha that means only one name node if you install like that i will remove this only one name node and that case secondary name node will be get created automatically okay so when you create with ha secondary name node will not come because passive name node will take care of the secondary name node job okay and we call this as high availability or uh, we call them as uh, like high availability and uh, hadoop federation so ha hf so this is high availability and otherwise called hadoop federation okay so that's all with respect to hdfs so after this video i have an installation video on single node how to install hadoop and practiced with some cell command there is a video in my playlist you can have a look i'm i'm gonna share that uh, video in the playlist link uh, means in the in the video link in the description box you can see so if you complete installation and then you have to practice some shell commands and once that is completed you need to you need to have a look on multi node i'm going to make a video on multi node also so once you complete this video and the installation video your hdfs is completed you can say that you know hdfs for sure
okay so this is a very base which is very important for you to enter into hive spark spark sql and everything hdfs act as a leading source in hadoop distributed file system and the distribution concepts whatever we have learned here it's common across any distributed file systems you go the hadoop framework overview so before i start uh, what is hadoop framework and what are all the components that hadoop has so i just wanted to give you an uh, uh, quick uh, history of hadoop so in 2002 google released a paper called gfs which is google file system it's similar to the file system that we use in our windows right ntfs and then in linux we call it as ext in mac we call it as macfs so the file systems are generally used in our machine for by the operating system to read and write the data from and to the hard disk but GFS is a distributed file system which will distribute the data before it writing to the hard disk. So the data will be get distributed across your nodes, your machines in the cluster. So uh, uh, why we need uh, the data to be get distributed? So when the date, if only the data is get distributed, only then I can able to do the parallel processing, right? So all data. Uh, I'm giving to a one particular person and I'm asking him to do then it is not a parallel processing so before I do parallel processing my data has to be get distributed so GFS is one such idea of distributing the data uh, like a file system uh, means in the file system so this was released by Google in 2002 in 2004 Google released an, another paper called Google map reduce this is for processing or I can say ETL so the processing for the data that which you have stored in GFS and you have already distributed it by GFS so uh, in 2005 mid of 2005-6 the Hadoop has been released the Hadoop used these two means the the developer of Hadoop the father of Hadoop duck cutting so he used GFS and GMR as a base paper and in Hadoop we call this GFS as HDFS Hadoop distributed file system and in MapReduce we, means in GMR has been changed as just MapReduce so Hadoop has only these two projects even now if you download Hadoop from Apache website and you install it on your machine so you will be seeing only these two modules HDFS and MapReduce but you may get a question now but when I search in internet Hadoop uh, when I see Hadoop framework diagram I can see like a lot of boxes in the diagram like Hive, Scoop, Uzi, Flume, Hbase so many boxes are there yeah that's true but Hadoop has only t these two HDFS and MapReduce the remaining all other projects has been developed by different companies and different individuals and different group of community members and they have contributed it to Hadoop okay so even you and me can develop something and we can contribute to Hadoop okay so today we are going to see all the components which is very familiar on top of Hadoop framework okay let's see the complete framework so uh, one more thing I just wanted to tell you here when you search for Hadoop framework image in Google image search you will be getting a lot of images and in each of the image you will be seeing some uh, some boxes extra plus or minus or plus or minus two it will be there but if you take Hadoop framework we have like eight to nine solid components which will not change and that is kind of a mandatory skill sets for Hadoop developers to know the remaining all other boxes it's like optional okay so as I told you anyone can develop and they can contribute to Hadoop so they are optional so I will I will show you the concrete uh, uh, the uh, projects which is very important uh, which was developed on top of which is developed for Hadoop and which got integrated on top of Hadoop so we'll see such ecosystem Hadoop ecosystem uh, or we can call it as framework today so people used to call it as Hadoop ecosystem or Hadoop framework so we have two projects one is HDFS and one is MapReduce so when you install Hadoop you will be getting only these two so there is a difference between Hadoop and Hadoop framework but that doesn't makes a bigger sound but but still there is a different when you say Hadoop only HDFS and MapReduce but when you say Hadoop framework so the components other than HDFS and MapReduce which was developed by different people and contributed to Hadoop framework Hadoop right so on the whole we call it as a Hadoop framework so uh, the very first thing I wanted to uh, establish here is so HDFS is to distribute the data it's like uh, in Linux you have Linux commands right so similar to that in HDFS we have HDFS shell commands so you can use that to interact with HDFS file system and MapReduce is a framework which will process your data 
in parallel and you need to do it via java as a primary language and we have secondary languages supports uh, it's it's map supports other than java as well like python c c plus plus as well but still java is highly preferable in map with respect to the performance wise so here the very first uh, con uh, contribution for hadoop which entered into market is hive so hive is a component which is most widely used project so like any hadoop project you go and see you will be seeing hive there okay hive is most widely used in any hadoop big data project so hive was invented by uh, facebook the main reason is uh, as i told you MapReduce, you have to interact with the java so what facebook said um, i'm not my employees or my particular uh, uh, developers are not a big fan of java so i need the performance of MapReduce, but i i don't want the way of interaction the java i need sql support for MapReduce. so he invented the facebook invented hive so in which you will interact with sql in back end it will be java okay so that means it's it's like a vehicle and vehicle has an engine so i know how to drive my vehicle but i'm not sure about what the engine is all about so similar to that so uh, you can speak in sql with hive and internally hive will write a java part for you but so that you will still enjoy the performance of map reduce but but you are doing it via sql or sql so hive is most uh, widely used component in big data and even in hadoop as, as well fine so the next component uh, was contributed and invented by yahoo called pig which was invented by yahoo and the programming uh, okay so the the language which we use on this pig is called pig latin it's a scripting language okay it's not a programming language it's a scripting language so pig latin was used internally by yahoo the problem uh, the the use case of pig is why they have how how and what made them to invent this pig i will tell you so similar problem for facebook right so facebook uh, like yahoo said uh, i need the performance of map reduce but i don't want to, to write it in java and i don't want to write it in sql as well or sql i i have my own scripting language within my org and that is pig latin i need the pig latin scripts should run on top of hadoop so they have invented pig so you can you can do all the data transformations in pig via pig latin so internally it runs on top of map reduce engine and it will convert java so pig will do that for you so here hive and pig uh, is kind of doing the same thing so the use case wise you can achieve whatever you are doing with hive mostly you can do with pig also but familiarity wise we are familiar with sql and that's the reason like hive has more um, uh, people are preferring hive than pig but you can you you can you can solve all type of problems in both hive and pig as well but the familiarity wise hive is used widely used compared to pig fine so the next component um, is called scoop so uh, scoop was invented by group of community members they have just joined a group in apache and then they have contributed uh, their effort to invent the scoop so i cannot give you one company name or one single developer name here it's a group of community members a member could be a company or an individual but it's a group of people so who invented scoop so what scoop is doing actually uh, see you you will be having uh, uh, some use cases to bring the data from rdbms to hadoop right so here um, uh, i have to write a MapReduce program to do that i want to migrate my data from rdbms i have to bring the data to my hadoop and then i have to do a process so to bring the data itself you have to write a code in MapReduce. so to avoid that scenario means to instead of writing a code to do that so you they have invented something called scoop so in the scoop what you will be doing is it's like a commands so there is no programming language in scoop it's it's called scoop commands it's like import and export you will give, you will be giving all your database details username password and the table name url those stuff your database url that's it so scoop will automatically go to your uh, it, it reaches to your rdbms it will bring the data and it will uh, store the data in hadoop and again uh, you want to store you want to migrate something from hadoop back to rdbms right so you can do that as well export 
So you can use Scoop to import the data from RDBMS to Hadoop, export the data from Hadoop to RDBMS. So that's what Scoop is doing. So you, so Scoop is uh, is used for data pipeline. So it is used for data pipeline. So Scoop is very easy to learn. So there is no prerequisite required for you to learn Scoop actually. So Scoop internally, any Scoop commands that you run internally, it will be in Java. Okay, so Scoop will get the data from RDBMS to Hadoop and Hadoop to RDBMS. So Scoop is not for to read data from a file or a folder or from web server. So Scoop is only for RDBMS to Hadoop, Hadoop to RDBMS. RDBMS can be anything Oracle, MySQL, DB to any RDBMS is fine. You can able to connect. And the next component is Uzi, which was again invented by Yahoo. So Uzi is a, it's, it's like an XML file. It will be like a filling the blanks. So Uzi is a scheduler. Okay. So it's a, if, if people are very new uh, to the term scheduler, I will tell you. So you have to automate your work. Imagine uh, I have done something in Hive. I want to run this particular Hive query every day at 2 p.m. Okay. So that means I cannot do that manually. Daily, daily as a developer, I cannot uh, remind, I cannot put an alarm and then go back, means go to the system at 2 p.m. and then trigger the script. So I can do that in a manual way, right? So it has to be automated. So, and that is where in real time people will use some sort of schedulers to do that. So in Hadoop itself, we have a scheduler called Uzi. So we can use that to schedule all the Hadoop jobs, Hadoop and big data related jobs. And one more thing, uh, it's out of the box, but I just wanted to tell you here, mm, see, uh, if, if someone says that there is a means I'm working on Hadoop project and you're asking me the tech stack, what are all the tech stack that you are using? I'll be saying like, uh, uh, I'm using Hive, I'm using HDFS and I'm using MySQL. So MySQL is not part of big data, but still uh, our expectation should not be like if someone said there is a Hadoop project and we should not think the entire components, what they are using will be a big data component. It, it, it will not be like that. Okay. So why I'm telling you this now, the scheduler, especially the Uzi. So most out of uh, 10 big data projects, only like seven to eight companies will use, uh, sorry, only two out of uh, uh, 10 projects will use uh, Uzi as a scheduler to do. But the remaining eight projects or eight different companies will use different schedulers, which is outside the box of big data. Like there are some schedulers like Control M, Autosys, Active Batch. So people will use such schedulers also to schedule your big data jobs. It's not mandatory that I have to use only Uzi because Uzi is part of big data and I'm also working on big data. It's not like that. This is not only for Uzi I'm saying, even for the remaining things, okay? Even I'm, it, you can consider Scoop. So Scoop is something to bring the data from RDBMS to Hadoop, Hadoop to RDBMS. But imagine that there is some other tool which the company is using to do this. Yeah, fine, that's fine, absolutely fine. That is based on their design, right? So uh, instead of Scoop, there is another product which is not a big data product, but it will bring the data from RDBMS and load it to my Hadoop. That's fine, but that's part of the design. It's not like Scoop only should do because uh, it's a big data component. I'm working on big data project. So it will not be li like that. So I just wanted to uh, create a mindset for you. That's why I'm just explaining this. Okay, back to the topic. So it's like an XML file. So uh, when your Uzi runs in background, it will be Java again. So MapReduce is an engine which, which is like used by all these components. Okay, so when you uh, kill this particular map reduce process so that these four components will not work so we call these four components as abstraction of map reduce this is an interview question so in interview if someone asks you list all the abstraction of map reduce then you have to say hive pig scoop and woozy so we have few more components in hadoop framework but they are not abstraction of map reduce okay only these four components are called abstractions of map reduce okay the next component So the next component name is HBase. Hadoop database is called HBase. So this product was developed by Facebook again. And HBase, in HBase, the query language we use called HBase shell commands. It's it's completely different. It's it's not like your SQL. And uh, uh, HBase is, is only works on top of Hadoop. Uh, we do have a lot of other databases. Uh, it's not mandatory. Hadoop needs to be get installed for other databases and big data, but for HBase, it's mandatory. And uh, and if you see all the databases in big data, we call it as 
NoSQL databases, okay, and modern database, okay, modern database. Any database that you see in big data, we call it as a NoSQL database. So I also uh, explained you what is NoSQL in introduction to NoSQL. I have given a video. I have shared that also in the description box, the playlist link. You can have a look, but that is not mandatory at this point of time, okay, fine. So HBase is again invented by Facebook. As I told you, this is a, this is a database for Hadoop and NoSQL. And uh, Hive is a query engine. So people used to confuse with HBase and Hive. So Hive is a query engine. Since we are using SQL, don't think Hive is a DB. But in real time, people used to call it as a DB, but that's fine. Uh, you can go with the flow. But actually, the truth is Hive is not a DB. It's a query engine, OK? Um, alternate for MapReduce, Java. Sorry, not MapReduce, that's very important. People used to say Hive is alternate for MapReduce. No, Hive is alternate for Java. Still, Hive is also using MapReduce. That's an important point. Luckily, I got this in mind now. Okay, so Hive is a query engine and HBase is a database. So the next component, next component, uh, Mehuth. So Mehuth is a data science component for Hadoop. So you can do all um, ML, artificial intelligence kind of data science stuff in Mehuth framework less used in big data environment and then flume so uh, like scoop flume also a data pipeline component but scoop can uh, like flume uh, will will retrieve the data in real time flume can connect with uh, um, uh, any uh, like flume can connect so we call flume as mq messaging queue so flume can connect with rdbms also files folders web servers application servers uh, so uh, you can connect with twitter to get the tweets and facebook to capture the events so you can do that so flume is as a messaging queue so scoop is only rdbms but flume is not like that and one more difference between scoop and flume is so flume uh, is like uh, it will it will only retrieve the data to hadoop but from hadoop back to some other uh, sources or targets is not possible only incoming okay so similar to flume there is some tools like kafka scribe or some familiar mqs are there uh, but flume comes under messaging queue so these nine boxes like one two three four five six seven eight nine so these nine boxes is what as a solid we call it as a hadoop framework so you as i already told you you will be seeing few more boxes if you if you go for google and search for hadoop framework diagram you will be seeing different boxes got added with this but these nine are solid and like as a Hadoop developer I should know these nine boxes okay so two things about the Hadoop framework the first top the first one is not only Hadoop framework any framework in big data yeah even we have spark framework and we have strong framework any framework you take in big data we call it as loosely coupled framework what is loosely coupled uh, so there is two type of framework tightly coupled framework and loosely coupled framework if you take this is a Hadoop framework right so in my project I'm removing Uzi and that means your Hadoop won't work no it will work even if you remove Uzi your Hadoop and other boxes other uh, projects will still work that is called a loosely coupled framework imagine in my project I'm removing the this Uzi component I'm uninstalling this Uzi component and that because of that my Hadoop is not working that means tightly coupled framework so you might have heard about the dotnet framework C sharp dotnet framework in Microsoft so they it's, it's called a tightly coupled you cannot remove any of the uh, components from the dotnet framework then the entire dotnet framework won't work so hadoop and any other frameworks you take any frameworks in big data they are loosely coupled anything that you want you can remove and then you can like uh, plug in plug off so it's not like if i remove one component the entire system will go down no it's not like that okay and it's it's not mandatory that the hadoop project should have all these component in their working environment not required okay and the next thing is integration how about integration so what do you mean by integration so okay so i want to connect my hadoop with any other big data technology okay that is spark you you might have heard at least a spark people will use hadoop spark these two terms in big data right so spark is another technology and people will connect hadoop with spark so i will tell you all the use cases in the upcoming videos so there is a scenario to connect so the question is can i connect hadoop with any other big data frameworks like Spark or Kafka or Strom or any, any other big data uh, framework. Yes, it's possible. 100% it's possible to integrate with any other big data framework. Okay. Next point. How about integrating Hadoop with 
non big data technology for example rdbms mysql oracle or not big data technology but still you can able to connect yeah now you know the answer scoop is used to connect with rdbms so the question is Hadoop can be connected with any non big data component. So that I can tell you like 90 to 95 percentage you can do that because currently all the projects are in migrations like they are migrating it from RDBMS, they are migrating it from um, uh, ETL, ETL logics, they are migrating like Informatica databases like Teradata, ETL tool like Abinitio and even you have some testing part also available here and um, and and we have even mainframes, yeah, mainframes is again, you can migrate data from mainframe. So 90 to 95% I can say yes, uh, uh, Hadoop can be connected with non big data uh, technologies. So uh, specific to the question only I can able to answer. So if you say some new technology and if I'm not aware of it, I have to research. Okay, so that's how solution architect will answer any others. I'm, I'm not a solution architect, but I'm just saying solution architects and big data environment used to say like that. But if you ask me the question, Hadoop can be connected with any other big data environment? Yes, I can say 100% yes, it can be connected. Okay, so these two things is very important. It's common for all big data frameworks, the loosely coupled and the integration part. And now the final step. So uh, we can categorize this into uh, layers of data data layers. So if you take uh, storage, like HDFS is one storage, HBase is one, and then these two act as a storage part in Hadoop. And then uh, processing, MapReduce, Hive, and Pig is for processing the data. Scoop and Flume is acting as a data pipeline to bring the data from outside to inside and again from Hadoop to outside and Uzi is a scheduler and then Mahout is for data science. So it covers like more than uh, four plus uh, data layers, right? So um, and one as I already told you, it's not mandatory to use all the component in your project. If you if you take one of my very old project, I have only Hive MapReduce HDFS. That's it. That's a big data project. So it also happens in that way. Okay, so uh, we have discussed all these points like Hadoop framework and one liner description of everything we discussed and then um, and then like we discussed about uh, the loosely coupled and the integration part of Hadoop. So this is wide enough for you to get into the uh, uh, next level of uh, Hadoop framework, uh, the topic Hadoop installation. So in big data uh, tech stack, Hadoop installation is the only uh, uh, tech stack which will take more time. So I'm, I'm just uh, telling you as a disclaimer, this video may uh, take more than 30 minutes, but I'm going to explain each and every step in detail. So like, uh, please bear with me. And uh, uh, this uh, setup is called Hadoop single node installation. So because Hadoop is a distributed technology, right? So it has to be get installed in more than one mission. A node is something called a mission. So for your testing you and for your learning purpose, you, it's recommended for you to go only with single node installation. So each and every time you cannot go with multi node just for learning and testing, right? So go with single node multi uh, uh, single node installation. And uh, uh, so now uh, I'm going to install this in Linux environment predominantly in real time. They will use only Linux environment. So no excuses for, uh, like some people used to say I don't have Linux in my machine. So I'm just installing it on my Windows. So in Windows also you can install Hadoop even in Mac even in Linux, but I will not recommend Windows even for your learning. Okay, so if you are not aware how to do a setup of Linux in your machine, so I have a video for how to install VMware and how to install Linux in VMware. Okay, so that video I will share. The link is already shared in the description box. Just have a look. Try to have a Linux machine. Okay, so I'm I'm having Ubuntu as my Linux machine. So with this, I'm going to explain you how to install this Hadoop single node setup. And uh, 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 before getting into the installation, you need to download Hadoop. And there is a heavy, uh, strong prerequisite for Hadoop, which is Java. So I have to install, I have to download Hadoop and Java first. So for Hadoop, you can go for <clears throat> just Hadoop download, just type this in Google, you will get this site, the very first link, hadoopapache.org slash release. So if you come down, you can able to see a line like this, all previous release of Hadoop are available from Apache release archive. So just click this. So here you can decide which version you can go ahead. So today I'm going to explain you with Hadoop 2.9.5 or any version two you can go ahead. One is outdated and three is very new. Even if you want to go with three, you can go with three. Uh, the installation steps, what I'm teaching you now is applicable for three as well. Okay, so you can download any version. For example, if you download this 2.7.2, 
under this you will see so many files which file you have to download so this file hadoop 2.7.2.tar.zz the file which will have always more than 200 mb size okay so you have to download this sometimes people used to go for this file or this file it's it's wrong you can't do anything with that so please go with this file okay download this um, and then next <coughs> Java. So just uh, in Google, just type JDK download, uh, JDK 1.8 download because we need uh, uh, 1.8 and greater version. Okay. So 1.8 is a decent, decent one. You can go with 1.8. If you go, uh, means when you type JDK 1.8 download, you will get into this Oracle site and you where you can find uh, the different uh, flavors of JDK uh, for the Linux. So uh, just to understand whether your Linux operating system is 32 bit or 64 bit, there is a command called uname a. When you type this, when you execute this, you will be getting output like this x86 underscore 64. That means your operating system is 64 bit. If you get only 86, then your machine is 32 bit operating system. So, based on that, you have to decide the package. So, if it is 32 bit, you can download this, or if it is 64 bit, you can download this one okay for hadoop we don't have 32 bit 64 bit and all it's just hadoop okay <clears throat> there is no two different uh, thing the hadoop what you download will work on both 32 bit and 64 bit operating system so once you download it it will be in downloads uh, move them to your home folder so this is your home or even you can keep it in your desktop or documents it's it's up to you and the very important thing don't create a separate user for it so this operating system is completely yours right so there is already a user created don't do that because i have seen many people doing this mistake okay so uh, it's something a best practice in real time we cannot apply all the best practice stuff while learning then you can't learn okay so don't go with creating a separate user that's a big mistake don't don't do that so uh, why i'm saying it's a mistake when you create a new user you will be having a lot of issues in doing the setup okay so that should not be a blocker for you don't go for it so you can you can in single user you can place this uh, uh, files anywhere i always used to prefer in uh, prefer in home only uh, creating multiple directories and within that placing the files again will give you a problem in searching for the path because hadoop installation is all about you how to mention the complete path in each and every place so sometimes if you miss some path or mistake in the path then the entire thing will go down okay so as much as possible please go with home only okay fine so first thing we need to do the java setup so uh, in windows after downloading the java after installing it we used to do the environmental setup right the same thing we can do uh, we we have to do in linux as well so just run a command ls a so ls will list all the directories ls a will list all the hidden directories as well directories and file so the files and directories which starts with dot is hidden file you can see a file called bash or c in this file only you have to configure your environmental path and variable just open this file and then click e press e so uh, the bash or c is common in any linux environment like i am using ubuntu you may use fedora or centos or red hat or any linux systems you go you will be having this bash or c file but when you open it you will be seeing some scripts so in ubuntu like we have a uh, uh, large number of lines but in some other os it will be like four to three lines only but you should not disturb these scripts if you disturb your shell commands will not work so always please come to the last line of this file uh, you can you can click shift g escape shift g will take you to the last line so your last line will be this fi if you are using ubuntu means fi is close loop a uh, close of if loop so just enter a new line here and whatever the environmental variable and uh, environmental environmental path you are setting you have to do it in end of the file only so here you can see i'm i'm given my java home hadoop home hbase home so why we need this environmental setup your operating system will only then i means only when you set these things only your operating system will come to know which uh, version of java has to be get served when the request comes to your os okay now uh, if you see export is a keyword to set your environmental variable java home is your variable equal to right hand side what you give is the value so what is this value it's my uh, path of my directory jdk just right click this uh, you will get the path it's slash home slash test and then the file name i'm giving the same right so slash home 
slash test is my username please uh, change it with your username you can find your username somewhere in top of the terminal you can see test at or you can type who am i in your uh, command prompt you can type that let me show you that as well who am i so this is your username or pwd slash home slash whatever you get after home is your username now back to bash rc file okay so now i'm you have to give these first two lines you have to set your java home and hadoop home but you can see i have given my hbase home hive home spark home whatever you install we have to give here at present we don't want to uh, go for any other uh, environmental variables because we are installing only java and hadoop just go with those two and then the last line uh, it's very important export path and this line should be always as a last line okay so the the need of this line is when you set this export path then you can run all your hadoop commands and java commands from any directories it's not required always you have to go for uh, the hadoop and java directories for the respective commands it's not required so you have to give export path and then your variable name with the dollar it's important slash bin and then the delimiter for the next uh, uh, environmental variable is colon again so like that you have to give all the uh, variable name slash bin with dollar and then the last should be dollar path after a colon once this is done just save your file with escape colon wq is for save and quit and if you think you have done some mistake and uh, you just need to quit without save then colon q exclamatory it will just quit it will not save any of your work so far now we can go with wq so once you have done this uh, uh, to bring your changes into picture you have to execute this file that's very important so source space dot bash or c is a command to execute your bash or c file or you can go with dot space dot bash or c and you will not see this message welcome because i have uh, printed this statement welcome in the bash or c file you can see here just to make sure whether it's working the execution is working or not i have added a print statement echo is a command in shell script for print so since i have added it i'm getting it so don't get confused uh, if you are not means i'm getting welcome if you are not giving any echo it will come to the next uh, uh, line so that means it worked fine so if you have done some mistake for example you have given a space here so after slash some people used to do this you have given a space here then you will be getting an error when you execute this file okay so with that you can able to find out what was the mistake that you have done okay so now after execution java setup is completely done now it's all about hadoop setup now go to your hadoop folder the one which you have extracted here see we have downloaded it it will come as a tar file you have to extract this you can just right click and extract and the same way you can do for jdk as well and then you can set the java path uh, the whatever we did it in bash rc then you can go ahead with your folder what you have extracted so you are trying to do this extract in linux right there is a command to extract the tar file so the command is tar space hyphen eject xvf space the file name whatever it is okay dot tar okay so this will extract your tar file and similarly you can go with jdk extraction as well okay fine so now i will just open this file and then etc and then hadoop so here you have to open few files uh, just select all the file one at a time and then right click and open with some editor so after selecting the files don't do double click because we do have some xml files as well that will open in browser okay so before uh, going for the selection i want to tell you one information here so you will not find this file mapr-site.xml instead you will find a file called mapr-site-default.xml so you have to rename that to mapr-site.xml or if you are not finding this file just create one okay now just select all the files whatever i'm selecting here core hyphen mapr hyphen hadoop env uh, and then hdfs hyphen site.xml yarn hyphen site.xml yarn env.sh slaves and then one more mapr env.sh so just open these files select one at a time right click open with gedit okay so i have just opened all the file and all the file has the properties has been set up uh, configured already but i will just go through it so now if you see i have the complete steps what you have to follow and i will be sharing this uh, in my uh, description box as well as a link where you can find the step so we did this step 
Now the next step is to modify the configurations file. So you know we have five daemons in Hadoop, right? Name node, data node, resource manager, node manager, and secondary name node, right? So for each of this daemon, you have the separate files to configure it. If you take for name node, the file name is core-site.xml. For resource manager, mapred-site.xml. And for secondary name nodes, there is no file in Hadoop 2. For data node and node manager, the file is slaves. And for yarn, we have yarn-site.xml, okay? So now I have given the properties what you need to uh, uh, configure in core-site for name node. Just copy this, go to core-site.xml. So in, in core-site.xml, <coughs> sorry, you will be seeing like this, an empty configuration tax. Just fill it in between. So save this file. FS default name is the property name for name node and localhost in which your name node process gonna run. So since it is single node, I'm giving localhost. In a multi-node video, I will show you how to configure with real IP address. And this uh, port number is RPC port number for process level communication. We use 50,000 as the port number for name node. And uh, now next, you have to configure yarn-site.xml. So yarn uh, is what in Hadoop 2, all your uh, processing engines like Spark, MapReduce runs on yarn only. It has its own execution model, right? So uh, the first two properties where we are specifying MapReduce shuffle, that means the yarn has to use the MapReduce shuffle for the shuffling. And then the resource manager host name, and then the resource manager address. So host name is local host and address is local host and then 8032 is the RPC port number in which your resource manager will be running. Okay, so like how we configured for name node 50,000, right? So similarly 8032 in which your resource manager will be running. Fine, so just copy this uh, four properties at a time and go to your um, map red iPhones, sorry, yawn iPhones site.xml. Yeah, here it is. Just uh, you can paste all the four properties here. Okay. Next. So hdfs-site.xml is where we configure all HDFS related properties. For example, you, you know like we, there is a block size concept in HDFS, right? So 64 MB is default in Hadoop 1 version. 128 MB block size is default in Hadoop 2 version. So if you want to change the block size, then you have to overwrite that here. So there is a property for it. You can search it in Google. Just copy that property here and change the value and the value will be in bytes convert your mb to byte and then paste it here and not only that even you want to change the replication or you want to change some of the hdfs properties you can you have to override here by default this hdfs site.xml we have to configure these two properties i will tell you what is these two property the first property is a directory you can see uh, Hadoop 2 DIR name DIR in which your metadata files will be get stored. So name node is the one which will create the metadata right for all the blocks. So that will be get stored and the second property in which your blocks will be get stored. The, the data is getting distributed as blocks in all the slave nodes right end of day it has to be get stored somewhere. So that will be get stored under this data DIR. So uh, since it is a single node, that means my mission is going to act both master and slave. I am giving this two property here. But in multi node, only in name node you have to give the first property. Okay, because name node is where the ma metadata is going to get stored. So blocks will not get stored in name node in real time. So that means you should not give the second property in name node. But in slaves, in all the slaves, you have to give the second property. And we have all these six files in all the missions. You have to configure all these six files in all the nodes. So there is no different Hadoop for master and different Hadoop for slave. So it's your configuration makes one mission as master and remaining mission as slaves. That's very important to know. Fine. So this you have to copy and just paste it under hdfs-site.xml and you can see there is a property in which uh, uh, I, I, I just overrided my block size from 128 MB to 32 MB. This is how you have to do. Fine. So what next? So the next file is mapred-site.xml. Just you have to paste this property with the value as yarn because MapReduce is going to run on yarn. Even Spark, when it comes to yarn, there is a yarn configuration that you have to specify it in Spark as well. Okay, so this you have to paste it in mapred-site.xml. Yeah, here it is. Then save the file. And then uh, we have three ENV file, environmental file, where you have to specify the JDK path. This is how the same, that this is what the same we did it in bash or C, right? The same you have to specify in these uh, three files. 
I will show you those three env file. Yeah, the very beginning you can paste it somewhere. All there will be a, a you can see here it's already specified and commented. Remove this hash means remove the comment and the value you have to change and uh, make sure you are giving the correct path of your JDK file. That's very important. So you have to give this in three env file. One is mapred and yarn env and there is one more Hadoop env dot sh right and that's it. So now all your Hadoop configuration has been completed. Just save it and slave file yes so slave file in which uh, you have to just specify localhost it will be already there you don't want to do anything so slave file uh, so is it's it's for two demons one is data node and task tracker so when you give localhost here data node and task tracker will be get started automatically fine so now uh, it's all done uh, so save all these files whatever you have done and now there is uh, two more process before we start the hadoop okay so one is you need to set up open SSH server in your node. So uh, why this open SSH server is required? So open SSH, SSH is a completely a different topic, nothing with respect to Hadoop, but what people used to think always open SSH server during the installation, it is something related to Hadoop, but no, it's not related to Hadoop. Hadoop is somewhere dependent to that process, but SSH is all of a uh, thing. It's, it's all of a sudden it's a different topic. What is SSH? A secure shell communication. So when you want to connect one machine to another, mission and remote there is a two node connected in a LAN and you want to connect these mission then you have to use SSH command SSH space the IP address of your second mission uh, it will tr from I'm from my first mission so I'll just show you SSH space 10.0.1.2 sorry 2.1 so this IP address is my second mission I'm trying to connect from my first mission so remotely you want to do something then we use SSH Okay, so why here SSH is required? Hadoop uh, will start all five demons using SSH commands only. So you need SSH server. So for that you have to install sudo apt-get install open SSH-server. Sorry server okay so this is a command just enter it will ask for s or no just give yes and install this so once you install this open ssh server okay so try this command localhost ssh space localhost so after installing this open ssh server i can show you a demo by connecting to another machine but i don't have an any other machine connected to this node so i'm just trying to connect with my mission itself my mission ip address is localhost so ssh localhost See, it got connected. All right, so I just wanted to do one thing. Uh, okay. Fine. So now I'm trying the same command, SSH localhost. So I, I, I've just deleted something. So just uh, uh, means I don't... Okay, sorry, it's a spelling mistake. I deleted it, uh, so it's not important uh, to say like why I deleted it, but you will come to know what is that, what I did. Okay, so SSH localhost. So when you do in your mission for first time, it will ask this S or no, just give S and then it is asking password, right? So uh, it's asking password whenever you try to do SSH localhost. Even though as localhost your mission, you are trying to relog into your mission via SSH, but still it's asking your mission password. It's your mission password only. Now it got entered. Right now, imagine uh, whenever I start Hadoop, five demons will be get started, right? And Hadoop uses SSH to start all these five demons. And that means then you have to enter the password for five times. Now imagine in multi-node, you have 10 slaves. Slaves means only two demons will be running, right? So 10 slaves, 10 into two uh, means you have like 20 times. So when you start Hadoop in the master node, you don't want to start in each and every node that is not required in Hadoop. Just start the Hadoop in master node, which will start the demons in all other nodes. If, when I do that, uh, uh, since it's SSH communication, then I have to type password for each and every demon that gets started in each and every node, right? So imagine I have 10 slaves and each slaves will have two demons, data node and task tracker. Then from master mission, I have to give 20 times the password whenever it says starting data node enter your password in first node starting uh, node manager enter your password for node 1 then node 2 node 3 so then I have to type password for each and every time so now I have to remove this password part it should be passwordless communication so I have to do that now so for doing that just give LSI and A after this 
you will be seeing a directory called .sh. Change your directory to .sh. It's a hidden directory and then give ls. You will be seeing only one file known host. Now to make this as passwordless communication, you have to generate an SSH key. So don't uh, like think uh, it's something very weird or a different concept that I couldn't understand. It's not like that. It's not something related to Hadoop, but still this SSH concept is common for any technology you go. Whatever the process I'm doing is to make a passwordless communication between two machines when I do SSH. Okay, that is common. The process what I'm teaching you is common across any multi-node you do. So when you try run this command, it will generate a key which is something uh, like an SSH key. So with this key only, I'm going to make a passwordless communication. Uh, when you enter, it will ask for some details, but just enter it for three times. Uh, roughly don't do anything, just enter. It will generate a key for you. And this key will be different from mission to mission. So now if you give ls, you will see two more directories. Initially, it was just only one file, right? Now you will see two more files. And id underscore rsa.pub, pub is public. In, in This is what your key file. Now, when I do... So I'm trying to do SSH space 10.1.2.1. Now imagine I'm connected to this mission. When I click enter, it will ask a password of my second mission. Then only I can able to access my second mission from my first node. Now, if I give this key to my second mission SSH server, right? From next time onwards, whenever I try SSH to second mission from my node one, it will not ask password. Because the key I'm giving to my second mission, that means I'm authorized whenever I do SSH. Okay, this is how we do passwordless communication. Now, how about connecting from second node to first node? So, from second node to first node, if from the second node they are trying to do SSH for my node, then in second node they have to give the password. So, that means they have to give their key to me in my SSH server. But in real time, we do one way only. So I will generate a key of this machine and I will give it to all other machines. So uh, bi-directional passwordless communication is not safer. Only one mission should have the full access. So I will generate a key here and I will give this key to all the nodes which connected to the cluster in all the nodes SSH server I used to give. Okay. Now, how about uh, removing the password uh, stuff in the same mission? So even when I do, when I when you do SSH localhost, it is still asking password. How about removing this, that password for localhost? Okay. Now for that, you have to do this command. Pub. So I am just appending this key to a file called a u t h o r i z e is it ed underscore keys. And please don't do any spelling mistake in this file. A U T H O R I Z E D underscore keys. I'm just appending the public key to authorized underscore key file. So this is a file. I'm giving LSC it got created. So this cat command will create this cat and append symbol will create the file by pasting the content of pub the public key. So open a server whenever it identifies the key is authorized, then it will not ask password. Now I will try SSH space local host enter. See, it's not asking password. Initially, it was asking password, but not now. And one point I want to tell you here, if you even, if you are not understanding what I have explained just in this open SSH part, just leave it. Uh, for the developer perspective, it is not much required for us to know this step. Just simply do what I have done. So what our agenda is to make my uh, SSH server as a passwordless communication and that's it. But knowing SSH and this step is important, but that's fine. Okay. So now when you start Hadoop, it will start all the demons without asking any password okay one one more step before starting the uh, hadoop change your directory to hadoop now we have to format the file system only once for every new installation okay this command whatever i'm going to do now is a format command you should not do this each and every time before starting you should not do then it will delete all the file you have to do only whenever a new installation happened Okay, so generally when you install Windows operating system, right, some people used to say I'm installing Windows OS and some people used to say I'm formatting my machine. What does that mean? So whenever you do a Windows OS, whenever you make a new installation, it will create few folders like program files, uh, system 32, Windows. So something like that. When first time you install Hadoop, you have to format. So it will create some directories. I will give you one example. See. Uh, in hdfs-site.xml, these two, uh, hadoop 2 dir is, is a directory, it's in my home folder, right? See, I'm going to my home folder. There is no such directory here. People used to ask me, this directory is not there, but it is mentioned in the path. 
can I go ahead? Yes, you can. Uh, uh, you can add all the properties, but this directory will be created only when you do a format. Okay, so now I am doing the format bin slash Hadoop space name node hyphen format as a command. When you do this format, it will create the directory Hadoop to hyphen dir. Okay, and you will see successfully formatted. This is very important. See, if you are not getting this, that means there is a problem. You will get some error here. Okay, imagine uh, you have missed some uh, closing the tag or the slash, something like that. Then the format will not be success. Okay, so now if you go to home folder, I can see that Hadoop 2 DARC. So this directory is created when you did the format. So under this directory Hadoop 2 DIR, you should have two subfolders name DIR and data node DIR. So name DIR is where metadata will be get stored. Data node DIR is where your data blocks will be get stored. So the directory is not created because I have not started Hadoop. So once I start that directory also will create. And I repeat, since I've, I'm just giving both the directories in this node because my setup is single node, my master is also acting as slave. Whereas in real time, name node only will have first property. All your data nodes that is slave will have the second property only, not the first property in your slave machine. Okay, and the name node not the second property, only the first property. Now it's time to start your Hadoop bin slash, sorry, s bin slash start hyphen all dot sh, which will start your cluster. So you can see here it says starting name node on localhost. So internally it is doing SSH to start name node, starting data node, internally it will do SSH. And then <clears throat> if you have not uh, removed that password thing, right, it will ask password for each and every daemon to start. So that's why we have done this passwordless communication. So it's asking for S yes, for secondary name node, just give S, yes. but it is not asking password. See, if, if I have not configured that passwordless communication, then I have to give password for each and every time. That means five time in single node itself I have to give. Right, and that means think about multi-node. Now, to check all the processes running or not, just click J uh, execute the command JPS Java process status. And you can see all five daemons are running, name node, data node, resource manager, node manager, and secondary name node. Your Hadoop is up and running now. And Hadoop has a web UI for HDFS and res uh, for name node and resource manager, you have a web UI. I will show you that as well. Localhost colon 500 Seven zero is your name node web UI. Okay, you will see all your cluster details here. It says live node is one, your data node, because we have only one node. And there is a, a utilities file. If you click this, there is something called browse the file system. So here you can see all your files which got uploaded to HDFS and the details of the file. I will show you after uploading a file. And now resource manager web UI. So localhost colon. 8088. So this is your resource manager web UI. You can see this. So here is it's your resource manager web UI of Yarn, where you can see map reduce job, spark job, whatever that's running on top of your Yarn. You can see all the uh, things here. Okay. Now uh, let's uh, just uh, execute some commands. Bin slash Hadoop. So all your commands starts like this. Hadoops fs space hyphen. All your commands will start like this. You can try with ls <clears throat> ls space slash. That's important. So it's empty because we haven't uploaded anything to HDFS. But sometimes people used to ask me after executing this ls uh, in home folder. I do have these many files, right? Then why I'm not seeing anything here? It's like you are uh, trying to go to your Gmail and searching for your local files. <laughs> so it, it happens, but mindset is very important. We are not querying our local file system. We are querying our HDFS file system. Okay. So in HDFS, all comments, what you execute is your HDFS shell comments. So it will show only the data from HDFS. Very important to understand that. Fine. Now, next I'm going to create a directory uh, fs mkdir slash data. Okay, enter. So uh, you can uh, you can see this directory get created here uh, in your name node web UI under the utilities browse file system. You can refresh this page. Yes, see data directory has been created, right? So now you can see that with LS also, it's not mandatory. Uh, I mean, so kind of you have to always go to web UI. It's not like that. You can even do with LS. In some companies, right, they will disable the web UI part. Okay, now I will upload a file. 
uh, it's like uploading a file uh, from your local machine to your Facebook something like that I'm just going to upload and distribute Hadoop uh, FS iPhone there is a command called copy from local where F and L is capital letter so it's like uploading a file from your local to HDFS so there is an alternate command for this called put put okay and then you have to give your local file with the full path and the file name so I have a file called words it's there in my home folder I will show you in home folder I'm going to upload this file to my HDFS space second argument so in what name you want this file to be uploaded in HDFS I am giving w1.txt and very important thing is extension is also considered as a file name so if you see in my home it's just words it's not .txt but if you see this file datagen underscore 10.txt is there but here the txt is not there so if you have extension mention it in your path here if it is not there leave it some people used to give words but they will file name will have words.txt and they will say it says file not file not access the error will come for sure okay so just enter so what this will do this will upload the file words to my hdfs file system with the name of w1.txt you can try with ls command once again yes you are seeing here and that means we'll be seeing the same in the browser as well yes you can see and you can see here the block size is 32 MB but for you it will be 128 MB because I have overrated my block size here to 32 you can see here if you convert this bytes to MB then it's 32 MB that's the reason I'm getting 32 but you will be getting 128 and replication is 3 and the actual size of the file is 47 so you will be seeing all these informations here and one more thing I wanted to tell you it's it's just bytes okay bytes or less than the block the block say so it's one block okay and replication so even though it is replication is 3 or 5 or 6 in single node only one copy of the data will be there okay it's there is no use of creating three copies in the same node right so HDFS will not create like that in UI it says three but it's single node means it will create only one imagine if there is two slave node and replication is three it will create only two copy and uh, because you have only two physical machines and uh, creating one more copy in the same node either one or two it's waste right so it will not create same copies of data in same node different copies can uh, different copies of different uh, file or different copies of same file different copies of blocks of same file uh, same copies of block of same file can be sorry I, I just missed it okay I will repeat it again so uh, uh, different blocks of same files can be in same node the copies okay but the same blocks uh, like three copies in same mission is not allowed and that is waste okay fine okay sorry about that confusion okay so uh, now it's three but I, I will have only one copy in my disk because it's single node so we just discussed all this okay cell comments we do have lot of cell comments just go to Google and search for HDFS cell comments and then with this setup you can start doing the practice and on top of this installing hive hbase and other tech stacks I will make a video separately and all like just go to my playlist the videos uh, may or may not available if it is not available please wait I will be uploading it and uh, this is the complete setup of Hadoop so uh, if you see uh, this directory is not allowed for us to view in the real time but we can uh, able to access now so data node DIR in which your blocks will be get stored I can show you see this is the block file uh, in which uh, the file which we have uploaded right the word file uh, words so this is your block see BLK which is your block so this is the file which you have uploaded now uh, this got distributed to different machine with a different copy you can see this the copies of this if it is multi node you can see the file the block in two different machines also because you have three copies right and then you are um, name node iPhone DIR will have your metadata information so this is your metadata information you should not delete or you should not open it okay uh, since it's our own machine I'm just showing this but in real time there is no access for this quota as a topic in HDFS so in HDFS we have a topic called quota and this is something mostly related to admin side but still as a developer we should aware of this particular command and because I'm gonna tell you some use cases based on which you will come to know okay this is needed for the developer 
also okay fine so two types of quota are there one is space quota and then one is normal quota i will first explain you what is space quota so space quota means so in hdfs you have a directory so in that directory how much volume of data that we can write and we can set a limit for that so admins used to do this i will tell you why they are doing this so in hdfs if it is your laptop and you have your own hadoop installation you can upload n number of data with n number of volumes in a particular hdfs directory there is no limitation but in real time they used to set a limitation for directories so each of the directories on this much volume of data only you can upload for example there is a directory called technology in your hdfs and you can able to upload only 100 gb not more than that you can write only 100 gb of data to that hdfs so they used to set it but i will tell you the use case why they why they are doing it but i will tell you how to do this first so if you see here the command hadoop dfs admin and then iphone set space quota 100 so this 100 is in bytes okay if you want to set a limit of 10 gb to the directory you have to convert this 10 gb to bytes and then you can uh, set this here set the value here so let me do i will just copy this i'll go to my hadoop and what i'm going to do i'm going to show you my uh, directory slash tech so for this directory only i'm going to do this i'm going to apply the set property so first of all let's see what is there inside this so i do have three files within this tech so if i set this quota for 100 bytes now only for the next future writes only it will consider the existing files nothing will happen for it so now i'm gonna set this so i've just executed the command now the quota has been set space quota has been set so here if you try to write it again i'm gonna do a i'm gonna execute the put command i'm gonna upload this file data 30l.txt to my directory text slash some file name we can give some file name okay enter so now i will be getting an error see it says the disk space quota of slash tick is exceeded quota is equal to 100 mb but the disk disk space consumed is this much right so if you see here like this much has been con uh, consumed 1.38 gb like with with uh, the replication right so uh, I, since i have given this uh, but it is crossing the limit so i am getting an error in real time you will get this sometimes you get this error but when you get this error as a developer we should know what is this error and to whom we have to approach so that that this is also one reason why as a developer i should need to know this okay so now i don't want to set this property if you want to clear yeah you can clear this i'll just copy this and then run it enter okay so now i have cleared it so i don't want this property this uh, quota space so i'm removing it now i try to first i will try to show you uh, the ls command again because when i try to clear the space quota some sometime people used to ask will that delete the files no it won't okay so see i'm showing you with the ls now i'm trying to upload so i'm using the put command uh, the same upload command enter so now you can see successfully it got uploaded so i'll do an ls yeah you can able to see here right so so like there will be a fixed number that your admins used to give for uh, your thing but if for example if you if you want them to increase the limit you can check with them so that they can able to increase but i will tell you uh, the holistic use case i will tell you so this is something about the space quota and we do have something called just normal quota so what is this about so this is something uh, like we are giving a limitation for the file counts within the directory so here you can have like any volume of data you can have but it is limited to the file count for example if you see here hadoop dfs admin iphen set quota 3 that means slash tech directory can have only three files this three files can be any size okay so that is not a problem but this three means only three files are uploaded means you can upload so there is a limit so i what i'm gonna do i'm gonna i'm gonna just copy this and run this so previously it was space quota so there is no problem in uploading the files you can have a number of files but in this command there is no problem with respect to the space you can have any number of uh, uh, volume of data within a file but the count of file should be three okay so now we have done this for tech now what i'm gonna do i'm gonna upload i'm gonna trigger this put command with a different file name okay so now i'll be getting an error because we already have uh, like three to four files in my slash tech directory so if you see the error the namespace quota directories and files of a directory slash tech is exceeded of quota equal to three yes it got exceeded so if you want to clear it again yeah you can do it so just copy this paste enter 
yes now we have cleared it now i try to do the put command once again with a different file name okay so now this will be get uploaded successfully because we cleared it okay now we are coming to the use case so the very first simple use case i will tell you so in hdfs any files that you upload even through hive or pig or spark whatever you are using right through any mode but end as hdfs so here for example you are forget to delete some old files or logs or there is some retention need to be applied but you haven't applied any retention so if you do this this is not a best practice so because you are the cluster that which you are using is not only by you so Will be used by different teams so always admins and solution architect will discuss together and they will finalize the volume uh, quota and then the file count quota that is the space quota and the file count co uh, quota and they will decide it and they will apply to the directories okay so if you cross it then there is a problem from your side you have to clear some old data so you have to uh, remove something so this is a plain use case now i'm going to tell you there's some real use case which will be really helpful for you so if this use case was not uh, whatever i'm the use case i'm going to tell you now if, which is not like you are not able to understand it but still fine pl but please listen so in hive right so we we have a use case imagine in i i, I have a hive table so within that hive table i just insert a record one comma gautam so I have inserted it. So this insert will be get stored as a separate file. Okay, this insert will be get stored as a separate file. Now I'm 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 trying to do an update in Hive. We can do update. So I'm doing another. I mean, it's not another record. I'm updating the same role number one, but with the name has been updated from Gautam to. Saravana. So now what happened? So I will be having two files. So the insert will be also uh, available as a file and the update also will be available as a file. That means you have before update data, after update data. But when you try to do a select star from uh, like select star from uh, table where uh, serial or role number equal to one then you will be getting saravana only you won't get gautam because you have updated it in hive metadata it has been updated but still in the hdfs you will be seeing before and after both the files but in the query you will see only the latest record so how to remove the old files so for this what we do in hive we have a concept called compaction hive compaction so i have made a separate video in the description box you can find a playlist called big data course if you go to that playlist you can able to find the hive compaction video okay I will tell you short what compaction is. So this Hive compaction will try to uh, merge the before update after update file and then it will remove the old records and it will reduce the file count by deleting the old files. This is what Hive compaction will do. So this Hive compa compaction will take a lot of time. So triggering the Hive compaction frequently is not advisable. So what we do, we'll do end of the day or like weekly once or weekly twice. That is how we used to plan for each tables. Okay. So once this Hive compaction is completed, so that file counts will be get ready used in hive okay so imagine uh, i have triggered file compaction or okay i haven't triggered the file compaction and suddenly the old files are getting larger the file count is getting larger at some time i'm getting an error names uh, like the file count quota issue so you have exceeded the number of count so now with this what i will come to know okay i haven't triggered the compaction and that is why i'm getting a problem so what i will do i will trigger okay other use case so i have triggered the compaction but still i am getting an error and that means you have triggered the compaction but the compaction hasn't get started so in that case you have to report the admin uh, the compaction has been triggered already but still the file counts has not been reduced and because of that i am getting namespace quota error so you can inform this to the admin so that the admin and you can work together and you can resolve it because it's their problem now right so previously it was your problem because you haven't invoked the compaction command but now it's their problem because you have invoked it but still it was not happened not only this you you invoked some rm command and the file haven't got removed so that you that problems and all it will come i have faced so many your rm command was uh, executed from the shell but back end the data has been not removed so you can connect to the admin and you can explain them this right so uh, these this is what some use cases i was supposed to tell you and you will be getting this error for sure because as i told you there is a limit for space and the file counts always so for example now you have executed uh, the compaction uh, imagine uh, like you executed the compaction but the compaction hasn't worked and uh, you are telling to the admin that the compaction what we triggered has not running so it's something that you have to take care so your admin is say saying that okay we triggered the compaction so what your admin is doing they triggered the compaction from their side and they are saying it will take two hours to remove the files okay that is fine but for the two hours your jobs will be in failed state because you cannot run the job because already you have reached 
should the file count the quota so in this case what you can tell so still the compaction running by the time for next two hours if the compaction is running right during just for that two hours you can ask them to increase the limit of this file count so that they will add two more imagine already i have 10 million with me and now i am getting an error and compaction is running by the admin so next two hours it will take so for the two hours i'm asking them to add two more million of uh, like number of file counts so that means if you go back to the command so you're asking them to add here like two million okay just you have to add zeros not m okay but i'm saying so you're asking them to increase this to two million so if they like you can ask them to increase this to two million so they will increase so that your jobs can run without any error after two hours your actual compaction get complete so you'll be getting a lot of space for free now you can ask them to remove this uh, two million um, to back to 10 million you can ask them to minus it so how can i uh, check the status of the uh, 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 quota okay now imagine i don't know so I'm, I'm just new to this system but i need to check the status like what is the actual count they have already given so what you can do there is a command hadoop fs hyphen count you can check the uh, quota how much file count is allowed at, you can check that actually so for that first i have to set the quota right so what i'll do i will just set three okay three uh, so now there is a command to monitor this hadoop fs iphone count count iphone q space iphone s slash tick okay oh i'm sorry h okay so if you see here I'm, I'm getting so this is this is something okay I have missed the verbose let me try by giving V as well yeah okay if you see here I do have the quota as 3 so this command will help you uh, to uh, show what is the actual current quota that your admin has allocated for you so with this you can able to find so if you see here it's minus 3 so once they increase it you can again come back and check here so that it will get increased for example i'm what i'm gonna do i'll just change this to uh, 200 and then again we try to uh, execute this count okay you can see here 200 so 194 like it's free okay so that is how we can check it so what are all the topics i'm gonna cover uh, MapReduce introduction and then MapReduce daemon and its architecture and then MapReduce program flow so how the program so before showing you the code i'm going to show you how the program flow happens for uh, the given logic okay and then map reduce input and output formats and then map reduce data types and then map reduce code walk through so we have a sales uh, analytics so i'm going to show you with small amount of data so first i'll give you the walkthrough of the code about mapper class reducer class and what are all the things are we are doing how the logic has been implemented and everything and then uh, map reduce yawn architecture and then map reduce version 1 to version 2 like we have uh, Till Hadoop 1 we have one version of architecture after Hadoop to from Hadoop 2 we have a different version of architecture right so till Hadoop 1 we have job tracker and task tracker as demons for Hadoop uh, map reduce but from Hadoop 2 onwards the version 2 onwards we have resource manager and node manager so some architecture change has been happened so we'll be discussing that and then map reduce projects set up in IDE I'm gonna do a project set up in Eclipse IDE how to build a project for MapReduce and how to do all the dependency setup and all and then how to convert your MapReduce program to a jar file and then moving the jar file to the Linux cluster and then executing the jar file the MapReduce jar and finally input splits which is very important concept in MapReduce even in Spark as well and then finally speculative execution so speculative execution is very important uh, and we have that concept in MapReduce as well and Spark as well it's, it's like a theory concept mostly like you need to know what exactly it is so this is what the agenda okay let's get into the topic today we are going to discuss about MapReduce so MapReduce is, is an important concept in Hadoop and I will tell you the priority and the need uh, current use in the industry and everything so this video it's complete MapReduce video that I'm going to cover the entire MapReduce stuff fine so Hadoop consists of two projects right so one is HDFS Hadoop distributed file system and then the another one is MapReduce so if you haven't uh, done with HDFS uh, the video is already uploaded so in the description box I have given the playlist link where you can find all the big data videos and you can also find HDFS video as well so before coming to MapReduce for sure you are supposed to know what is HDFS that is very important
Okay. So with respect to MapReduce, so it's a, it's a massive parallel processing framework, which we call it in short form as MPP, Massive Parallel Process Technology. So this MapReduce is from the paper GMR Google MapReduce, which was invented in the year of 2004. So the combination of GFS and GMR, they invented Hadoop. GFS invented in 2002, which is Google file system, which is a distributed file system and Google MapReduce. So in Hadoop also we have the same GFS to HDFS, GMR to MapReduce. So Google file system or I can say HDFS. HDFS is a distributed file system where you first distribute the data and then you do a distributed parallel processing. So without distributing the data, it is very hard for us to do distributed parallel processing. Okay, so first you distribute the data. So for that we need HDFS and then we go for MapReduce and then we do the distributed parallel processing. So you can ask a next question. So what is the need of knowing MapReduce at this point of time? It's it's by it's the, the year I'm recording this is 2022. But many of you have this question. So why should I have to know MapReduce? Because people used to say MapReduce is gone, MapReduce is dead. So why still I have to know it? See MapReduce is kind of an uh, a parallel processing framework which act as an ancestor for Spark. Okay, so you need to know the core concept of map reuse which will help you to understand Spark and secondly which will help you to uh, give some answers in interviews and still now in interviews people are asking questions from map reuse and for sure I'm telling you you will not get any work in your real time in MapReduce. Okay, so the MapReduce is compulsory to know just to clear the interview and to understand the spark much better because this covers all the core concept and what is parallelism, how the job get executed and how this parallel processing framework works and all those things you will get an idea and so that you can learn any other parallel processing like technology like Strom or Spark or Flink whatever it is. So that is what the need of having MapReduce at this point of time on your checklist okay so i've just told you the importance of map reduce and uh, and and like map reduce is part of hadoop project okay fine so let's let's just uh, uh like let let me just give you an overview of few questions so these questions are collected from the people who always used to ask me as the questions before i start map reduce okay so i've just collected few question out of what people have asked and i consider always to clear this question or to discuss this question and answers first and then moving on to map reduce the core part so that you will have a better idea fine and if you have any other questions in between like you can specify that in the comment box so i'll take time to respond to you back fine so now uh, what is map reduce called okay so wh what made me to have this question here is because like people always used to say map reduce is an algorithm okay so no one uh, tells you wrong or no one is like people are like they will correct you if you say something no it's not for that it's for your self understanding so map reduce is not an algorithm it it it, it is consists of algorithms but map reduce is, is called you can call it as a batch processing framework or a processing framework or a massive parallel processing framework okay so it's like combination of hdfs and map reduce is what your hadoop is okay hdfs is a file system map reduce is a processing framework and spark is also a processing framework like batch processing and stream processing framework even spark also also like people used to say up in proper term but when it comes to map reduce people sometimes they call it as map reduce algorithm map reduce is a place where you can write algorithm and they are like construct of lot of algorithm that is all fine but the thing is you have to call it as processing framework and the next question what language we use in map reduce and java by default so that is by default when i use the word default and that means when i used <coughs> so what language we use in MapReduce and Java by default. So when I say default, it is configurable like you can you can write a code in C, C++, Python, Ruby, Perl. So you can use any other languages in MapReduce but the performance wise, it always good if we people write in Java because that is a JVM based language or you have to use any other JVM based language or else it will take time to convert uh, the part of the, the code what you have written to a JVM based code and then it takes time in the compilation. Okay, Java is default and that is best. And at one advantage of using MapReduce or why I have to use MapReduce. See, I'm, I'm telling you some logic and you know Java 
and you can implement it right so why should i have to write why should i have to go for a framework like MapReduce or spark what is the need of it see the framework the word itself has the framework framework is all about like you just concentrate on the coding part rest all will be taken care by the framework right you go for some kind of an uh, gated apartments where you have a lot of uh, facilities over there right so people will take care of it the the management will take care of it and what what you have to do is just you live there that's it so the remaining all environmental aspects the people who works there for your apartment community people will take care so that is actually an environment you say a gated apartment you say right so that is how the framework is see generally you want to uh, run your java code okay you are writing a java code and you know the logic is fine but who will take care of distributing the job the task what you have written the code has to be get distributed so it has to be run and multi-threaded and what happen if one particular subtask get, that get fails it has to be get restarted it should not restart the entire tasks it has to just restart only that particular task and who will monitor the job and what if something failure happens what is the next steps needs to be done and who takes care of the task scheduling and who takes care of the cluster management who takes care of the execution then you need to write all this right so not only the the logic what you have to run is not important here then you have to write all these environmental aspects right and that is where the framework is giving you everything you can see here cluster monitoring resource allocation so i have a ram and for your map release job how much uh, ram need to be get allocated right so that is taken care by the framework it's all about configuration you just mentioned the size so that the job will the framework will take care cluster management so what happen if that particular node goes down or your task goes down scheduling right so map release internally it has a scheduler to run the task right so it has fair and capacity scheduler maybe in my upcoming videos i will explain you about that so so what what who will take care of that scheduling part so map produce will take care of it execution so you submit the job and the execution part will be taken care of by your framework and speculative execution is another type of execution i will teach you sometime later you can just stay touch with my playlist i am uploading all the topics so whenever i say the topic which will which i will upload in future you can have a, a look in my playlist so that if the video is available you can have a look okay fine so these are all so these are these are the points which is even applicable for spark as well so someone asks you why spark you know scala you know java you know python and you know how to implement it you just do it why should you have to choose spark why should i have to choose map reduce why you have to choose flink or storm or any other framework because the framework is giving you all this advantages right so map reduce gives you all these advantages and that is why i'm choosing map reduce and then i'm going with the logic only i don't want to worry about any framework related stuff okay aim of map reduce to achieve data locality and that means so the blocks are stored in hdfs and on top of hdfs your task has to identify which data node has that particular task or the block gets stored and in that machine the task should be get executed and that is what we call it as data locality that is very important for map reduce to provide fine then the main use of map reduce this is question number five people used to ask me this parallelism it's a it's a distributed parallel processing framework and alternate of map reduce okay spark okay i want to tell you one thing here so uh, spark is alternate of map reduce in hadoop but what happened when people used to say right hadoop is dead hadoop is gone but the the point what you need to remember is hadoop is not dead only the spark has been replaced sorry the only the map produce has been replaced by spark it's not like your hdfs is gone your hive is gone your pig is gone uzi is gone no it's not like that i just wanted to tell you one one uh, conversation that happened uh, with my friend so he told me like gautam you 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 have to be it's it's i'm roughly telling like 6 5 7 years back i hope so so he told me like spark is something that is entering into picture how do this did you have to use spark and then i was like okay fine so can you tell me your project architecture my friend started explaining so we have spark we write rdd data frame my question is to him so what is the input where the input gets stored so he said the input is an in hdfs okay fine so i asked him whether you are using any query engine other than spark or spark sql he said hive so that means 
so he he is still using the word hdfs hive and for scheduler they used woozy and for data migration for uh, data from uh, rdbms to hadoop he used scoop so he is telling all the hadoop ecosystem component name and he still says hadoop is dead so i just repeated this to him so i told him uh, see like you 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 said hadoop is dead but still you are using hdfs you are using uh, hive you are, you are using scoop but how you can say that hadoop is dead it is still there even now it's it's 2022 even now the components in hadoop are still evergreen other than map reduce hive is a very important concept that we need to know always for sure even it is spark or hive uh, map reduce right so the important thing what we need to understand is hadoop is not replaced replaced by spark only the map reduce part was replaced by spark okay fine so demons in map reduce okay i missed uh, the question number 6 abstraction of map reduce which is very very important for us to know hive pig scoop uzi these four components or it's 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 the four components will work only when your map reduce is running and map reduce is abstraction is an engine acted for these four components so we call hive pig scoop uzi as an abstraction of map reduce the reason is hive still uses the map reduce engine but just to avoid java they invented hive facebook invented hive and pig runs on map reduce only just to avoid java pig was invented by yahoo and we write pig latin script and scoop you know right scoop is to migrate the data from rdbms to hadoop hadoop to rdbms so if scoop was not there you have to write a code to do this in map reduce and woozy is a scheduler right so if if woozy is a, as a scheduler it runs with the help of the engine map reduce now imagine this the, the, there may be one question in your mind so if map reduce is replaced by spark and that means whether these four components can run on spark also s yes. you can run hive pig scoop woozy on top of spark also okay because these are like having that compatibility to run with spark engine as well as map reduce map reduce engine you can just turn on turn off that's it fine so abstraction of map reduce when someone ask you have to say these four questions and demons in map reduce so at this point of time we have hadoop two architectures right hadoop version 1 till version 1 there was one traditional architecture and from version 2 onwards there is a modern architecture right so we have these two so when with respect to till the version of hadoop 1 the map reduce demon name is job tracker and task tracker so we have five demons name node uh, data node secondary name node so these three demon comes under hdfs and job tracker and task tracker comes under map reduce demons right so in hadoop 2 the demon name of map reduce has been changed to resource manager and node manager this is in the hadoop 2 architecture they have implemented yawn and then they've changed the name of this and i will tell you what is yawn at the end of the video or at the beginning so in the same video i'm going to cover that as well fine so these are some of the question i always used to consider uh, to be get discussed before starting the actual topic of map reduce fine so let's get into the topic so i'm going to uh, take this video step by step so that you will not confused you will not be confused and you have to be very clear in understanding the core concepts that is what my agenda and goal okay now let's discuss about map reduce so before uh, getting into map reduce what is the generic definition of map and reduce so map means parallelism okay and reduce means grouping all finally to one so this is what map and reduce is a general meaning of map and reduce is okay and map and reduce are the two transformations we have in map reduce framework so now let's consider an example of paper correction okay so you have done like uh, you 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 have done your board examinations right so like 10th uh, and your uh, uh, plus 2 that is grade 2 and in your 10th you used to write board examination where the test papers will not be get corrected within your school right it goes to the different places to the different schools and they will correct and they will announce you the board exam result so let's take that as an example okay now imagine there is one particular resource okay uh, teacher one okay teacher one so uh, to this particular teacher i am giving you like 500 or 50 or something okay test papers okay so let's consider some very small number here so what i'll do here i i will go with 20 papers 20 test papers i am giving to this teacher one and i'm asking them to correct and took this first rank and now what is, what this particular teacher is taking 1 minute per paper 1 minute per paper and that means the overall 
20 minutes to correct all the paper and to fetch the topper now how to uh, like how can I increase the performance of this so you have to distribute it so first what I will do I will distribute this 20 papers to this four resource each five okay so this is teacher one teacher two teacher three and teacher four and imagine they are from different district different cities okay now again I am giving them the same task the task is to fetch top first okay so now this teacher will at the first minute at the first minute this particular teacher will complete the first paper correction right at the same first minute second teacher will complete the first paper of out of the five what I have given and so on so right now so from this particular node I will be getting top first topper and from this particular node I will be getting topper and from this I will get topper and from this I will get topper so that means district first district first district first and district first so generally we used to have district first and then the state first right this is how the results will work right so now we got district first and to get the district first what was what is the overall time that has been taken one minute for each paper to each teacher and this is parallelly happening okay that is very important they are doing parallelly so that means it took five minutes for them to complete the district first now again I have to consolidate this and I have to fetch only the final one guy the topper which is state first right so I have to go for it so now what generally happens the district wise paper correction will be happen and the results will be uh, transferred to a different uh, place different or capital of the state right so now consider I am from Tamil Nadu so I will consider Chennai is the capital of Tamil Nadu so all this district first information goes to a different node or the different place I will call that as Chennai okay this is Chennai okay now here the input for this particular node comes from these four nodes so I'll get four papers four papers as input and now again the job for this particular node is to fetch topper so the same logic it has to be get executed here as well and here this particular node takes one minute for one paper so it will take four minutes and finally you will get topper the state first now five in this district wise and then four minute on state first so finally in nine minutes the job got completed so if it is one particular resource handling all the 20 papers and that two not in parallel then it is 20 minutes so almost 60 percentage we are reducing the time and by increasing the performance right we are increasing the performance so from 20 minutes to the time has been reduced to nine minutes and that is where the real parallelism comes into picture but but the, but you will save more time as well but this is just an example I'm telling you and this this traditional uh, uh, real world example will help you to understand the technicality what it has so that is why I always used to explain this paper correction example to all my students fine now so let's consider what this district district part the transformation happened district wise we call it as mapper side and what that happened in the uh, uh, capital side that is the final node which aggregates all the output of the district we call that as a reducer so this is the reducer side so you have a different Java code for mapper side and the different Java code for reducer side in my example the code what you have written in mapper side and the reducer side is same but it, it may not be in that way it, it can be different also reducer can have a different logic mapper can have a different logic okay so I'm going to show you one practical example in this video itself in that we are going to do a sales data processing where mapper side has a different logic reducer side has a different logic but but to understand the uh, picture I'm, I'm explaining you with this example okay now we have to answer some four questions before proceeding to the next step okay let's take the mapper side first okay what is the input for this particular mapper okay what is the input so here the input is the test papers right five papers each node right so this test paper technically we call it as blocks because you are reading it from HDFS so blocks or the input for mapper second question so the second question is so where the input data gets stored okay the answer is straightforward HDFS so the next question in the in the, in the same in the same second question so only HDFS is the input or only from HDFS the mapper can read it 
So it's not like that. It's not only HDFS. MapReduce program can read from HDFS, can read from your local file system, that is your Linux or Windows. It can read directly from RDBMS. It can read from any other uh, databases or a file system. Uh, it should be a landing area for sure. So MapReduce will not support streaming. That is very important. You cannot read the data from Kafka or some Flume. So you can't do that. So MapReduce will read only the batch data. The data should be get presented in some storage layer. So HDFS is something default that MapReduce can read, but you can even connect to NoSQL databases, RDBMS, Linux file system, NAS mount, whatever it is, highly possible. Okay. So it could be any NoSQL or RDBMS or files that means your file systems okay the next question the same for reducer so input for reducer okay input for reducer is from the diagram you can say easily output of mapper that is map output right that is that is what right so the input for reducer is map output the next question so Reducer writes the output to HDFS always. So same HDFS, you can write it to NoSQL, you can write it to RDBMS, you can write it to any other file system. That is highly possible. So you it could it could be anything HDFS, NoSQL, RDBMS, etc. Because uh, when when I used to ask this question in in the interviews, right? So when people I when I ask people like where you uh, where MapReduce will write the output means they used to say HDFS and I will ask only HDFS or you can write it in any other place they will say no we can't uh, right so sometime so because uh, uh, so I, I will not consider uh, that as a point but the stick but the thing is but I'm trying to understand whether what level of understanding that they have okay so generally MapReduce questions I used to ask but based on that I, I will not uh, validate the candidate because like yeah the recent times in the last two to three years people are skipping map reduce and they are straight away they are moving to spark and they are mastering them in spark but that is okay but that is okay uh, to do in that way but it is good to know map reduce as well as a base which is very important so i just used to test by just asking such questions from map reduce but i will not validate with that answers okay i'll, I'll validate based on spark and other uh, things what we use in in the project okay fine so this is something we need to know so now you are very clear so mapper is getting the data uh, the input is blocks and then output can be written in any places and reducer wise reducer also like it's map output is the input for reducer and it can write into any place and there's one more question so I, I, I wanted to tell you is so this particular mapper you can see district wise so how many uh, teachers are here four teachers that means four tasks in mapper side and how many teacher is correcting the paper here one teacher that is one task so that means in mapper we have four tasks and reducer we have one task who decides it someone has to decide right so here four mappers are running but how it is four okay so number of mappers so number of mappers decided by what or who is deciding it so the answer is very important to note the point here so number of blocks is equal to number of mappers. This is very, very, very important. For example, you have a, a 1 GB file, you are distributing in HDFS with the block size of 64 MB means you will have 1 GB divided by uh, 64 MB means you will get 16 blocks. That means you will have 16 mappers for that particular job. Now the same question for reducer. Number of reducer, number of reducer decide by who? it's by you that means the developer has can, can decide so how many reducer you want whether one reducer or two reducer or three reducer you are supposed to decide that now imagine uh, the same diagram you take so now uh, now now I have the district first are completed but due to some reason uh, they want so my state which i belongs to is tamil nadu okay so i to already told you right so now imagine there is a ask so I have to split the state first into two that is North Tamil Nadu state first South Tamil Nadu state first they need two state first due to some reason imagine just we create a, a use cases okay now in that case you have to go for two reducers here so one reducer will get the data from South Tamil Nadu papers and one reducer will get North Tamil Nadu papers and then they will finally come to two state first one for North Tamil Nadu one for South Tamil Nadu 
okay so sometime like people used to ask me but this question is not valid but for for the from the beginners it is fine to ask okay i'm i'm expecting but but it is not a valid question they used to ask can i again make this two reducer to one reducer no that is not possible if that is the case then just have one reducer why you want to have two reducer and then again one reducer okay that is not possible and the question is not valid okay so you, the, the why we need two reducer because we need two final output if you need one final output then please go with one reducer then why you are splitting the reducer into two okay that is my thing fine and this is not possible because uh, see uh, a map and reduce is possible like again a reducer after a reducer is not possible okay you have to write a separate program for it so in spark you can do that but you cannot do that in map reduce okay that is a uh, one uh, we do have a lot of difference between map reduce and spark one such is so the continuous processing which is not possible map reduce one program and again a map reduce you have to write a different program map map reduce is possible but you cannot do map reduce and then the reduce or a mapper you cannot do in the same program it should be a different so for each and every output the the data should get landed somewhere in between fine so this is one thing i wanted to tell you so now uh, so i will tell you how to change the reducer or how to increase the task all uh, the things we will be discussing and one more thing back to this number of mapper concept so number of block equal to number of mapper this is default okay i i'm adding this very important default and that means it is not always the case equal it can be not equal also but for now okay but for now just imagine number of blocks equal to number of mapper but when i use the word default and that means you can change for example you have uh, let me change the color you have three blocks that means you should have three mappers but even for three blocks you can have six mappers and even for three blocks you can have one mapper also so this is what default is but i will explain you there is a def different concept called input split with that i will i will tell you what is this default and how that is possible but for now please imagine number of blocks equal to number of mappers okay fine so this is the first level of understanding map reduce and i will slowly move on to the next phase that is the next level of map reduce and this is the next topic okay so let me just open a new board just give me a second so i will just first uh, teach you with all the uh, map reduce version 1 of topics and then uh, at the end i will explain you map reduce v2 the version 2 topic okay so now i am going to explain you uh in a very uh, layman ta terms like if i am submitting a map reduce program right if i submit a map reduce program and how the submission happens okay so i i'm going to give you a a picture of how the task gets submits and who who executes the task and who will take care of the failure and all those stuff and we are going to discuss almost three architecture diagrams in this video this is the first level of architecture so the demons so i'm i'm going to explain you how the demons works so here now you are the developer you are writing a program so in map reduce we write the program map and reduce as a same one single dot java file and then we will convert that as a jar file okay so we convert that as a jar file and then we used to execute so even with respect to spark also we build a jar file and then we used to submit right so same way so here i have a jar file so this jar file consists of my mapper and reducer class it's a one single java file okay so uh, let me show you how to define mapper class reducer class and all those stuff so now you are just sending this request so this request goes to the daemon job tracker job tracker so as i told you already first i will go with version 1 hadoop architecture and then i will move on to the latest architecture of map reduce okay there is no very big difference but i will tell you that later so now what after receiving uh, the request what job tracker can do is so the job tracker can able to do uh, the the set of five things which i showed you right so uh, cluster monitoring resource allocation cluster management scheduling execution right so job tracker can do all this but before that job tracker needs to know where the block is present because uh, wherever the block present on top of that block only the mapper should start its task right because block is the input for mapper so job tracker doesn't have that information so you can think uh, this is a question that i'm asking you so which particular uh, daemon is responsible to store the information about the blocks 
with this name node right so name node has all the metadata information for all the file that you have uploaded so now what job tracker will do job tracker will send a request it's kind of a read request to get the information about the file for example you are submitting the jar file with the input file so imagine there is an input file which you are passing data.txt so on top of this data.txt your jar file that is the map produce program should run so this data.txt file is not there with the job tracker because job tracker doesn't know any information about it so after uh, sending the request the job tracker will send the request to name node so name node which consists of the metadata information of the blocks right so metadata so now name node sends the metadata information to the job tracker as a response so this is a request and this is a response now imagine uh, the data.txt present as two blocks okay b0 and b1 so this name node sends the response with including the replication information as well so for example b0 three copies and then b1 three copies with its location also for example one two three and three uh, four five so b0 first three copy of b0 present in first node second node third node and b1 of three copies first copy in third node fourth uh, b1 second copy in fourth node b1 third copy in fifth node so this is what the information name node sends to job tracker but job tracker which will consider only the one uh, replica it's not like it is it is ways to run the job in all the three replicas right so it just picks one which is very near to the job tracker and it runs it so now imagine let's configure data node okay so data node plus task tracker the combination is slave right so data node task tracker data node and task tracker so let me have one more node data node and task tracker okay so now uh, b0 present in first node of the under data node which is in first node and then third node is what b3 first copy right so b1 so b1 first copy in third node b0 first copy in the second node sorry first node so just imagine we don't want to go for any other application let's take only one copy so now what job tracker will do first a job tracker will run the map job inside the jar so job tracker assigns the task to task tracker but not the data node because data node is slave for name node task tracker is slave for job tracker okay so job tracker which which just sends the map task parallelly to both the nodes task tracker okay now after receiving this the task tracker will launch a map jvm which is nothing but a map task parallelly it gets started so now what this task tracker will do right so this task tracker will read the data from the data node that is the b0 and it will start the processing here the same way this task tracker will read from the data node the b1 and it will start the process here so both the process runs at the same time now imagine the mapper is completed so now these two jobs started parallelly at the same time and maybe in some fraction of seconds one may come one may get complete first and the second task may get uh, a fraction of second delay also so once this mapper is completed where the output of mapper will be get stored that is very important so the output of mapper i'll write i'll write here okay so output of mapper output of mapper will get store in local file system local file system of that particular machine so for example the output of b0 will be get stored in the local file system of this node and then the output of b1 will be get stored in the local file system that is linux means your file system name in linux is ext okay ext is the local file system name in linux okay so now it gets stores here and very important it won't store in memory whereas if you take spark spark can store it intermediate data that is the output of the previous transformation in memory also also it can store it in the disk also but MapReduce will always store it in the disk the intermediate result so we they, we can call it as mapper output or you can call it as an intermediate data so in interview they can sometimes uh, tell you like intermediate data so intermediate data in map reduce means it is mapper output don't get confused okay so mapper output otherwise called as an intermediate data so the mapper output will be get stored always in the local file system of that node in which it got executed okay now the information so how job tracker will come to know that the mapper is completed so my task tracker also sends the heartbeat so in hdfs data nodes uh, send heartbeat for every three seconds to the name node right in the similar way task tracker will send heartbeat to the job tracker okay so three second heartbeat 
So with the heartbeat, job tracker will come to know, okay, the particular task is successful. Now, once the mapper is completed, once all the mapper is completed, job tracker will start the reducer task. Okay. So this reducer can uh, task can get started in any one of the node in which mapper got completed or any other free node. That is completely uh, the job tracker choice. Now imagine it is getting started in a new node. Okay, let's let's have a uh, for for better diagram purpose. I'm going for a new node, but it is not always the case. Even the node which completed with the mapper in the same node, job tracker can start the reducer task. Now here the task is started, so it will start the reduce JVM. Okay, now. Once task tracker I mean once the reduce task is started, job tracker will inform to these two mapper node. I will make it as M here, and this is R to these two mapper node. Job tracker will inform that the reducer is started in the fourth node. Please transfer your output to the fourth node. So these two node task tracker, the output which gets stored in the local file system, right? It will be get transferred from mapper node to reducer node via HTTP protocol. Okay, HTTP protocol. So once the reducer task, so it directly goes to the task tracker. Once the reducer is completed, the reducer output also gets stored in the local file system first and then it goes to HDFS. Okay, it, it finally goes to HDFS, but it first gets stored in the local and then it goes to HDFS. Local means the local file system of the fourth node and then it goes to HDFS. The final output is in HDFS. So the heartbeat, same way, reducer task tracker also, since the heartbeat to the job tracker about the task completion then the job tracker will consider the job is completed now we just discussed about the complete success cases now what about the failure cases now imagine so imagine like uh, let me change the color so imagine like one of the node uh, so the task has been assigned to the first node okay now during the uh, task running like while running right so while in progress this particular node is down or dead so immediately the whole job will not be get killed that is very important only that particular task will be get restarted and i will tell you how so this job tracker will get the negative acknowledgement saying that this particular node is dead instead of killing all other running mapper task what job tracker will do is job tracker will get the second replication information from the name node for example the second copy of uh, b0 present in second node now immediately job tracker reassign the task to the second node task tracker and then the task only that particular task will be get restarted instead of killing all other tasks when there is no replication then obviously your mapper your mapper his job will be getting failed that is for sure so the same way in the reducer as well so this is how you whenever you submit a jar file this is how internally what internally happens is this so next one more thing i wanted to tell you this is very important so this whatever i'm explaining you now which you can even relate with spark also when you start reading spark architecture you can relate everything to spark architecture as well now one more thing now imagine the data.txt has three blocks now. Okay, B0, B1, B2. Totally three blocks now. And this B2 block also present in the first node. The first copy of B2 present in the first node. Imagine. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the next new case. Okay, that's why I'm purposefully allocating this B2 in the first node where already B0 is there. Okay, I'm purposefully allocating. This cases also will happen, right? For sure it happens. Because we don't know whether the blocks what we are giving is resides on the same node where other blocks are reside or in a different node. We doesn't know. And this kind of cases also comes. Now how job tracker handles this? So now imagine uh, if, if, the ta if, if task, for example, the job tracker assigns the map task to the first node and the third node, parallelism is there. It's all fine. Okay, two different node parallelly in two different node it is running how about if two blocks two different blocks present in the same node when in that case whether the map reduce will happen whether the mappers will run in parallel within the machine or one by one that is the question here so in the same node two blocks are presented even in the production cluster also this happens so the same two two blocks two different blocks of the same file present in the same node in that case whether the parallelism will really work within the node also yes of course it works see by default your task tracker whenever the request comes from job tracker it spans two jvm two mapper jvm and two reducer jvm by default okay two mapper jvm and two reducer JVM. So even though the task tracker has one block with that node also, it will 
span to JVM, but if it is only one block, then the second one will be in idle state, means it won't utilize any resource. But by default, it launches to. Now, if you come to this case, now here when the task comes, okay, when here the task comes, task tracker will span two mapper JVM at the same time. So one will be running on this here, B0, and another one will be running here. In the same way, if you see the third node also, when the request comes, task tracker will span two JVM. But here only one B1. Only one block is there, so only one thread will be used. The next one will be in idle state. That means the JVM will mo uh, the mapper won't get any resource or it won't lock or utilize any resource. Now again, the next case. Now the data.txt has four blocks, B3. Okay, now B3 also resides on the first node. Imagine, now in this case, what happens? As you said, the task tracker by default, it spans only two JVM. That means one for B0, one for B2. Then what about B3? B3 will be in queue. In the same node, it will be in queue. It will wait either B0 or B2 get complete. Once it is completed, then task tracker will pick the B3. Or what you can do is you can increase this limit like task tracker spans to JVM by default, right? You can increase this to three at a time, four at a time. That also you can do. So there is a configuration in mapred-site.xml you can change. But one important thing you need to know is because see, uh, uh, we don't know how many count uh, to specify for that configuration. By default is two. But we cannot achieve 100% parallelism within the node. When the blocks are different blocks of the same file present on the same node, you cannot achieve 100% parallelism because we don't know how many parallel tasks needed for that particular job in that particular node. Only then if you know, you can increase the size, right? Five, six or something. So when you increase, that is the same configuration will be used by other file also. Or your job level config, you can specify. But even if you specify job level configuration changes to increase the parallelism, for from the task tracker from 2 to 4 for example 2 is default 2 task at the time now you want to increase it to 4 but how come you will decide that as 4 because you don't know whether the blocks of the same file different blocks of the same file resides on the same node and and that too we have to increase to 4 or 5 see in the real time you can check the property people will have like three blocks, three tasks at, at a time it should span or four. They, they, they have some kind of a decent count, but, but it is not like guaranteed in the same node, 100% parallelism will be achieved for the same file of different blocks. That is for guarantee, I'm telling you. But at least different nodes will have the parallelism. That is 100% parallelism will be there. But in the same node, parallelism will not be in that case. One by one, it will pick. If the number of parallel threads that get triggered at the same time, you give four also. Imagine you have five blocks in the that mission then the fifth block will be in queue the same thing happens in the spark also okay this is a very deep level understanding is required so people will think parallelism different node parallelism is fine same node parallelism means you cannot achieve it for 100 percent okay because we don't know how many parallel tasks that i can give for that particular node you know the volume of the file or you know the uh, 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 data specific data what what volume but everything you know but you don't know which block of this particular file goes to which node that we don't know only name node knows it right so we don't have that block information and even if we know that block information also it is very complex for us to decide right because you have like uh, th 200 nodes of production cluster and you have 3 tb 4 tb of file will be scattered into different nodes the same blocks in the same node or different blocks of the same file in the different node or in the same node so 100 percent parallelism within a node is not 100 percent possible okay so this diagram i hope you understood better so this is the first level of diagram which everybody should know now when you start reading spark architecture in my playlist also i have spark videos you can go through the video but the thing is when you read spark after this you will be having a better clarity because 80% of the architecture, what I explained the same way as Spark also works in the same way. Fine. So now we can move on to the next topic. Let me change my uh, slide. Let me change my whiteboard. Just give me a second. So the next topic, what we are going to discuss about is map reduce input and output format. Okay, so uh, we have the storage formats, right? In Hive, you have storage format. In Spark and all, you have different storage format. In similar way, MapReduce has input and output formats. The way how you send the data to Mapper and the way that how you get the data out from the reducer. Okay, so we have input and output formats. So if, if the next level of this particular diagram is you have Mapper input and you have Mapper output right and then you have reducer input and then you have reducer output 
so four phases you have one two three four so you need to specify what is the input format that you use for your input data and output format from mapper and input format to the reducer and output format to the reducer so you have to specify that so we have like four to five input and output formats i will tell you one by one so this is what I wanted to tell you and the input and output format should be always key value pair that is very important that is mapper input is key value pair mapper output should be key value pair reducer input should be key value pair and reducer output should be key value pair so everything that comes inside mapper goes outside reducer should be key value pairs okay you have if, if, if that data doesn't have the key value pair you have to make your data to split this is what key and this is what value you have to do so let me tell you one by one the format and practically when I show you with in the code you will understand it fine so now what I'll, I'll do I'll just erase this fine so the very first default input format that we have uh, in the map reduces text input and text output format text input and text output format so now imagine I have a data so one comma Gautam comma and then I have a product I'm buying a product mobile and then I'm giving my gender which is male and then the amount of the product imagine this is what the input data now in interview they can ask you if I use text input and text output format in MapReduce, what is my key and what is my value for this particular data? Now, if you take text input and text output format, the input key is always offset of the record. Offset of the record. And value is the remaining line. Remaining line of the... I'm sorry, I'm sorry whole line of the record whole line of the record that means whole line of the record means one comma Gautam comma up to hundred this is the whole record okay this is value then what, what about the key offset means the starting position of your record for example in the notepad if you have this record means you will have the starting position right 0 1 2 3 4 etc imagine the last ends with 21 next 2 comma Saravanan comma some record and 200 that means the next two will be started from 22 because here 100 last zero ends with 21 so the number two in the next line starts with 22 new line is the delimiter here so this is what offset so that means zero is the key and the whole line is the value and for the second record 22 is the key and the whole line is the record so this is what the text input and output format and we have something called key value input and output format input and output format so when you use this format the key is up to first tab delimiter the tab can be comma also you can change it or semicolon anything but default is tab so the remaining line remaining line is value so in in our case if you take one is the key and from Gautam to 100 is the value and for the second record 2 is the key from Saravanan to 200 is value okay so like that we have three more input and output formats I will tell you in upcoming videos and imagine like if by default any of the text files that you have you can obviously go for this text and uh, text input and text output format this will be the perfect one okay so because here uh, the whole value is coming under uh, the whole line of the record comes under the value so that even you can do your own custom key and value pairs also but I will tell you that in the practical I will show you a Java code and I will tell you but whatever I have explained you keep keep it in the mind I know you have some doubts here but I will clear that out in the um, practical video and imagine this is this whatever the input format I'm telling you is for uh, HDFS means but what about if I'm reading it from HBase and HBase provides you a text input format called table input format table output format without input format you cannot read or you cannot write so now what about if I connect this to MongoDB or Cassandra kind of NoSQL database the MongoDB and Cassandra should provide a input format and output format and then only you can able to connect with MapReduce or if there is no input format provided by a particular database which you are connecting for example I'm connecting my 
is equal and there is no input and output format means you have to write custom input format custom output format you have to write and but but uh, but luckily we have for map reduce for uh, connecting to rdbms we have db input and db output format for hbase also we have cassandra also we have mongodb also mongodb provides it you can use it and then uh, you can even for xml json and all also you have input formats or else you can write your own custom input and custom output format but 80 percentage of the coding things the input format we can use text input and text output format if the data is very readable and delimited but but as i told you practically we won't use much the map produce part but these all important uh, for understanding as i told you you will at, you will understand the upcoming frameworks like spark or storm or any other framework easily by knowing all this stuff okay so any technology you take there is some storage format but in map we call it as input and output formats when i show you the map produce code you will understand better now what i'm going to do next is i'm going to show you another diagram uh, before showing you the practical map produce code i wanted uh, to uh, show that code in the diagrammatic representation how the data flows and the logic happens okay so now i'll show you that and to get into the diagram you need to know this text input and text output format for sure and then in the diagram i will teach you the remaining thing so this is the diagram i was telling to you so uh, here this this diagram is just a conversion of the program i've converted the program into a diagram okay so now imagine in the top right corner you can see i have seven records which is b0 b1 it's a sales record so one comma amazon comma mobile 2000 two comma amazon tv 100 three comma flipkart product purchased is ac and the price is 3000 like that you have seven records and imagine that they are split into two blocks in hdfs and this is already stored in hdfs now what we are trying to do in MapReduce is we are trying to achieve the equivalent query in the MapReduce program. You can see in the bottom right corner, select platform comma sum of amount from sales group by platform. So my output is I have to group all the platform that is Amazon, Flipkart and eBay as a uh, group it and then you have to do the summation of the amount. Like you can see here K4 V4 Amazon total purchased happened sales happened is 8500 in eBay 7800 in Flipkart 17000. This is what my expected output for this particular query. Now imagine in Hadoop there is no hive imagine because this can be done in hive so in one of my class one one guy raised a question like uh, uh, hive is again abstraction of map reduce, right so instead of writing a java code in map reduce, we can go ahead and write it in hive this query i can copy paste in hive i will get the result and the same performance of map reduce, right so now now imagine to understand the code of map reduce, imagine there is no hive so this is a query they have executed in MySQL. Now they migrated it to MapReduce. Imagine. Now you have to write the equivalent Java code in MapReduce. And I'm explaining you the program flow architecture with the coding part. Okay. So this diagram is conversion of code into diagram. That's it. So this is the query. Now, before starting writing a code, you need this kind of diagram first. Now imagine. Uh, which part of this query I have to write in mapper side and which part of the query I have to write it in the reducer side. So the agenda here is you have to first select platform and amount. Platform means Amazon, Flipkart, eBay is platform. Amount is amount column. You have to first filter these two, select these two column and then you have to do the summation on amount column and then you have to group by platform. So the first part you have to select two column. First you select it. Even you execute this in the MySQL or RDBMS, any, any RDBMS also, even in high, what happened? First it will select the column and then it will do the aggregation, right? So the same way, first we, in the mapper side, we write only the select logic. That is, in the given five column, select Amazon and 2000. That is platform and amount. That is the only thing I'm writing into the mapper side. So in mapper side, I'm writing this. So if you see here the input K1 V1, as I told you, we have mapper input, mapper output, reducer input, reducer output. There is four phases of key value pairs. That's why K1 V1, K2 V2, you can see here K2 V2 and then K3 V3 and then K4 V4. Right, so I have four phases here: mapper input key value pair, mapper output key value pair, and then mapper reducer input key value pair and reducer output key value pair. I hope you got it. Right now, in map side, I'm so before coming into map side, you can see like we have two mappers because we have two blocks number of blocks equal to number of mapper and you can see here i'm using text input and text output format in k1 v1 you can see because here you can see the offset of the key right so zero 
and the value is the whole line. Now imagine 2000, the last zero ends 30, 30th. Now the next second record starts with 31st. And 2 comma Amazon and when you when you see the 1000, the last zero of second record ends with 55. So the third record starts with 56 and, and continuation in the next block. So you can see the flip card 3000 last zero ends with 77. So the fourth record 4 starts with 78. And very important, the second block will be the continuation. It's not like again K1 will be zero for the second block. No. Okay, so like that it is coming. Now when it comes to mapper, I am doing the select logic. <clears throat> I am doing the select logic and the output of mapper which is K2V2, right? So select part. So out of this five column, <clears throat> I am selecting only two column which is amount and the uh, product, uh, platform and amount. That is my output of mapper. So this mapper output will be get stored where? In the local file system of that particular node. Okay. Now. Before going to reducer, there is something called shuffle, will shuffle the mapper output. Actually, I have uh, given this in the middle of the diagram, but this shuffle actually happens in the reducer side. Okay, sort by key, group by key. Now, the mapper output will be get shorted and then it will be get grouped. Now, if you see the diagram, it got shorted. So, first mapper, it got shorted and the second mapper, it got shorted. So, actually, it will be shorted and grouped. Okay, so I, I just missed, missed that in the diagram. So let me show you in the notepad. So let me do it here. So here the output will be Amazon. So it will be shorted and then it will be get grouped. So I'll first, uh, and, and very important, short and group is based on the key. In interview, people can ask you, map reduce shuffle is based on value or key or both. You have to say it is only based on key, short by key, group by key. That's it. So the keys will be get shorted. So flip cart and then eBay. So your before it goes to the reducer method, the shuffle will be get executed on the mapper output and this is what your K3V3. The K3V3 what I am what I have written in the diagram is wrong. Sorry for that. So what actually happens here is the K3V3 will be grouped result. So if you see Amazon, uh, the values will not be get grouped. So that's why here values get stored in the list. Okay, list and all, we don't want to use it in the code. It, it, uh, it internally map reduce shuffle will take care. Okay, so here uh, 2000 and then 1000 and then 3000, which is from Amazon, right? And then for Flipkart, and then for Flipkart, it is uh, 3000 uh, and then Flipkart, we have one more Flipkart from the second uh, node, mapper output, right? 5000 and 9000. So 5000 and then 9000. And then eBay. So eBay is, we have only one eBay that is in the second node. So 7800. So this is what K3V3 is. This is the shuffle output. So uh, in the diagram, K3V3, what I have given is wrong. That is my mistake, sorry. But it is a grouped output. Shuffle output is grouped output. So this is what your K3V3. So this is K and uh, this is V. Okay. This is, this is K3 and V3. Let me put K3, V3. Now this will be your input for reducer. So after receiving that, what reducer will do? It will first read the key Amazon and then it will do the summation by iterating the list. And then next it will uh, take Flipkart, it will iterate the list. And then eBay and then it will iterate the list. Very important. See, record wise it won't iterate. Means you don't want to write any logic to iterate it. Okay, you have to write a logic in the reducer side to iterate the list only, not iterating the record. Iterating the record record and mapper side and reducer side the framework will take care you only in the reducer side you have to iterate the list for that we have written some for loop or while loop you can do okay so when the code part comes i will explain so this is what i have explained in this diagram so the same thing i am going to show you in the code but before getting into it so the input and output format we have to decide so k1 uh, is as i told you we are using text input and text output format as i told you so we have decided the input format. Now what about the data type? So I want to tell you something about the data type in MapReduce. So before getting into the code, let me just explain you the data type part. So let me open a new whiteboard. Okay. So data type. So MapReduce Java data type and then MapReduce data type. See before getting into data type, see data that gets 
like mapper mission and reducer mission right so mapper will send the output to the reducer via http i told you right so the data that get transfers in the network io will be in a serdi format that means serialized and deserialized and do i need to take care of doing this no map reduce is doing that for you so for that they are designed the data type in a different way so that the data type itself will take care of doing the serialization and we call that as serialization in normal world we call it as writables in map reduce okay now in java if you say int means in map reduce it is called int writable because whenever you see map reduce code you will see some weird data types int writable and people used to ask me what is that and if there is a float and here it is float writable and for string in java in map reduce we call it as text only it is not text writable so don't think this is not serialized it is also serialized data type but they didn't use the word writable string in java is called text so other than that for any data type like even null also we have null writable here okay so boolean boolean writable so only for string in map reduce it is text now you may get a question so in mapreduce code only we will use writable data types no it is not like that so in mapreduce you can use both java data type as well as the writable data type so java data type i can even use int in mapreduce program but i can also use int writable so you can get some doubts here gautam you are confusing us why then we are using both when we have writable data type then why should we have to use java data type okay i will tell you that so why i am telling you all this right so before showing you the code i'm i'm giving a mindset or a comfortable situation for you to understand the code when i open it okay so i'm i'm just trying to uh, make it out very clear to have your own comfortable space when i show you the map reduce code okay that's why i'm just trying all this fine so now as i told you you have four phases in map reduce so map input map output reducer input reducer output so whenever you are using the key value pair format of the data and that time only you have to use the writable data type other than that within your mapper and reducer logic if you want to do some kind of a java plain java operation you can do go with uh, java data type for example you have to do a, a array of string or you have to make a split by you can use all normal data types you want to do an integer parse and everything you can do with normal java when it comes to key value pair you are passing the data to a key value pair or you are receiving it in the reducer side as a key value pair that time only you have to use a writable data type okay so now with all these information that you have in the mind now let's get into the code so that you will understand better so before getting into the code one last thing i want to tell you is skeleton of map reduce code skeleton of map reduce code so you will be having one main class Uh, imagine abc and then you will be having two nested class one for mapper okay so one for reducer and finally you will be having public static void main which is the main uh, main for your code so you have one, two nested class one for mapper and reducer and main method we call it as a driver code okay main we call it as a driver so finally you have the skeleton okay now the end is over let's get into the practical so i have this eclipse here and here i have uh, uh, the program for you and uh, how to create a program in eclipse and how to execute also i will show you in the same video first i will explain this code for you let me increase the font size so now you can see let me right click here and do a uh, folding collapse all so now you can see the skeleton i i told you about the skeleton of the code right so you have one main class and then you have uh, uh, two nested class one for mapper one for reducer and then you have the main now let me just expand you the mapper class okay so if you see here public static class sales map extends mapper so i'm just extending i'm doing a normal java inheritance and then i'm extending the mapper and i'm do i'm just uh, i'm just passing the expecting data types for my input key and output key let me go back to this diagram which i showed you now can you tell me since we have seen the uh, data type right in writable why told you the difference between java and uh, map reduce data type so can you uh, tell me like what data type i can use for k1 here 
So you may you may get in your mind intritable, right? Yeah, you can use intritable since it is an offset. We don't know even for tenth record also. Maybe if the column number of columns is so high, your int range can exceed. So whenever you use text input and text output format, it is better to use long writable for keys. Okay, but for intritable, in my case, it works because the volume, the the length of the column is very small. So K1 is long writable, and for V. It is string, right? And that means Java string means in MapReduce it is text. And K2 it is text. V2 is intritable. And K3 is text. V3 is intritable. And as I told you, list don't get confused. Sometimes people used to tell me list of intritable. No, list part will be taken care by the MapReduce framework. You just mention it as writable, intritable. And finally, K4 is text. V4 is intritable. Okay. Let me go back to the code. You can see here mapper input is long writable. Mapper output uh, is sorry. Mapper input key is long writable. Map input value is text. Mapper output key is text. Mapper output value is int writable. So for mapper input key input value and output key output value type we have defined. Okay. Now if you open the source code of this mapper, this mapper has a source code. If you open, you will see four method setup, map, run. Clean up, and these four method has its own unique way of handling the code. See, now we have written the code in the mapper method, and I have not used to set up map run clean up and all. Uh, I used only map. I didn't use remaining three methods. And what is the use of uh, the the code? What you have written in the map method, you can even write it in the setup method, but it has a different way of executing that code. See, whatever the code that you write in the map method of a mapper class. Then that code will be get executed for each and every record, the row in your block. I repeat, any code th that you write in the mapper method, right? Map method, the code will be get executed for each and every row in the block. Now imagine, I have a certain case where I need to run only once for each block, not for each row. Now imagine you have to create a connection in Oracle. You have to open a connection. You are doing a JDBC connectivity. You want to create a connection. So now imagine if you write a code to create a connection in Map method, and you have ten records in the block, then how many connection will get created? Ten connection, right? Because I told you any logic that you write in the Map method will run for each row. Right, you have ten rows, then ten times. Just for reading ten records, why should you have to create ten connections, which is costly, right? So we have a method called setup. Will be get called before map, and whatever you write within setup will be get executed only once. Okay, and the same way clean up. Now you have to close the connection. Now close the connection and the clean up, which will be get executed only once, not for every time. So any other use case you have, like only one time execution, you can make use of setup and clean up. And run is a kind of a uh, uh, place where you can write all the driver related stuff. But for writing driver related stuff, we use main method. Okay, this is the same four methods you can see in the reducer class also. I am, I am expanding the reducer class here. You can see the same four methods here. I have commented right. Same here also. I am using only reduce. And similar to map, what reduce will run for each key value pair in your for each row. Okay, in MapReduce term, we say map will run for each key value pair. That means each record. Okay, let me first explain you the mapper code. So let me expand this. Now, let me go back to the diagram and the query here. You have to first select platform and amount. Then you do the summation and the group. So now, if you see here, public void map, and then I'm I'm defining the data type, which is long writable key text value. What is long writable key? Back to the diagram. This key zero thirty one fifty six is key and long writable and value is your whole record. So we are getting it, okay. And then context, I will tell you what is this context at this line. When it comes to line number thirty eight, I will explain. See string. I am using Java data type. I told you right. I can use Java data type also. So first, I am converting the whole value to string because I have to mention that I am using a delimiter in my code. So I will show you my input file here. See here it is comma separated. So I have to tell that my data is comma separated. And why we are doing this? Why should I have to do this? Because see if it is a normal SQL, then you can mention the column name, select platform comma amount. But in this input there is no columns. Then how can I fetch it? So we are creating a column by 
creating an array here you can see here string array of element equal to line that is we converted it to string and we stored it as variable as line split by comma now what will be the output of this line you know it will be like this so element element of 0 array starts from 0 element of 0 will be 1 and then element of 1 will be your name that means for each and every input you are creating a column as this column name element 0 is serial number element 1 is the platform element 2 is mobile element 3 is amount so now you created a column name by using java right so now i'm i'm fetching the column so which element i have to fetch here element of 1 and then element of 3 right so element of 1 is element of 1 is platform element of 3 is amount we need to select only these two column right so now you can see i'm using text which is map produce data type so now i'm defining element of 1 to text i i selected so when when this line execute it will get uh, platform amazon it will get amazon from the first record now next i have to fetch which uh, column element of 3 so element of 3 is actually an integer column right it's actually an integer column but what we did in line number 33 we converted it to string okay so now we converted it to string because i have to create a column names so i created the column name now what i have to do i have to convert this element of 3 back to integer and i'm using a normal java data type and the syntax to convert and string to integer integer dot percent now i converted element of 3 when it comes to this line the, the casting will happen that is from string to integer it got converted element of 3 is converted now I am passing this element of 3 that is i which is converted right the variable is i I am passing it to int writable so in text I am passing element of 1 sorry element of 1 yes element of 1 and then I am okay here um, my mistake okay here my mistake it is not name it is actually amazon okay i'm sorry so element of one is text so this part ele select element of one and then comma we are selecting element of three so when this line executes it fetch element of three which is your amount right now context dot write means it you are you are writing the output to mapper local file system right that is what context do so context dot write is nothing but it should be always key value pair so tx is what tx is your element of one which is amazon comma what is value which is 2000 so which is k2 v2 you can see here map output k2 v2 amazon 2000 that's it so now this map code whatever you have written will run for each row in your block see are you having any for loop or while loop here no because iteration as i told you mapper will take care okay now what is next expand the reducer side now when it comes to reducer after shuffle so shuffle and all by the time will be happened so when it comes to uh, reducer it comes like this this way so this will be your input when it comes to reducer for example i'll take one record yes so when it comes to reducer this will be the input so now what we are doing in the reducer side i am getting text key and iterable of intratable that means the value i am going to iterate so i am using this iterable interface so i am declaring int sum equal to zero and i am running in for each loop this is a for each loop i am iterating the list now you can ask me why you are using for each loop see i am using this for each loop not to iterate the records this is to iterate the list only okay so i am just iterating the list that means sum equal to zero and then 0 plus 2000 is 2000 and 2000 plus 1000 is 3000 and then 1000 plus 3000 plus 3000 totally 6000 so you will be getting because we are using sum plus equal to val dot get so this for each loop will execute for three times and then again sum will be zero for the next key value pair okay and here also we have this context dot right i am printing the key as is i am not doing anything with the key and in writable of sum i am getting the sum so your final output will be this k v4 is k4 v4 will be your final output in hdfs so i will show you how to create a project setup and how to run this code and get the output 
okay that is our next goal so before that i want to show you driver code that that is very important right and driver there is nothing uh, with respect to logical thing uh, the driver code is like filling the blank like feeding information like where is your job tracker where is your name node see i'm giving all the name node information and job tracker information and then i'm giving a, a title for my code so you can give any title so i'm giving a sales sales data okay you give title so this title you can see in the job tracker web ui okay uh, in Hadoop Root is resource manager web UI. Okay. Now let's come down. You can see set jar by class and I'm giving sales info dot class. Why sales info is this Java file. So why I'm setting this because you have to convert this code as a jar file, right? So we are giving this jar by class and you can see here what is your mapper and uh, mapper output key mapper output value data types what you are using you have to give it, give that here so i am giving so what is your mapper output key is text what is your mapper output value which is intratable and the same way you have to say for reducer so but here you can see i am not using the word reducer because when you use map keyword as specifying it for mapper and without map keyword means it will consider for reducer okay and then you have to set your mapper class reducer class if you miss to set these two then it will run the default mapper and reducer it won't consider your classes so you have to mention and set num reducer task okay so in the beginning of the diagram video right i told you the reducer task will be increased and decreased that is purely the developer choice based on the requirement i told you right see here only you have to change okay so you can remove this and you can put two and then your input and output format and then what what format you are using we are using text input and text output and finally your input path and output path on the runtime i am going to give this is i am passing it as an argument this is from hdfs and output also to hdfs and finally job dot wait for completion is true and that means once you trigger this job in the terminal it will print some extra logs for our uh, uh, verification so till the log get generates the job will wait for completion okay so that's why we are giving true if you give false here you will not get the logs in the terminal in the command prompt but you anyway you can see the log in web ui job tracker and on ui you can check but i'm telling you fine so this is what a, a typical MapReduce program will be so this is again for your understanding only so you don't want to be much into this because we are not using MapReduce. but anyway i'll tell you how to execute this uh, in in hadoop and how to see the result in the resource manager web ui and all i will tell you okay now let me explain you the version 2 architecture of MapReduce. okay that is very interesting but this is important this is an this is the yawn architecture i wanted you to know okay let me open a new whiteboard so this is the yawn architecture of MapReduce because yawn is very important to know so this is yet another resource negotiator yarn full form is yet another resource negotiator so on top of hdfs we had MapReduce in version 1 so now they removed this MapReduce in version 2 and on top of hdfs they created a layer called yarn on top of yarn you can have MapReduce, you can have spark you can have hbase you can have strom etc so yawn created a common execution model okay yawn is a cluster manager it, it turned as a cluster manager and yawn has a common execution module for any of the tech stacks that you run on top of yawn so spark when it comes to yawn the architecture of execution is same when when it comes to map reduce when the map reduce runs on top of yawn then the execution is same okay when storm comes to yawn it has a common execution model but without yawn all these technology can be executed separately also that is very important okay but in hadoop 2 MapReduce will always run with yawn but spark you can run without on with yawn two types storm also hbase also so flink also with yawn without yawn you can do okay so now we understood like where exactly this yarn comes into picture and yarn main used to create it's a cluster manager that gives a common execution model for all these tech stack so this yarn after entering yarn the job tracker task tracker uh, daemon names has been changed to job tracker to resource manager task tracker to node manager and this daemon is not only for map reduce this daemon only th this daemon is also for spark also for strom and any other technology that 
trans on yarn so people always will get confused this resource manager and node manager is only for MapReduce no it is for spark it is for or any technology that runs on yarn okay now let's discuss how this resource manager and node manager thing happens so you remember uh, we discussed about the diagram like user submits the jar that goes to job tracker same diagram i am going to tell with this resource manager and node manager okay so let me just erase this or let me open a new window just give me a second so now the drawback of version 1 architecture of MapReduce right resource pressure so that is a single job tracker so as I uh, just recap the diagram again so job tracker and job tracker submits the task and starts mapper and reducer right mapper and then reducer so one job tracker has to take care of all the requests so one user sending one now next user also sending the same request now again job tracker has to do everything and for each and every job the job tracker has to take care of doing the cluster manager resource allocation scheduling execution and so on so right for any request comes job tracker has to take care of everything so job tracker isn't under pressure and in some time job tracker will run out of some memory issue or something will happen to the job tracker so in the version 2 architecture they implemented this resource manager and node manager and in ha still Hadoop version 1 job tracker we have only one if job tracker goes everything is gone from Hadoop 2 onwards they have implemented two more than one resource manager that is active and passive so even though the active resource manager is dead passive resource manager will continue your job okay not only map reduce job hive job peak job spark job and everything from hadoop 2 same way in hdfs also we have two name nodes from hadoop 2 okay so now imagine that the user sends a request okay so when it comes jar request so it comes to resource manager it comes to resource manager also we call it as a application manager application manager okay so this application manager consists of resource manager plus scheduler okay i will remove resource manager from here so this particular process we call it as an application manager okay in short form they used to call it as asm so after submitting the jar so it comes to here so this resource manager and the scheduler combinedly works and it will start a new manager okay I'm, I'm going to a layman example okay this is not a technical example it goes to an assistant manager it creates an assistant manager for this particular jar okay this is a sales jar okay so what this application assistant manager will do right after receiving the request this assistant manager will run the map task in the respective data node and respective data node which has that block okay now this assistant manager is running the task now assistant manager will be taken care of receiving the heartbeats from this mapper node and from this mapper node and assistant manager have to start the reducer in the new node okay now once the job was successful now this assistant manager will send the final heartbeat to resource manager saying that job is success now the resource manager has less pressure now you can ask me what about there is one more uh, marketing data jar okay there is another jar that submitted by a different user so that comes to resource manager now this resource manager will not disturb this assistant manager it won't disturb this guy instead this resource manager will launch a new assistant manager and this assistant manager will do the map task reducer task and and, and then like finally it sends a heartbeat to the resource manager and now what happened if one map task get fails this we already know now this assistant manager will reassign the task to another replica now in the same way what happened if the assistant manager itself gone now resource manager will create a new assistant manager again for the marketing jar now that means resource manager start a, a new assistant manager for every jar that gets submitted and we call this as technically application master okay application master 
so this is a yarn architecture and this is how your spark works and this is how your map produce works and everything so for every job that request comes to the resource manager resource manager will start a new application master and this application master is the responsible for that particular jar get complete spark jar or hive job or pig job or map produce whatever it is that application master is responsible i'll show you one more diagram okay so if you see this is the uh, a very uh, uh, diagram which i want to show you how the resource manager after receiving the job request so after the user sends the job request that is request I have marked it as one it goes to ASM which is application manager and then application manager and the scheduler and combinedly they will create a new application master in one of the slave node okay this three are slave node so slave node data node and node manager so in in Hadoop 2 it is not task tracker it is node manager so it launches the new application master which is the assistant manager right so in one slave node and this assistant manager will take care of running the mapper and reducer and receiving the heartbeats and all those stuff so finally the application man uh, master which is the assistant manager sends the heartbeat to the resource manager saying that everything is fine now resource manager sends the successful notification to the user so now second user sends an another request means a new assistant manager that is application master will be get created so asm means application manager am means application master these two are not daemon this is a service that runs within the process this is what the yarn architecture diagram the flow how the execution happens so this is not only for map reduce this is for spark this is for hive anything that you run on top of yarn this is how it works so uh, now you can ask me then where exactly spark architecture will come so spark has its own architecture and you said when spark runs on yarn so this has a common the same resource manager node manager only comes then spark architecture where it comes that comes in the task level here here so when spark also creates a task right so this task level the spark architectures will come but overall the high level of allocating the job executing the process getting the acknowledgement that is what the yarn will do with the help of resource manager and node manager that is the yarn architecture with asm and all am so even strom has its own architecture that comes in the task level okay so this is what yarn architecture of hadoop 2 and uh, we have this execution I, i'll show you how to run the map produce program so now let me show you how to do a, a map produce setup in eclipse id okay so let's first create a project so file uh, new java project so let me name it as map produce okay finish so this will just create a normal java project so after creating this project what i will do i will just uh, copy paste the map reduce program uh, so i already have my code so i have my code here in example this is another project but i'll just copy my code from here okay so sales info.java let me copy the code and then i will paste it inside src folder under map reduce project which we have just created now right so now you can expand here you can see some errors okay so this errors like I'll, sh I'll just show you the code first so if I expand the import statement you can see uh, there is first three import statement which is Java import so there is no error because by default we created a Java project any Java related code that you add here you will not get any error but if you see I'm getting this org Apache Hadoop all these are Hadoop imports so now Eclipse doesn't know the dependent library information of Hadoop so what you have to do is you have to inform your Eclipse where the libraries of Hadoop present so or what you can do you can copy all the libraries the jar files from Hadoop installation directory and you can paste it here inside your project folder so in real time people will use some build tools you can google it what is build tool build tools like Maven, Gradle, uh, SBT so these are some build tools in, if you use build tools then the the build tool will take care of getting the dependency for the respective syntax and the code what is required okay you can just search for a build tool and what is maven and how to configure map reduce program or spark program in maven you can google it so that is a, a separate big topic so i don't want to get into that for now so let's just do this manually i'll bring the jar and then i'll place it in my project folder so that the errors will be get resolved okay first we have to do that so this is not only for map reduce even you create a spark java project or even any other uh, project with respect to uh, the technology you have to bring the dependency also the libraries also 
or you can use the builder tools okay fine so now uh, what i'll do i'll just uh, so here this hadoop folder 2.9.1 i have just extracted it okay so this is windows but we are not going to execute the hadoop in windows or i am not going to execute the code in windows so i am just doing my development only in the eclipse and that to installed in windows after creating the jar file of my code i will move this code to my linux server in which hadoop is running okay this is how in the real time also we'll do it's spark or map produce anything right our office laptop will be windows and you have to develop your code on windows and then you will be moving your jar file to linux server right so the same way so but we need this libraries right so i've just extract downloaded and extracted the hadoop so just open this folder you will see uh, share open this folder share and then hadoop and you will see some folders here so first open this common folder and then you just open this lib folder and copy all the jar files okay so copy all the jar files just go to eclipse right click your project and create a folder new folder and you have to name it as library lib enter so this will create a lib folder so now you have to copy all these jar file inside common folder and paste it in the eclipse lib folder okay this is first step so let me do now copy and then go to your eclipse and in the lib folder you have to paste fine so next in outside uh, like inside the common folder outside the lib folder you will see couple of jars here right so copy these jars also just copy these jars as well and in lib folder you can paste it yeah okay so now next folder hdfs so go to hdfs and you will see lib folder again copy all the jar file and come back and lib folder just paste it so some uh, jars will be already there but that is fine but we don't know which jar to uh, get specifically right so just overwrite the remaining jar files whatever it is already exists just you can overwrite so for this case only like people use this build tools maven build tools and any other build tools which it will take care of downloading the respective jar what is required for that particular code and then outside the lib folder and inside hdfs you will see some more jar files just copy this as well and then paste it here in the lib folder yes to all once again and then next map reduce okay this is next so lib folder again copy all the jar files paste it here and then again go to mip map reduce folder you will see some more jars available outside the lib folder copy that as well and then paste it here okay so next yarn okay so in yarn again you will see lib folder copy this and go back to the lib folder paste it and then inside yarn folder outside lib folder you will see again some additional jars copy this as well okay just let's wait for this to complete yeah okay so now paste okay now we just uh, copied all the jars whatever it is required you can follow the order what i have explained and showed in the video now the jars has been placed but still the eclipse has to know that the jar files what i have added in the lib folder need it to, need to consider so the eclipse need to consider it so for that what we have to do so you have to build a path between eclipse and your lib folder and we call it as java build path that means you have to add all these jar files which you have placed in the lib folder in the java build path okay that is the next step just right click map reduce and go to properties and you will see there is an option java build path click this and then you will see add jars click this and expand your project our project is map ready and you will see a lib folder right just expand it and select all these jar file so just shift down arrow select the first jar and then shift down arrow so why i'm 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 going one by one right so uh, when you copy some jar file th there will be some uh, text files or uh, tar files in the lib folder so just i'm checking it so if the, if you have some other files or uh, other than jar files then you will not have a successful build okay just go through once you just make sure you copied only the jar file not any other tar file or text files or xml files okay there is no other files other than dot jar click okay yes now finally you click okay here so now the errors will be get disappeared you can see here so the build path 
is setting up. So once this is done, so the Eclipse will come to know all the Hadoop libraries have been added to the build path. So the errors will be get resolved automatically. So if there is any others, if you see still, then you are missing some jars. Okay, now you can see all the errors have been gone. So these are some warnings. They are like unused imports. So warnings are always fine. So but there is no error, right? So what is the next step? We have to convert this code as a jar file, right? So right click your MapReduce project. There is an option export and then choose expand Java folder, choose jar file and then next. Okay, so here downloads. So let me change this to documents. Documents slash the jar name I'm giving it as my underscore jar dot jar. Okay, one more next. And in this window, you don't want to do anything. One more next and browse your main class. Just click browse. Okay, so here this is your main class, right? Sales info, finish. So already in documents, I have a jar file. I'm just overriding it. Yes, you can override. Okay, so the jar export is completed with some warnings because we had some warnings in the code, right? But that is fine. So let me show you in my documents folder. Okay, so you can see here my underscore jar dot jar. Okay, this is a jar file extension, right? So now the jar has been exported. Now you have to move this jar to your cluster with your Hadoop node, your Linux node, right? So now uh, my my mission is a remote mission. So what I'll do, it's an, it's an AWS mission. So I'll just connect to my WinSAP. So I'm using WinSAP tool. The WinSAP tool will use to move the file. It's a secure copy, right? So from your local to your remote mission. Okay, so I have to make a new connection now. So new connection, my IP has been changed. So new connection and the username is Ubuntu. And then this is a, I have to use a key file to connect. It's not a password. So it's an AWS mission. So it is a key file, but it is fine. If, if you are, your mission has a password, you can give a password and you can connect. So I have a private key. Private key is what a password in my AWS mission. So, okay. And then login. Okay, it is connecting to my remote machine. Or what you can do like you have a Linux machine separately, then you can copy your jar file in a pen drive and you can connect to that Linux machine if that has an access in your local machine, I'm telling. Okay, so now uh, I've connected. Now my jar file is here. The left hand side is a local, your local machine and you just do a drag drop to right hand side. So right hand side machine is my uh, I have to overwrite. Okay. Right hand side mission is my Hadoop cluster node. Okay. I'm just copying my jar file. So once the copy is completed, we can trigger the code. So before triggering the code, uh, you need that input file, right? So this input file in Eclipse we used is the 10 records input file, right? So the seven records. So this needs to be in HDFS because for MapReduce input is from HDFS only, right? So I have already uploaded this to HDFS. I will just show you my HDFS here. So where I have already uploaded the input file, so click browse file system or you can do an ls command. So this is my input.txt, it is there. So or what I will do, I will just show in my remote mission itself. So JPS, Hadoop demons are running. So Hadoop, so bin slash Hadoop, DFS, hyphen ls slash, space slash. So you will see input.txt. So let me do a cat. So remove ls, all these are like HDFS commands. It's not your local Linux command. Okay. So I'll ju I'm just doing a cat to show you that seven records is there. So if you want to upload, so let me show you this file in my local also. Okay. I'm just giving just ls and lstr. So you can see my input file is here. So how to upload this, change your directory to Hadoop and then bin slash Hadoop space DFS iPhone put command to upload your local file to HDFS. Now slash home you have to give the complete path slash home slash ubuntu slash input and then space slash input 
underscore hdfs something some name so this input underscore hdfs.txt is going to be your file name after uploading it to hdfs but this step i have already done i have uploaded my file input as input.txt in hdfs it is there input file is already there so now my jar copy to the linux system is also completed you can see in winsap it's it's moved completely so now let me clear my screen so this is my linux server so come out from hadoop and i will show you my jar file okay you can see this is my jar file okay latest it is the latest one so now change your directory back to hadoop 2.9.2 now i'll show you the command to trigger trigger the map reduce job bin slash hadoop space jar so for any hdfs commands it it will start with bin slash hadoop dfs but for map reduce it is bin slash hadoop jar and then your jar name okay so the path is home slash ubuntu slash my jar and then space slash your input for your map reduce job what is your input that input dot txt in hdfs not from local so input dot txt space slash you have to give an output directory for storing the map reduce output right the reducer output right so you have to give some name so what i'll do i'll give mr underscore out underscore one so this is this will be a folder this is not a text file this will be a folder and within this folder your output text file will be there i'll show you enter so now this will trigger a map reduce job so you can see the resource manager is connected to the resource manager so now the job is started with the job id you can see the job id here now i can show you the job tracker web ui or in hadoop one we call it as job tracker web ui in hadoop two you can call it as resource manager web ui or yarn web ui so here is my resource manager web ui where you can see all your running map reduce job okay map reduce job got completed okay let me go back to my terminal yes it is completed so the job is completed successfully so you can see the job information here so you can click this and you will see all the information whatever like how long it has been taken and all those stuff you can able to see here okay i'll just click this okay now you can see it is map ready job it is succeeded it took 16 seconds to complete and if you click this log file you will see the log file information okay let me see the output now okay just refresh so our output directory name is mr underscore out underscore one it got created okay let me go to terminal and let's do hadoop bin slash hadoop fs space ls slash mr underscore out underscore one okay now do an ls on top of this directory your map ready is output directory so you will be seeing two files one is underscore success meaning the job is successful and then next one is actually your output file so part f and r 0000 part full form partition r full form reducer because this is reducer output if it is a mapper only output means then you will see part f and m 000 okay so now let's do a cat on this file okay so bin slash hadoop dfs space hyphen cat enter so now you can able to see the data so amazon the total amount ebay the total amount flipkart the total amount so this is what our expected answer as well right so now we got the output so now the file uh, like whenever you run a map reduce program the output should be a directory and within the directory you will see the part if and r00 file so generally we can't able to change uh, means you can able to change the file name from part if and r to something else but no one will do it so some people will say it is not possible so it is possible but no one will do it okay so you can you can able to give the directory name only on your wish but internally the file structure for your map reduce output will be part if and r 0 0 0 so if you have two reducer means then in the same directory you will be seeing part if and r 0 0 0 0 then part if and r 0 0 0 1 okay so i in the code i told you how to change the reducer or how to increase or decrease the reducer right so this is how the map reduce program works and we have seen the end to end part of executing the code till executing the code and i i showed you the resource manager web ui as well fine and i want to show you some of the configuration which i told you before right so map red hyphen default dot xml so here i want to show you something so i told you like each task tracker or the node manager by default launches two task within a node it will launch two task i told you right if it is needed it will use both the task or 
the task tracker has only one task to process means it will still launch two tasks in parallel but only one will be uh, used and another one will be idle but by default it launches two so this is like within node parallelism we discussed before right so this is what the property is map reduce dot job dot map is two so you can increase so whenever the task tracker starts the map job by default whether the given number of block on that particular node is one block or two block or three block it launches two by default okay so you can increase this so that you can achieve more number of parallelism in a in each of the node okay so i just wanted to show you this so i've just showed fine so now we can move on to the next topic which is input split okay so just give me a second i will open a new notebook okay input split this is very important topic in general okay so first of all what is blocks in hdfs it's a physical unit of your file right so your big file is getting into small chunks called as blocks and why we need the concept of blocks so that when in 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 your hard disk when the data has been split into blocks means your read and write will be faster and that's why even in windows and linux also you have the concept of blocks right so now in hdfs my one block size equal to 64 mb okay imagine so now you have uh two blocks b0 and b1 okay now here map task so by default number of mapper is based on what i told you number of blocks is equal to number of map so if you have two blocks then you will be having two mappers and also i told this is default right that means you can able to change this and i said i will tell you this concept later and that concept name is input split that is number of blocks blocks equal to or it can be not equal to number of map task okay this is what the actual statement is okay so still so many people used to think that number of block equal to number of map always but it is not the case okay so now imagine first let's let's go with step by step let's go step by step so here you have two blocks so two mapper so mapper 1 mapper 2 so here let's go as block 1 block 2 so two mappers now so where the split comes into picture so between block and map task your split comes into picture so the split will be running inside your map reduce framework before map gets start the split concept will work so the split is logical logical block is physical it is physical so block is physical and split is logical unit of block here this is block is a physical one it's like physical two blocks but here it is logical so that means i'll i'll explain you more so now imagine so if you take a block so imagine i have a data 1 a b 2 comma c d 3 comma e f 4 comma g h phi comma i j imagine i am having uh, five records and this five records total size of this file is 128 mb just for example okay now how your blocks will get split so what people used to think okay up to this one block and the next two records is another block so this is 64 mb and this is 64 mb okay this is how the block will split but actually this won't split like this so it's 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 not always true right so a block will not be get exactly split at the last column it is not mandatory right so now imagine 1 a b 2 c d 3 e f 4 g h 5 i j okay now imagine your first 64 mb get completed here and your next 64 mb can get complete here also right so this is block 1 this is block 2 so this block 2 is in some seventh node and this block 1 is in third node now task tracker has to consider these two blocks and it has to run the map reduce job so this is how your blocks will be right it's not always the first case your block can be get splitted unevenly irrespective to the data right so now imagine a map task is trying to read the first block the first mapper is trying to read the first block so it will read 1 a 1 comma a comma b 2 comma c comma d 3 it will read first mapper will read only till 3 now imagine i have two nodes 
this node is third node and, and a task tracker is running. I'll use the word task tracker, which is very comfortable for me. So, but otherwise called this is node manager in Hadoop 2. Okay, but I'll just go with task tracker. So task tracker. So this is seventh node. So here one map task will be running and here one map task will be running. Okay, but here in seventh node, we have this B2 block in first node, we have B1. That is in the third node, we have B1. Here I have the data 1 comma A comma B. 2 comma c comma d and till till 3 only i'm having so if you take b2 e comma f it starts from e comma f there is one column of the data is missing on this particular row next 4 comma g h 5 comma i j now here this particular mapper when it comes to read the third record you may get some index out of bound exception or array out of bound exception but you won't get such exception because the task tracker has the intelligence to consider that the balance record of this particular row is in a different node and who will take care of that is the split split so split is logical like one block size is 64 mb means one split size is also 64 mb split is 64 MB. So this is physical, this is logical. So logically, the split will connect these two. So now that means this mapper will read 3 E and F from this particular node and it will read only this record, not the balance. But this is logical. Okay, physically, the record E and F is not moving from B2 to B1. It is in the seventh node only. So this seventh node mapper will start processing the record from 4 and 5 only. Okay, so this task tracker, so we call this as lookup. Okay, we call this as lookup. So this task tracker is doing a lookup on this particular block to read E and F. So, but nothing is moved from that block to this block. Okay, it is all logical. Now, imagine, so one block is 64, which is physical and split is logical grouping of the blocks. And that is also 64 MB by default and then mapper. So that means one block is equal to one split is equal to one mapper. Okay, now see block may or may not be equal to split, but split is always equal to mapper. Okay, so I repeat block may or may not be equal to split, but split is always equal to mapper. So that means you have two blocks means by default it is two split, so two mapper. So, but you have two blocks but the split can be changed to one so you will be having one mapper only so to increase and decrease the mapper count irrespective to the block count you have to adjust the split so that is why i have explained all this to you okay i repeat to increase or decrease the mapper count irrespective to the block count you have to adjust the size of split okay i will just show you the property so the property that you have to set in your MapReduce driver program is mapred dot max dot split dot size. So this is what the property. With this you can achieve it. So in the code you can actually add this in your driver program. I will show you where you have to add. So in the code, in the driver, yeah. So here you can add. So you can add in the driver you can add one more conf dot set and then you can add map red dot split max dot split dot size and you can give the split size okay what is the split size and what size i have to give okay for that i'll, I'll go with the new window one more time just give me a second i'll open a new notebook See, this input split is very important. Even in between you lost something or you couldn't get it. Please rewind the video and watch it one more time carefully. Okay. So now I'll tell you how to change the split size and what actually we are trying to achieve. So now imagine I have blocks. I have four blocks, each with 64 MB. B1, B2, B3, B4. Okay. Now you have mapper here and you have the split. Okay. Input split. Okay, IS, input split. Now imagine uh, you have to, you have four blocks. So by default, how many mappers you will get? Four mappers, right? Now imagine just a scenario I'm telling. Now the admin, your Hadoop admin says that you cannot run four task and all because we have less resource. So that try to reduce your mapper task. So this is what he's telling to you. 
but you are saying like number of blocks equal to number of mappers so four blocks means four mappers but now our admin is asking me to use two mappers instead of four so to do that we have to change the split size and that split size property is what i told you in the map reduce and conf dot set you can change this so now here it is 64 by default input split will be also 64 but you are changing this to a number that is 128 mb so when you do this what happened so two physical block logically will be get grouped into one split okay so b0 b2 will be one split and again b3 b4 will be logically grouped into one split so this is second split so you have two 128 splits and four 64 mb blocks so now i told you the rule right so blocks may not may or may not equal to split but split is always equal to mapper so how many splits you have two splits so how many mappers you will get it is two mappers right so here what we have done we have increased the split size to reduce the number of map task so i repeat we increased the split size to reduce the mapper task always the rule is when you want to reduce the mapper tasks you have to increase the split size now reverse what i'll do the same 32 mb now split sizes now admin says now admin says like you have so 32 mb split you have more resource you want to you have only four four mapper task you need you can have eight mapper task now admin says you can use eight mapper task but i have four blocks only b1 b2 b3 b4 now i've changed my split size to 32 MB that means one physical block will have two logical splits so split one split two and so on so split three split four split five split six and finally split seven split eight so you have eight splits that means how many mappers you will get block equal to or not equal to split but split is always equal to mapper right so m1 m2 m3 m4 m5 m6 m7 m8 so for four blocks you will have eight mappers so after executing this you can able to see in the job tracker that is the resource manager ui also total number of map tasks you can able to see so for that what all you need to do is you have to add this property conf dot set map red dot max dot split dot size comma 32 mb you have to give in bytes okay comma here you can so I'll, let me add it so conf dot set map reduce map reduce dot max dot split dot size comma double quotes here you have to sorry just a second here you have to give uh, 32 mb in bytes or 64 MB in bytes, 128 MB in bytes. You can do a MB to bytes conversion and you can add it here. So now after changing the, after entering the value here, you can jar, you can make a jar of this particular code and you can run it so that you can able to show them the difference and make sure like uh, you have, you are giving your input size, size, the file size, the input file for this MapReduce program is 128 MB or more than 64 MB. Then only you can able to see the difference because in our current example, the total number of block itself is one and that block again, it is less than 0.2 KB. Okay, so you cannot show the example of split size. So just create a file size like at least 128 MB complete file size should be 128 MB so that you can increase and decrease the split size and you can able to show the difference like blocks is two, but mapper task is four. You can able to show them fine. So one last thing I want to show you is speculative execution. Okay, so let me uh, just remove this. So let me erase all this. So speculative execution, uh, I, I, initially I said I will tell you this topic later, right? So this is the last topic of this particular video for MapReduce. So speculative execution. So this is very common, even in Spark and MapReduce, we have the concept of speculative execution. And even in some interviews, people are asking this. Now imagine uh, you have uh, the resource manager, which is uh, launching the task. Okay, let me go with job tracker again, job tracker, task tracker to make the concept very simple. So job tracker is launching task tracker. Okay. 
So it means it is assigning the task to the task tracker and task tracker launches the map task. Now, these two mapper are running at the same time. But imagine for some reason, this particular map task, which is running on the node one is taking time. It got stuck. It got stuck. But the second mapper is running fine and it got completed also. But it got stuck. So this first mapper got stuck. It is not failed or it is not like any issue, but it got stuck due to some reason of maybe the RAM issue or hardware issue, something, but there is no code issue. There is nothing with the uh, respect to the code. Maybe the data got skewed or, or, or you have some issues with the infrastructure. So this map job got stuck. So here it is running for B0 block. Here it is running for B1 block. Now, in that case, what the job tracker will do, it will search for the next copy of B0, which is in a different node. Okay. So, which is in a different node task tracker. Imagine this is first node, second node. Imagine this is third node. So, the same task which is running on B0 of the first copy will be reassigned. Means, it, it one more task on the B0, the same map task will be assigned. So the same map task will be assigned and this mapper will start running. So very important here. So this first mapper job on B0 is also running but got stuck. Due to the first job, the map task got stuck. It is try to launch the same map task on the second copy of B0 and here it is running. That means this is duplicate task. These two tasks are duplicates. This is duplicates. So now, now two task is running. One is stuck and that is why job tracker started a new task. Okay. Now, which task get completes will be considered by job tracker. But the very important thing in the speculative execution, duplicate task will be get launched, but the, the, the stuck task will not be get killed. So this is not get killed and all. It is also running and the new task which has been launched also running. Imagine after starting the new task, this get completed immediately means this will be killed the first task which got stuck right it will be killed or in reverse now here the new task which is launched after launched the new duplicate task on the second copy of b0 after launching the first uh, task which is running got completed means this will be killed this will be considered so this is what called speculative execution that means whenever the task got stuck it will start a same task in the second replica but both the tasks will be running the duplicate task but it will consider any one output which get completes first it will consider so since it is running duplicate task it won't kill each of the task or any one of the task it won't kill the job tracker will not kill it okay it will wait if anything any one of the task of the duplicates get complete it will consider that this is what spe speculative execution is okay so this is there in spark also this is there in map reduce also and people are asking this in interview you have to tell them and there is an option to turn off the speculative execution because due to some reason if the job got stuck imagine some 2000 tasks got stuck means it will again start 2000 duplicate task so parallelly to uh, task duplicates are running for the 2000 instead of 2000 tasks now 4000 tasks is running out of which 2000 is duplicate so sometime you will have some in problems with the resource when you have more number of duplicate tasks right so in some orgs they will disable the speculative execution but but it's again a debate whether we can enable or disable so this is what speculative execution is so that's all with the map reduce what is hive the introduction of hive and then the architecture of hive let's get into the topic so hive so before getting into hive like we need to see few more things we'll, we'll just start with that so with respect to hadoop uh, we have two components right when we say hadoop it's combination of hdfs and map reduce so that's that's what hadoop is right so hdfs is a place where your data will be get distributed and map reduce is a place where you write jobs the transformation jobs and then uh, using java and then MapReduce will do a distributed processing of your code by reading the data from hdfs okay so now imagine you have to write a join query so in MapReduce you can't write any sequels you need to write a java code imagine you are migrating your logics from some other uh, rdbms database uh, there is a join query you have to do which people have been doing in an oracle now you have to do the same in MapReduce. so then you have to write a java code like 10 to uh, 15 lines of code you have to write to achieve that single line sql join query here 
Now here comes the problem. So the SQL developer says like we are into Hadoop because MapReduce is really good. It is doing parallel processing and it is distributed parallel processing and the performance is really good. We like all those concepts, but the only problem for us, uh, it's, it's, it's always Java. So we need a SQL layer. It will be good instead of Java if we have SQL to communicate with MapReduce. And that's where this hive entered into picture. So if you see, HDFS is the first layer and then you will be having the MapReduce as a core engine for transformation for all doing ETLs, extract, transform and load. So now Hive is invented by Facebook and the and the language which you we use here is sql so what hive is actually hive technically hive is a query engine it's not a database very important in real time in projects in, in with your colleagues people people will always uh, call this hive as a database but technically speaking that is a query engine it's nothing wrong when you say hive is a database but since you are in a learning phase you should understand this okay hive is a purely a query engine it's not a database so here uh, hive is hive it, it's a query engine because hive doesn't has its own storage to store the data Hive again uses HDFS to store the data and that's the reason that is also one of the reason why we are uh, saying Hive is not a DB whereas if you go for Oracle or MySQL it has its own storage come query engine okay so here uh, Facebook invented this Hive and it is an open source it's available in Apache you can download and install it in your machine and you can work so the prerequisite to, uh, to get into Hive is you need to know HDFS basic of MapReduce and SQL queries when I say SQL queries no complex queries like uh, stored procedure or trigger some ki that kind of SQL knowledge is not required create update delete insert select sub queries and joins is wide enough for you to get into Hive these are all the prerequisite. Now Hive act as a vehicle which again runs on the engine MapReduce. That's very important to understand and that's why we call Hive as abstraction of MapReduce. We call Hive as abstraction of MapReduce. So Hive internally use MapReduce engine to process the query. So instead of Java, I'm going to communicate with SQL. So, I'm, uh, so I want to write a Java code. So just bypassing this with SQL via Hive. Okay, I've just replaced the Java part. It's not replacing the MapReduce. That's very important. People used to say like that. Uh, people used to say, I'm, I'm not using MapReduce. I'm using Hive. No, this, you have to correct the statement. You are using uh, uh, SQL via Hive and you are not using Java. That is what you have to say. So when you say that you are not using MapReduce, then I will think then instead of uh, MapReduce, you are using some other engine to uh, run Hive. That's how I will think. So that's a wrong thing. So you are using MapReduce, but you are using SQL. Uh, instead of Java or uh, via Hive. Uh, fine. So now what Hive will do, Hive like uh, it again reads the data from HDFS and then process it in Hive with the help of MapReduce and then the output can be stored again back to HDFS. Okay. Now we understood where exactly this Hive comes into picture and what is Hive and who developed it. Okay. This is what we have seen. Now uh, like we'll, we'll get more into uh, the, the Hive internals and uh, the architecture. So before getting into that, so we have uh, similar to MapReduce, we have one more uh, engine, right? Called Spark, right? So Spark is replacement of MapReduce. It's not replacement of the entire Hadoop. That's very important. I have saying this in many videos. I will still used to say that. So Spark just replaced the MapReduce, but not the whole Hadoop framework. So why I am telling this here, right? So how you can also run on Spark engine instead of uh, MapReduce. Okay, so uh, Hive is a vehicle. So you have MapReduce engine which uh, operates the vehicle. Now you remove MapReduce and you are changing your engine to Spark. So your same Hive vehicle will run more faster. So that is how it is. Okay. Now, so you can ask me another question. So that means uh, I, I don't want to go for Spark and MapReduce to write a code. You mean to say we can do everything in SQL itself. Okay. So you can't do everything in SQL. There will be some complex uh, uh, processing uh, transformations you have to do, which is not compatible with Hive. Then you have to go for Spark and writing programs or MapReduce to write a programs. But Hive is more matured in recent days. So you can do so many things in Hive itself, but still some things for uh, some extra performance and some extra optimization and some, some extra complex logics. If there is a key condition, then you have to go for directly to MapReduce and Spark to write in the programs instead of doing in uh, hive queries. Okay, fine. So now we get into the next level of understanding the hive internals. Okay, fine. So here, uh, how hive works when there is a request response happens. Now imagine I installed my hive. Okay, so whenever you install an hive, there will be a server running 
okay now you are sending an request so the request is through cli command line interface that means in your terminal if you run bin slash hive hive will be get started like this where you can run all your queries select star from etc okay cli command line interface okay so now the 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 request what i'm sending uh, via cli is create table test okay so the request goes to my hive server so now what hive server will do so uh, when i create a table so hive has a metadata okay what what that metadata has the metadata will have all the hive table information but not the data that's very important so metadata of hive will store all the table information table information means how many columns it has whether it has an index or not in the table so those kind of information so the hive metadata is different from the metadata what maintains in the name node okay they are different okay now where this hive metadata will get stored important point this is in most asked the question in interviews also and even for your self understanding this is very important hive will store the metadata in the rdbms database only that's very important so hive will store the metadata information in and rdbms it can be oracle or it can be db2 it can be mysql or any rdbms even if you see there is an installation video of hive it's there in my playlist link you can find below i have uh, shown you the installation of hive with mysql so where hive use mysql to store the metadata and very important thing hive uh, so this hive uses this rdbms to store only the metadata but not the data that you insert that is very important the data that you insert will store only in hdfs so the only reason we use rdbms here is to store the metadata information of hive very important to understand because when people used to think when they learn it in the beginning stage they think that metadata is where like hive data also will get stored no it won't if you see in oracle and mysql and all the metadata also will be get stored inside oracle inside mysql itself but in hive alone like they are uh, decoupling that metadata part the metadata will be get stored in a different uh, place that is rdbms okay now you created the table now again through cli i am sending in another request to insert insert into table test so now i am inserting a data or you can use a load data so load data command is to load the data in bulk as a file to a table insert means one by one so now this request comes what hive will do it will get the metadata information like this table test and how many columns it has and all those information and based on that schema information hive will store the data as a table in your hdfs okay so again the data will get stored in hdfs only okay with the with the with the, all those row column matchings with schema will happen that's how you will maintain as a metadata in rdbms but data gets stored in hdfs now i am sending a select query to read this inserted data so select star from test now what happens right so this particular query so it goes to hive server first the first this query uh, first after getting this query as a request what hive will do it will first query the metadata information and then it will get the data from hdfs and then it will show you in a row so i will show you in a row column view so this is what happens when you do a uh, re request as so a create request insert request and select request this is what happened so whenever you send a request for select i will query the metadata the table information and with that the data what you have inserted it will match and it will show you as a table so this is what happens every time okay so rdbms is uh, why they are storing metadata in rdbms is a design that's how it gets stored because they don't want to uh, um, have it within the hive itself uh, they decoupled the metadata storage part outside the world of hive okay so now i'm going to tell you one more thing now imagine i'm not installing rdbms in hive i means while installing hive you should install rdbms also so that's when you will store your metadata in a different uh, uh, database right now there is a case like imagine you don't want to install rdbms just go to apache hive site uh, and download the hive and you don't want to install rdbms just install hive only in that case how the metadata will be get stored so that is a question here so what i said to you you don't want to install rdbms just install hive only is enough so in that case where the metadata will store i will tell you that so you install hive only okay i will just go here so whenever you download hive right you installed hive so when there is no separate rdbms available in your 
in your installation in your machine then what hive will do hive itself will have an embedded rdbms called derby derby is an embedded it internally have have a, its own rdbms to store the metadata information of hive we call that so this will come along with your download and install itself you don't want to do anything special here so we call this as embedded embed forgive me for my spelling mistake so embedded meta store that means hive itself will have an rdbms called derby that is very important it has derby which you can't change so it itself has a database derby in which your metadata will be get stored so that you don't want to have a separate rdbms to store the metadata so we call this as embedded meta store mechanism and we call this as remote meta store remote meta store these are important for your understanding as well as this will be asked in your interview so now you will get a question in your mind so in that case why should i have to go for this remote meta store hive itself has a derby to store the metadata right it internally has its own rdbms to store the metadata then we can go ahead with this itself right in the real time in real time people will not use embedded meta store they will go for remote meta store that means they will use a separate instance to store the metadata i will tell you the difference I will tell you the drawback of embedded meta store. Now imagine you have cluster, you have four nodes. Hadoop has installed, so this is four node Hadoop cluster. Now you install Hive in all these nodes. Okay, you download and install Hive in all these nodes, and you are not using remote meta store. You are trying to use the embedded meta store that comes with Hive itself, or DBMS that comes with Hive itself. And that means there will be a Derby database here, 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 here. Each machine will have its own Derby because in each machine you are installing Hive, right? So for every Hive installation, the embedded database will come along with it. Now imagine, now you are sending and create table request, and the request uh, goes to randomly to one node. Okay, it goes to third node. Create test table test. Okay, table test. Now, what after receiving the request, what this hive will do? This hive will store the test. So this table's metadata information in its own Derby database, which is an embedded one. Okay. So now there is an another request that you are sending for insert insert into test. So that request goes to uh, first node. Okay. Now, after receiving this request, what I will do, it will check whether this test table available in the meta store of Derby in first mission's hive. So, this test table metadata gets stored in third mission's Derby, right? But your insert request goes to first node means it will say table not found. Now you understood the problem of uh, why we are not having embedded in the real time. So each node hive will have its own metadata. So you can't do a, a distributed request. So there should be in one place where all the metadata should store there. So all these four hives should refer that. And that is where we are going for remote meta store. We are not going for embedded meta store. So now you in, in, in the same cluster, you can install like one more node MySQL. So where you can configure. So there is a configuration file in your hive where you can say like use remote meta store, not embedded. This is what I've showed in my hive installation video. You can refer that there is a configuration file. <coughs> So, uh, so in all these hive configuration file, I will say use this MySQL node, the fifth node. So now the embedded Derby will remove automatically. So when there is a remote uh, database there, it will not use the Derby. Now when you send a create table request to third node of hive, this hive will store the metadata of test table here. Here the metadata will be get stored. Now you are sending an interest, uh, sorry, insert request to first hive node. Now, now again hive will search for the test table whether present or not here. So it is commonly accessed by all nodes. So now test table metadata is already stored, right? So now your table will be successfully stored. Now again you can run a select query. The select star from test uh, request goes to fourth node. Again this hive will refer this common metadata and this hive will show you the table. So this is why we are not going for embedded. We are going for remote. So what is the use of embedded Derby then? So in a single node machine, you are you just need to install Hive just for practice purpose. You can go with embedded. You don't want to sit and install separately a, a RDBMS to store the metadata. Just in a single node, it's not required, but it's recommended. Even in single node, it is recommended so that you will come to know what it is actually. So that is why I added the, the MySQL part as a remote meta store part in my Hive installation video. You can refer that. And this is 
is what hive architecture is all about the internals are all about so here uh, only with the cli you can connect or we have any other mode of communication to connect with hive you can do jdbc connection also okay so jdbc connection is something you write a program to connect with hive you are building a web ui to connect with hive then we need to go for jdbc so jdbc is also possible again the request response will happen in the same order the same way how i explained it to you okay so the so hive end of day hive runs with three engines so by default hive runs on map reduce engine there is another engine called taste and there is one more called spark so you can run hive on top of these three engines end of day your data will be get stored in a distributed file system like hdfs and even the in amazon there is a object stored called s3 that is also similar to hdfs so even hive can be used with s3 also okay so not only hdfs it can be used with s3 so if you are not aware of s3 don't worry you don't want to uh, uh, get confused for now so hdfs is a where place hive will store the data metadata will be get stored in an rdbms okay either embedded or remote rdbms that's it how to install hive uh, uh, on top of hadoop okay so uh, let's get into the uh, session so the prerequisite you need to have hadoop setup before you install hive because for hive hadoop is mandatory so you have to install hadoop so so with the very first thing you have to uh, start is you have to start your hadoop before uh, starting the installation process of hive uh, you have to start the process so i just start my hadoop i mean it's already running but i'm just uh, doing it as a process so uh, okay so here uh, my hadoop is already running so i'll just give jps uh, and see let's see like whether all demons are running yeah, all five demons are running the next step is you have to uh, set your hadoop home in the bash rc file so because when you start uh, hive hive will uh, check for the hadoop where where the hadoop is installed so it will check with the os so the os will check the bash rc file to return the path to hive the hadoop path to hive so os will check the bash rc file so make sure you have the environmental path and variable ready for hadoop in bash rc file so it's there here just add this line so you will be having already java uh, because you are insta you installed hadoop already and that means you will be having java home already in your bash rc for sure now all you need to add is hadoop home and once you added it add this hadoop home in your path as well so this java home slash bin colon dollar hadoop home slash bin then dollar path that's all and then you can add an echo statement if you are uh, okay you can add uh, i've just added it because whenever i execute this bash rc file i just need to make sure whether it got executed or not so that like the print statement will be uh, displayed in my uh, as output when i execute this file so i'll just save this so after saving this you have to execute don't forget that so just execute this file okay it got executed i have the echo statement so i got this welcome for you if you don't have the echo statement you will not see this message yeah you will be getting an empty uh, uh, thing so that means uh, like it got executed well okay now change your directory to apache hive uh, maybe we can use the gui uh, for the better understanding so you can install apache hive uh, just type apache hive download you will be seeing the archive archival all the old versions will be archived uh, here so just click this so you can go ahead with any version greater than or equal to 2 uh, we have version 0 version 1 2 and 3 0 and 1 are outdated so 2 and 3 uh, like they are kind of in in the uh, real time as of now so you can go for any version of 2 or 3 is up to you but the installation process will be same okay so for 1 and 2 the version high 1 and 2 the installation process is different compared to uh, means a slight difference there compared to 2 in 1 we have only less steps to configure the hive actually but here we have to three more extra additional steps to do so you can download and then uh, uh, here i am going to exp i am going to do this installation uh, of hive with uh, centralized metastore so hive comes with its own metastore db called embedded db called derby for storing metastore so what is metastore so in hive uh, whenever you create some table in hive the information the metadata of table okay uh, the metadata of table not data okay, i repeat whenever you create a table in hive the metadata of the table will be get stored in rdbms that's how hive has been designed okay so to do that you can hive itself uh, it comes with the package hive itself has its own embedded derby database 
okay so you can so what internally how you will do it will store all the metadata information of the table in the derby database but the problem is derby database is embedded and it's not centralized so when you install it in a cluster as a distributed manner so if you still use embedded db uh, derby uh, for meta store what will happen i will tell you i'm having two hive mission so in this two hive i'm uh, I'm, I'm just uh, i mean since i have two mission in which i'm installing hive with embedded derby that means each hive will have its own uh, derby database to store metadata and that means whenever i create a table from my first hive mission i cannot access it from my second hive mission the reason is they have each mission has their own meta store uh, metadata information right it has to be centralized so when whatever i create in first node the entire metadata of the table should be somewhere in the centralized mission so that my second or third hive mission can access it whenever i query it from second or third mission okay so even if it is single node don't go with embedded database please go with uh, 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 non embedded centralized database to store this meta store okay so uh, today i am going to show you how to install mysql and how to store the meta store of hive in mysql that is how the installation process will be okay so for that uh, you need to install mysql <clears throat> so the command is sudo apt hyphen get install mysql iphen server so when you install when you run this command uh, you will be getting a prompt and it will ask you to enter the username just please go with root or oot as your username and all small case and again you will be getting an another prompt asking for password you can repeat the same root small case you can go with your own username and password but this is global so that you will not forget that's that's the reason i'm just recommending the root uh, for me the mysql is already installed so once again with mysql with this command mysql iphen u root and i and p so p for password u for username just enter now you have to give your password so which is root enter so now it's in mysql right so i will give show databases okay so uh, I, I i i'm just showing you because i want to tell you one more thing okay i'll tell you in some time so now uh, coming back to hive so now hive uh, it has to connect mysql for storing the meta store other than that there is no relationship between hive and mysql all your hive queries will be running on top of your mapreduce or spark or tace engine not on top of mysql or oracle because sometimes people used to ask me uh, because since we are configuring mysql for meta store storage uh, will hive queries will run on mysql they will ask like this so it's there is no other relationship between mysql and oracle other than storing hives meta store in rdbms that's all okay so now uh, to do that uh, to enable the connectivity between hive and uh, mysql uh, for storing this meta store you need to have the mysql connector jar in the lib folder of hive okay so for that you can download <coughs> hive mysql uh, sorry mysql connector jar just go to google type mysql connector jar maven you will be getting this site and just click this so here you will be having these many versions of uh, mysql connector just click any one version and then the jar this one if you click this the jar will be downloaded it will be get downloaded so now take the jar file go to your hive folder and there is a folder called lib just open this and you can paste your mysql connector jar here so i can show you my mysql connector jar just control f mysql yeah you can able to see here right so this is my connector jar what i have pasted okay next step so go to con folder and uh, you will be seeing hive iphone site template.xml just rename it to hive site.xml just rename it so in hive iphone site.xml you have to uh, give all these properties so that hive will connect with uh, mysql for meta store so here the very first line is i am just giving all the mysql information and then i am asking uh, the this particular property to create a database called meta store uh, if the tape if the database is already exists then fine or else it has to create this database so now if i if, if you see uh, i i don't see any meta store db here right so it will be get created at the end when we uh, when we do the installation process the meta store db will be get created the next i have to give the package name of mysql connector jar file so this package the the 
package name will be differed uh, it differs for db to db if you use oracle for metastore storage then it's different mysql or derby anything it, it is different so you have to change it and then the username and password for your mysql db the last property is optional now just save this file now we are in the last step so uh, uh, like what hive will do when when you when you start uh, like uh, in hive when you start the hive for the first time hive will create a database in uh, the metastore db in mysql and within that metastore db hive will create around uh, some 50 to 57 tables so this 57 tables in metastore db in mysql is, is where your uh, uh, metadata table metadata tables so whenever you create a table in hive the information of the table will be get stored under this metastore db across these 57 tables in mysql okay so uh, what hive will do so there is a command uh, where uh, when you trigger it hive will create all the needed tables and databases in mysql so there is a command so the command is i will just change the directory to hive and then bin slash schema tool there is a command called schema tool and hyphen db type and which db you are going to use for metastore is mysql hyphen init schema so when you when you run this command hive will uh, create all the needed uh, database and then the tables in mysql okay so i'll just enter this so now hive started creating all the needed tables and then uh, the uh, databases in mysql it is done so now if i give show database here see the metastore database got created i change my directory to metastore now show tables you can see there is 57 tables so whenever you create some table in hive the information of the table not the data very important the information schema information the table information will be get stored across all these tables so for example if you have partition in your table so that partition information will be get stored here and all your table information like who created when created what is the table name that information will be stored here okay so it, it the rdbms will holds only the metadata information now uh, when i am not using embedded derby right the advantage is now the now i am using a centralized mysql db so in all the nodes in hive in hive-site.xml i will refer to that mysql machine so that all your hive will access the common centralized metastore so that you can create table in one machine you can access it from my some other uh, uh, from some other hive machine it is possible okay so now we are we are at the end and you can see here when i execute when i trigger this command uh, there is a sql file which is getting executed so in this sql file only uh, all these create table syntax are there for mysql so when you trigger it so this will run in your mysql only not in your hive so this is available uh, inside your apache hive folder only in apache hive there is something called scripts under scripts uh, there will be a folder metastore and then upgrade so you have you can able to configure these five uh, rdbms for your metastore as a centralized one okay so here we are using mysql so you can able to see so see you can see this is the file so this file holds all the creatable syntax for your metadata and this will be get executed in mysql now we can start our hive bin slash hive so once you started uh, you can just check whether hive is working or not with some normal commands show database or you can create a table is also fine so you 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 should not see any errors okay so just uh, yeah it's in hive now uh, like i will just maximize this show databases So it is loading the MySQL driver. Yeah, so there is no database. By default, Hive will have a database name called default and uh, you can able to see that here. So Hive installation is complete. So first thing, you have to set Hadoop home in bash RC. Then you need to install MySQL and you have to start Hadoop and then you need to download the connector jar and place it in the lib folder. Then you have to uh, modify the hive-site.xml and hive-site.xml, I, I have given the link in the description box where you can download it. And then you have to uh, initialize that schema tool 
okay and then uh, finally you can log into hive the basic commands in hive like create table insert load and uh, uh, describe drop etc so as i told you in uh, uh, in all the videos like first uh, to start with hive you need to start your hadoop services okay and then only you can able to work with hadoop so you can start your hadoop services with the command sbin slash start hyphen all dot sh so now in my machine the services is already running so i'll just show you jps okay now change your directory to uh, hive and then you can just give bin slash hive so if you give this it will enter into hive shell so you can uh, see here so it's I'm, I'm already in the hive shell okay now uh, what we are going to do is like first we can uh, uh, execute the very first command show database so uh, before that sql uh, 92 is the base language that is used by hive hive is a query engine and it is not a database that's very important to note and uh, uh, if you are from an rdbms side that means you are aware of sql basic sql is wide enough for you to work with hive okay and sql flavor uh, mostly it will be related with mysql if you already worked in mysql the hive queries will be similar to mysql queries only because an oracle and mysql if you see oracle will be different but still yep, yep, yep sql basics is wide enough whether you you were been working in oracle sql or you've been working in mysql sql or sql server management anything is fine basic sql knowledge is wide enough for you to enter into this okay the very first thing uh, let me do show databases it's databases okay it's not database databases so we have the database test and default so default is a database that you will see by default only it is created by hive not by us now there is one more database called test which i have created so now i'm going to drop the database drop database test okay so now i'm gonna create a database so create database test enter so now the database got created so if you want to select this database you have to give use test so that means you are selecting this database and then uh, to list all the tables you you can give like show tables so this is to just list all the tables you can do this now in this i am going to create a table called emp okay so create table test.emp so i am giving database name dot table name so it's so since we selected the table by giving use test so even though you are doing that uh, still always i'll recommend to add database name in front of table name everywhere okay so in hive you can also able to uh, uh, run a hql file that means you write all the queries in one file and save the file and you can trigger that file in hive so that is also possible so during that time if you forget to give the database name then the table creation or whatever you are doing it will it will search for the default database only it will search inside default database so it's very important safe and side always you can start with database name dot table name or if you are writing an hive script file the hql we used to call it as hql file hive query language is called hql okay so in oracle and mysql we used to write sql files right dot sql file like that here we have to do dot hql for example you i am writing all these commands in a file and i save it as like test dot hql and i can run that hql file so how to run a hql file all these things we can see it in the upcoming video so in this video let we will make the video so simple fine so if you are writing an hql script in the very beginning you can give use database name that is if you are giving that like that then fine you don't want to give database name in front of each uh, i mean in front of the table name everywhere in your file it's not required but sometimes if you miss that in the very first line then obviously it will search for the default database and sometimes it will say table not found or uh, insert is failed because the table not found because it will search for search in, it will search the tables inside the default database so it's always better to give the first line use database name in your script or go with giving database name in front of the table name everywhere in your script and that is recommended too okay fine so now i am going to create a table and if you see uh, this uh, four lines of create table syntax is very familiar for you create table table name serial number username city and i am giving the data type int string so here there is no need of giving the uh, values for the data types like var care 20 var care 30 something like that it's not required for you to give here just string and int is wide enough okay and uh, this will be familiar for you but if you see here the last line something i have given right so row format delimited field terminated by comma 
and line terminated by slash n which is new line and stored as text file okay so i will tell you what is stored as text file so hive supports various storage formats like orc rc park and these are some file formats in which uh, we are storing the data that is the data format so text file is the plain vanilla format okay so list of storage formats as a separate video i will make so in that we can discuss now here i am giving stored as text file i am asking the table to store the file as a text file only and i will show you my input data uh, which i am going to load it for the table so if you see all these are uh, the lines are uh, separated by new line and the values are separated by comma okay so that is the reason here i am saying row format delimited terminated by comma now imagine if you are not giving this last line your table creation will be successful but when you try to load a file into the table you will see only null values okay so so you can ask me a question then when i can use i mean when when i i don't want to use this okay so this line is not required okay when you are trying to do an insert query okay there is two ways to load the file one is load data you can use a syntax called load data and you can load the file and there is one more syntax called insert into which is like you can insert record by record so when you are inserting a record from spark or you are inserting a record from scoop so it is an insert it is not load it will the insert will happen okay so in that case this delimiters are not required okay so hive itself will take care of storing the data when it comes via insert but when you are doing a load a file you want to load then you need to mention the delimiters what you have used in that okay now so we can create this table okay so now the table is created so i'll just give show tables okay so there is a table emb fine so now the next thing is load data local input load data input so there is two load commands okay one is load data local input load data input so load data local input means you you are reading a file from your local file system that is your linux not your hdfs your local file system and you are loading it to your hive table that is load data local input when you are doing load data input the second command so it's not from local so you already have a file in hdfs and then you are loading that file to hive table from local file system to hive load data local input from hdfs to hive it is load data input that's it so i will show you now so first i will go with load data local input and in my local i have this file you can see here so user data dot txt and if i go for the properties you can see home slash test slash user data dot txt so i am giving the same path here home slash test slash user data dot txt okay let's load load it here so loading has been started so once it is get loaded let's do select star from emp okay so you can able to see the data now if you see here when i trigger the load command there is there was no map ready job by default uh, so you might have aware that hive is running on map reduce engine okay and it can run on two more engines called taze and spark but that we have to configure so by default any queries that you run you might have heard that it will trigger a map reduce job but if you see here i triggered a load command there is no map reduce job because when you trigger insert command map reduce job will trigger but when you do a load there won't be any map reduce job process it is a simple load that's it and there is one more thing you, you you might have noticed when i give select star from table name there was no map reduce job running right because when you use only aggregation functions in your query map reduce job will get trigger okay i will show you that example also in the same video fine so now let's go for load data in path okay what does mean by load data in path i said from hdfs to hive so that means first you need to have the data in hdfs so what we'll do for that so i load the data to hdfs first so it's in my local so let's go with hadoop command hadoop fs iphone put then i have to give my source path test which is local okay this is local actually so user data dot txt space slash user underscore data dot txt so this is I'm, I'm just loading my data from local to hdfs first okay now this is getting loaded to hdfs now from here from hdfs we are going to load the data to hive that is the next step so if you if you see here then second command the local keyword is missing so when you give a local keyword then automatically whatever the path you have given here will be considered as local path only but there is no keyword local means automatically hive will consider the path as hdfs path so here this is hdfs path 
okay so copy this command and let's see the uh, the copy from local to hdfs completed yes now it is completed let's make sure the data is uploaded to hdfs by giving ls command slash because slash is the path to which i have loaded my user data dot txt let's check that okay so if you see here user underscore data dot txt fine so and here it's user i will add e here fine now just copy this okay go to your hive shell enter so there is one more load we are we are triggered here so now like you will be having 20 records like 1 to 10 and then 1 to 10 so two times we have loaded now how these loaded files will be get stored in hive in in how it will be get stored in hive under because whatever you load inside hive end of day it gets stored where in hdfs okay by default all your hive tables will be get stored in hdfs in a default path called user slash hive slash warehouse okay so in H this is an interview question by default all your hive tables will be get stored in this path only user hive warehouse i will show you if you see here you can see all my tables are getting uh, displayed here in which you can see there is a line uh, user hive warehouse test dot db that is we created a database right so that is what it is showing here so wait, let me do an ls here okay and the ls what i'm so the ls whatever i'm showing here is not linux ls so that is very important because most of the time people used to ask me uh, whatever the file that you are showing here is a linux file no it is hdfs file i'm not showing my local files i'm giving hadoop fs ls it's not just ls okay so ls so now we are just doing ls for our test.db so test is uh, nothing but our database so within that we will have a table called emp so that emp will be stored as a directory only you can see here now slash emp enter so now inside emp we have loaded a file right two files we have loaded so it will be like two files let's wait for the ls if you see here First, I have done a load data in path and second, I have done load data local in path and you can see there is two files. Now, we just used load command to load the data and I am showing the file structure internally how it is get stored in HDFS. For Hive table, I am showing it in HDFS. Now, there may be one question that should come in your mind or else I will tell you what is that question is. So, without using load command, uh, can I use normal copy command and load the data under this EMP directory? Will that add the data to my Hive table? Yes, of course it will do. Okay, if you didn't get my question, I will I will do it practically here. See, we have done a load command, right? And then the files got loaded under this emp slash user. Now, without using the load command, can I manually, like this Hadoop fs hyphen put, then your local file, home test slash user dot txt, and I am loading this file directly to this hive table directory by using hdfs command not via hive so is that possible so that is what my question so it's it's already the name is there so I will give one dot uh, txt okay this is also possible so you create a table first in hive and without doing a load command without executing the load command you can even do it via hdfs commands you can just place the file under your table name directory in hdfs and that way also you can load the data so now the file got uh, inserted into this path let's let's do that so i'm just uh, doing ls for my emp table you now you can see three files that means now i can see 30 records in my hive table see three files right so let's let's double check with the hive so let me do a select star from once again select star from table i'm triggering it once again and you can see three set of files got loaded yes without load command also you can manually place the file to the table name directory also will it also will work okay now what is the next thing so next thing i'm going to show insert command so i'm going to show only the insert but update and delete it will work with as table so as table is a separate topic i will cover in my upcoming videos so let's try only doing this insert so this insert is similar to normal uh, insert only there is nothing different so as i told you when you trigger insert your map job will get triggered now see map job 
started but for load there won't be any MapReduce job but for insert MapReduce job will get started and um, and whenever it comes via spark or whenever it comes via scoop also internally the the map reduce will get started okay so when it loaded via spark uh, i will use spark uh, job only but when i'm saying via scoop or your trigger and insert command then internally it is going to use map reduce engine only and that is why you are getting map reduce uh, logs here okay so what i'm i'm loading here is uh, like 1g chennai okay let's see once the load get complete let's see that okay so if you see here the data got loaded select star from emp now there will be one more extra record yes you can see it's a first record okay now what is the next command so it's like a describe table so which will just show you the table name uh, table details like data types and uh, so it is just showing the data uh, column names and then the data types so there is one more describe command called describe extended uh, table name so this will show you the complete details of the table whether it is it is partitioned or it, whether it is bucketed and what path it gets stored and like like whether it's a managed table or uh, uh, external table so if all the details and what file format you use so everything you can able to see here so here i just wanted to tell you uh, as i told you already so by default it will get stored under this user high virus but you can able to change the location of the table that is possible that we can see it in the next video uh, internal and external table there will be a video topic in which i will cover uh, how to specify the location custom location in which you want to store your table so in, instead of user why have high varus you are trying to store the table in a different hdfs path it's possible by giving a location while creating a table and i will i will explain you those stuff in the upcoming video fine so this will give you the detailed explanation about your table like whether it is partitioned or buckets everything you can see here that's it fine so now uh, let me uh, show you there is one more show functions this is important so in this you can see all the predefined functions in hive like min function max function uh, sum function so you can see so many functions over here so and the functions which is not here and you want to do something which is not here for example you want to convert all your column values to upper case and that upper function is not here then you can write it on your own we call it as udf and udaf user defined function and user defined aggregation function that again I will, I will show you in the upcoming videos fine so and finally uh, i will show you one select query with var condition okay uh, and uh, for for this query also you will not see any map reduce job because select star from table name just select star will not trigger any map reduce job for example i am going to trigger count star so this is an aggregation function right so for this uh, you will be seeing map reduce job gets trigger yes it got triggered so this sometimes in interview people will ask you select star from table name in hive will trigger a map reduce job or not it won't okay so what kind of queries will trigger a map reduce job any aggregation query joins or count or some min max any analytical query anything any aggregation queries you trigger or joins you trigger map reduce job will get started so now you can see map reduce job get started but internal and external table in hive so uh, this is one of the most frequently asked interview question if you go for any interview people used to ask you this as a default question so that we do have a lot of default questions in interview when you go for big data interview one important question is what is the difference between internal and external table in hive and when we need to use it that's it so now we're going to discuss about that so i have two table syntax here if you see the very first table i have named it as internal table that is just for our understanding purpose only and if you see there is no syntax change it's a normal create table syntax with column location and then storage format that's it and if you see the second syntax this is for external table and the table name is external table again this is for understanding but if you see there is a slight uh, new keyword that i have added after the create statement so create and then external is a keyword and then you have to give table table name so this is what an external table syntax now instead of giving you a theoretical explanation let me first show you the demo and then i will explain you what is the need of these two tables okay fine so let me create this internal table first okay so the internal table is created now after this let me go to hdfs and show you the table location 
because hive uses hdfs as location right so all your hive table by default gets stores under user hive arrows i'm just doing hadoop fsls that's it now you will be seeing a directory called internal underscore table you can able to see right so i do have so many tables i'm just highlighting it you can able to see all right fine so now what i'm gonna do i'm going to create external table okay external table is also created now again i'm gonna do hadoop fsls so now you can see two directories internal underscore table and external underscore table in hdfs okay so you can able to see i'm just highlighting it yeah internal table and external table so next what i'm gonna do is i'm going back to hive okay so what i'm do uh, what i'm gonna do is i'm going to do drop i'm going to drop okay i'm going to drop the table drop table internal underscore table now internal table is dropped so what 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 happens when we do a drop table will be get dropped the data inside the table will be also get dropped now back to hdfs i'm going to do an hadoop fsls for you once again so now you will not see a directory internal underscore table so you will not see that because the table has been dropped yeah there is no such table only you can see external underscore table right now i'm going to drop the external table external underscore table now now you have dropped the external underscore table now what happens so what is the what is the thing with respect to hdfs let me see how do fsls now you will still see the directory external underscore table that is the difference between internal and external table see you still have it so if you create an internal table and you start loading the data and when you drop the internal table the data will be also get dropped from hdfs and then hive table structure will also be get dropped so in my very first hive video introduction and architecture of hive video you can find the previous video from the description box there is a playlist called big data course in which you can see all the uh, videos of big data in order okay fine so so in in the architecture video or generally where hive will store the metadata it will store its metadata as a meta store db in any rdbms right hive stores its metadata in rdbms now when you do a drop table drop internal table what happens hive will delete the structure of table from its metadata and also it will delete all the data from the hdfs nothing everything wash out but what happens when you drop the external table so when you in, in hive when you drop the external table the table will be get dropped uh, the structure will be get dropped but not the data okay so the structure will be get dropped from hive meta store but the data will still there so that is the difference between internal and external table so now i will tell you when to use these internal and external table fine so you all aware that we have the concept of acid in hive right so when it comes to acid table creation so acid table must be an internal table only you cannot make a table as a transactional table or an acid table when the table is external you can't do so an acid table you can do only when the table is internal okay if i am not having acid table in that case when should i have to use internal and external i will tell you so i recommend you if if if, if your table is not an acid then then leave it so if you you, you have to always i i'll recommend you to use only external table in the real time even though it's a normal table or or uh, with respect to acid table so acid table should be in internal only you cannot use external but as you as i as i said already your use case is not acid leave it so i i recommend you to go for always external table because mistakenly when you drop something in your uh, uh, in your production server when you have access or even in your dev server your table is also got dropped your data is also got dropped so that is one advantage of having external table and the second thing is see now this is a common hdfs path where we will get the input from the source team imagine i am telling you the use case now this particular data has been referred by hive referred by pig referred by spark now if this particular path was coupled with your hive table as an internal table what happens when you do a drop the hdfs data is also gone so that means the spark team and pig team who is using this hdfs data is also gone right so if it is an external table then this particular path can be used by so much that so many other technologies okay and one more thing now i have dropped the table and still i have the data here how can i have this data in my hive back so that means nothing just copy this ddl create in your hive with the same path so that you can still query your data 
you can still able to get the data in Hive because it's from the Hive we don't have the table structure so we couldn't query the data but it is still there in HDFS. You recreate the table with the same path then you can able to query the data. So this is what the use case need and everything. So when if we go for an interview please explain all these things to your interviewer and also tell them the use case and I recommend external table. If it is as it no other go it should be an internal table. So when you when you do drop for internal tables please be very careful. Partition in Hive. So here uh, partition is very important concept in any databases you go and query engines like Hive. Okay, so partition is important topic which comes under performance optimization. You will not see a table without partition in real time. Okay, in, in, in the real projects you will not see a table without partition. Every table will be with partition only. So before getting into partition I will in a layman term I will try to explain what actually the partition is doing. So if you take in your laptop you have partitions right. You used to do a partition for your hard disk like uh, C colon D colon E drive F drive. So you will you, you are doing a partition C drive D drive E drive and why you are doing that because I will place all my personal folders in D, uh, D drive and I will place all my work related profiles in E drive. So whenever I want to search I, I will come to know okay D drive is where my personal folder is I will directly open that folder and I will fetch movies or songs whatever it is. But imagine you have only one drive and within one folder you placed all the files and it will take time for you to search. Yes, that is what the partition is also. You are partitioning the data so that whenever you do some queries, you write some queries, so easily it will fetch the data only from that partition instead of reading the full table. Okay, so I, I will show you in the diagrammatic representation. So I have a table which has three columns, serial number, name and then city. Okay, so here serial number one and the name is Gautam and city is Chennai so I'm going to use the city names belongs to India okay so this is a city actually Chennai now imagine you you are writing all these records like you get 1 million records to the table you are just writing everything to a single box imagine this is a box to which you are writing everything to one box where you will get like first record second record third fourth etc so you have Chennai record and Delhi record and then again you have uh, Mumbai and Chennai something like that you have some records like this so now imagine I'm, I'm going to do a query here select star from uh, table where city equal to Chennai okay city equal to Chennai now what happens uh, my query goes here it will try to read record from first record so first record yes Chennai is there then it will read the second record no it's not Chennai third record no it's not Chennai fourth record yes it is Chennai now if you see this query have to read only Chennai record but still it is reading two more records which is not belongs to this condition but even though it's not belongs to the condition it still reads it that means Without a partition, whenever you do some read or join, some queries you are performing, some transmission, it will do a full scan. That is a full table read record by record. So if you do the same in real time, without partition, you are doing a join on a table, then it will take, even you wait for two to three days, it won't complete. It will still running because it is doing a full scan. That is the need of partition. Now imagine I am creating partitions here. One partition for Chennai, one partition for Delhi, one partition for Mumbai, one partition for some other uh, places. Okay, so Calcutta, something like this. Now when I insert a data, if it is a Chennai record, I insert all the records, Chennai records to Chennai partition. If it is belongs to Mumbai, I will insert all the records to Mumbai. Now when I run a query, this query will hit this partition only. It will ignore these three partitions. So it, it, it will not read these three partition at all. So that means you are having the partition pruning is happening. It reads only the requested or needed partition and it will ignore the remaining so that your time will get reduced a lot and your performance will get increased. Now you have two types of partitions in Hive. One is called static partition. One is dynamic partition. So in static partition, while inserting a record, you have to say this record should get stored in which partition. You have to say the partition name. For example, I have to say partition, place this in Chennai partition, place this in Mumbai partition. I have to say. But if it is a dynamic partition, you don't want to say automatically Hive will take care of it internally. So I will tell you the difference when I am showing you the practical stuff. Now let's get into the practical. By default Hive will sit, in, sit as static partition. So that is by default. So you can enable the dynamic partition. I will show you how to do that. Now 
So before you get into the Hive, uh, like you need to start your Hadoop. So installing Hadoop and installation of Hive videos are there in my playlist. You can find it. So here you need to install Hadoop first and then you have to start the Hadoop service and then you have to start Hive. So to start Hive, like you can, you can use a command. You can change your directory to Hive and then you have to give bin slash Hive. So it will enter into Hive shell. Okay. So it's already running. So I'll just ignore this okay so this is my hive shell so first you have to create I'm, I'm i'm going to show you step by step i'm going to create a non partition table first so this is a non partition table so this table has three columns and uh, and i'm going to insert a record and i will show you my input record this is my input record i'm going to store this input record in this table i'm going to load that input record to this table and since my input data set has delimited with comma i have to mention this and line terminated by new line character so i have to say this if i'm not saying this then even after the load the load will be successful but when you do a select query you will see null values only okay so let me create this table so why you are creating a non-partition table since the video is all about partition. So you may get a question. I will explain you that. So first I will create a non-partition table. Okay. So table name, it's already there. Let me drop this table. Okay. So I have dropped it. Now again, I will try to copy this. Okay. So table is created. Now I am going to load the data. So this data is in my local system. When I say local, it is in my Linux. So here, if you see, this is a load command to load the data. So since my data is in local, I'm going to use the word local. Uh, so if it is in HDFS, then you can remove this local. So if you give load data in path, then this command will load the HDFS data to Hive table. If it is local, then you can, you can use this keyword local. Okay, so local, then the complete path you have to give. So home slash. So previously it was my HDFS path. Now my data is in local. So I have to give the complete path of my local. So local big is my username. Yes. Now I'm going to run this. So this will load my data, which is in my local file system. This command will load the data to Hive. Okay. So, okay. Sorry. My username is test. It is not big. Let me change it. My username is test. So home slash username I have to give because my data is stored in home. Okay, I got it. So data.txt is my file name. Okay, fine. So now it started loading. It's completed. Select star, select star from the table name. Okay. So if you see the 10 records got loaded, now we are going to get into static partition. So while creating a static partition, uh, like the table structure, the syntax is create table user data. I have two columns, serial number and username, but you can ask me in, in data set, you showed three columns. Yes. So the last column city is my partition column. So I, I will be giving that here. So you cannot give in both the places. So inside create table, you have to give only first two column and the partition column you have to give under partitioned by this is a syntax which make your table as a partition table. So let me run this. Okay, so the table is created. Now, now I will tell you why I created a non partition table first. Okay, so for the for the partition table, you cannot insert data into a partition table via load command, load data in path. You can't do that. So you can only insert a data to a partition table with insert into or insert overwrite. Then only the map reduce will get triggered. Only when the map reduce get triggered, the partition will be get the data will be get placed in a correct partitions. Else it won't load in that way. So that's why I created a non-partition table and loaded a data from that non-partition table. I'm going to do a insert to this partition table. So that is the query I can show you here. 
So in this query, if you see insert into user data as the partition table, and then you have to give a keyword partition, and you have to say city is the, your partition column, and you have to give the value. So now you are saying this data, what I'm going to insert should get placed in Chennai partition. So you you have to say that. Now there is this is a query select serial number username from user data no partition is the first table that which we created with var condition city equal to chennai so whatever the output that you get for this select query will be get loaded into the table user data under the partition chennai this is what going to happen and one more thing in the select query you should give only two column names because the city column you have already given in the partition so you should not give here now i am going to run this so before I run this query, I will show you the table structure in HDFS because that is also very important. In interviews, you will get a question like how internally the table structure looks like. So by default, I will store all the tables in HDFS under user high warehouse path only. So while creating a table, you can specify the location. If you are not specifying the location, then automatically high will get stored in HDFS under this location, user high warehouse. Enter. So it will list all the tables whatever you created in Hive in HDFS. So what is our table name is user data. So user underscore data. Now the table is empty. We haven't triggered that insert query yet. So now the table is completely empty. Now I am going to trigger the, see you can see it's an empty. Now I am going to trigger the insert. Let's trigger the insert here. So here what I'm planning to do, I'm loading all my Chennai records to the table user data with a partition city equal to Chennai. Now after this insert get complete in HDFS, you will see a partition name Chennai equal to city. So within that your data will be get stored. So now it's running. Let's wait for the command to get execute. Okay, so if you see the data has got inserted. So let me query this table first. Select star from so you you can see the record the chennai records only got loaded but it's very important to check in the hdfs also so now i'll just trigger this ls command so i'm just showing you all these from hdfs not from your local file system that is very very important and you can see inside user data a partition got created as city equal to chennai if you want to query this yes you can query this as well means if you want to list the files inside this partition you can do that so it will be uh, like 000 the file will be starts with 000 sorry i made some spelling mistake yes so that is the partition files will be like this only 000 underscore zero it will be like this okay so back to your table so uh, so how to check whether the partition got created is uh, like only through hdfs no even in the query you can check show partitions show partitions table name user underscore data okay so if you see it shows city equal to chennai okay let me clear my screen I will re-trigger the command again. So show partition and the table name. So if it is a partition to table, it will show you the partition details here. Fine. Now we are going for dynamic partition. So in dynamic partition, the table creation syntax is same. There is no change. You can see here. It's the same uh, table creation syntax and everything. But by default, as I told you, I will not support creating, uh, uh, sorry, inserting uh, dynamic partition records means you cannot insert a data into a dynamic partition way by default Hive disables it to enable that you have to execute this set property. Okay. So without setting the set property, if you try to run the insert command, which I have given below, it will throw you an error stating that please set this property. Okay. So now I'm going to execute the set property here yes that's it now back let's create the table first it's the same structure like what i showed you above yes it is created now if you see the insert query the insert query what you have in the dynamic is different from static so in the insert query if you see uh, after the table name partition and i'm just giving only city i'm not giving the value but in static partition you have to give the value and then i'm giving the select query the same select query but there is one change i'm including the third column here city in the static partition you cannot include the column which you have mentioned in the partition okay but here it's not like that you have to mention because we are not mentioning the value inside the partition method 
now the same query uh, in the condition you are giving chennai so that if you see in the static part insert you have to be very careful because sometimes people used to change the city name in the var condition for example i am changing the city to delhi but you have to change here also to delhi so if you change only in the var condition as delhi but then you are not share uh, changing the value in the partition then the delhi records will be get stored under chennai partition so that is a very important thing you have to always consider in the insert query for static partition but here we don't have a problem only change the condition hive will take care of creating the partition for the new entry or if it is already there it will take care of placing your record to the exact partition so by default means uh, in general in real time mostly we will use dynamic partition but that's also again based on the use case but mostly people will go for dynamic partition so let me create this i means let me insert the record so again a map ready job will get execute and uh, let's go back to hdfs and let's do an ls so here now the ls is a different table right user data underscore dynamic it's dynamic okay so now again same like the folder structure will not be different between the static and dynamic it will be same now again you will see city equal to chennai only so you will be getting dot hive staging because the map ready jobs the insert is still in process that's why you are getting it so if here here the mapery job got completed you will not see that hive staging directory actually okay so my record got inserted i will show you i will re trigger the ls command so you will see same like city equal to chennai similar to the static one see you, you can see here now back to uh, hive shell let me select this table so user data dynamic let me copy it select star from yes so you can see only chennai record got stored now again in the insert query you can change this to delhi or mumbai so now again uh, you will you will be seeing a new partition getting created in the hdfs as city equal to mumbai and only mumbai records will be get stored and in insert query i have not given any value to the partition column but in hdfs the partition will be created correctly if you see uh, now we have only chennai right now again i do an ls now you will see two partitions one is chennai one is mumbai so the insert is still in process okay it's completed now so let me uh, do an ls so now you will be seeing two uh, partitions see city chennai and city mumbai yes so uh, as i told you folder structure is also very important in interview people will ask you the folder structure informations and we have two more topics like uh, continuity with the partition is there is one more called sub partitions and there is one more topic called buckets so these two you will see in the upcoming video please stay touch with my playlist and please do subscribe my channel so that you will be getting the updates and also in real time when you explain the partitions in your table right you have mostly in the real time we do partitions with time stamp we convert the time stamp to year month date and then we create a partition as year and then sub partition month sub partition date okay so it's like a folder year folder within year folder we will have 12 months and within each folder each month folder we will have 31 days files so that that is how in real time it will be so in the real time when you explain you can explain like that but this is since a, a kind of an example i want to show you i'll just went with the city column as a partition column but in real time you have to go with time stamp five buckets so bucket is one of the very important concept in hive so in with respect to hive there is two concepts are so important one is partition and one is bucket okay so this video is going to be kind of an uh, quite uh, lengthier video i recommend you to watch this video completely so i am going to explain in and out about buckets so when it comes to hive so people who has already some knowledge on uh, hive right so they used to ask me a question so we have seen a table with partition we have seen a tab table with partition and bucket also but what is the use of just having buckets and do we have uh, these kind of only bucketed tables in real time yes we do have only bucketed tables in real time i will explain you everything here so i have already explained about partition in my previous video if you want to get the complete big data course videos i have given the link in the description box of this video the playlist name is big data course you will be seeing a playlist link in the description box if you click that you can get complete big data videos It includes hive spark hdfs map reduce and so many other stuff and i will be keep on adding videos to that playlist fine so if you see uh, this part 
partition with the bucket i will be explaining this in my next video so today we are going to see just buckets and what is the use of it what is the internals of bucket so when when we say bucket people come with two, people used to come with two points one is bucket is used for data sampling and then bucket is with respect to map side join bucket is really good with respect to map side join the performance will be really good these two points will will cover these two points later so what exactly bucket underlaying what it do bucket used to distribute the data okay so partition is also doing the same bucket is also doing the same but they have small difference i'll be explaining everything in this video so just we jump into some of the practicals now i will just show you the ddls first so to enable the bucket right you have to uh, set all these properties by default your hive shell will not allow you to create the bucket tables you have to enforce the bucket table as true so that is what we are doing enforcing bucket equal to true and there is two more partition you can see so we have to enable the dynamic partition as well okay so now uh, even in the partition video i have told this whenever you create a partition table or a bucket table you cannot use load data command to load a file so if you load it via with load command to a partition or a bucket table the data will not be get partitioned or the table will not be get bucketed the data okay the data will not be get partitioned the data will not be get bucketed so if you use load data in path command means so instead you have to use insert into or insert overwrite command to the partition and bucket table and then only your data will be get partitioned and your data will be get bucketed in bucket table okay so if you are writing via spark or map reduce then no problem so you are you are writing a spark program which will write the data directly to the target table which is bucketed it's fine completely fine so you have to run a map reduce job while loading the data that is what we need so load command will not do that so you have to use insert or insert overwrite or through program you can write spark or map reduce it's, it's completely fine so here what i am going to do is so since it is not going to allow us to do a bulk load so first i am going to create a normal table without bucket no partition no bucket just a normal table and then i am going to use load data local in path to load my file to this normal table and then you can see i am creating a bucket table here the second create statement so here i am creating a bucket table then you can see there is an insert command insert into table the bucket table name select star from the normal table so the, what happens here so from the normal table i am doing an insert into to my bucket table so in this way map reduce will run so that your table will be get bucketed your data will be get bucketed so now i will show my input data as well which has three columns serial number name and amount that's it okay so now if you closely uh, see the syntax of bucket table so create table table name and then we have columns and then i have a comment okay so this is optional having adding and comment to the table so whenever people use a command called show create table table name so this will give you the complete create table ddl which will have the comment statement as well so that people will come to know okay this table is for this so it, it it is that way only so it's just optional and the actual syntax is clustered by clustered by is what the bucket syntax is so where we used to give in the partition table as partitioned by right so some something like that in bucket we have clustered by and based on which column you have to do this bucketing so you have to give that column in partition we used to give the partition column similarly here we have to give the bucket column and how many buckets you need so in partition we will not do this we will not mention this many partition is required so i will take care of doing that but here you have to mention how many buckets you want if you see here i have mentioned as three buckets here if you see three buckets and then store dust text file now you can ask me a question how you decided the number three it's something a random no it's not at all random there is a calculation for deciding the bucket count so in the same playlist if you see there will be a video called how to decide bucket counts in hive i recommend you to watch that video so that you will be having the complete uh, knowledge of buckets in hive these two videos the video watch you the currently you are watching plus the how to decide the bucket count if you see these two videos then you are in and out with respect to bucket concept fine so now what i have what i am going to do is I'm, i have already created a table bucket table and then i have did a insert also now the table has the data but here i want to tell you something so bucket internally it will decide which data has to go to which particular bucket but in partition you only will decide which record has to go to which partition so that is the only difference between bucket and partition so whereas in bucket hive itself the bucket itself will decide where to land your record in which bucket but in partition you used to decide in which partition the record has to go 
that is the difference between hive and bucket let me give you an uh, kind of an explanation so imagine so you have three imagine we are working with partition tables and you have three partitions so based on country column so country country okay india there is one partition us there is one partition and uk there is one partition so you have three partition now you are doing an insert insert one record you are inserting in which the country is us now tell me this particular insert with us record country as us goes to which partition obviously to the second partition because this is us and this is where like in partition we are deciding the records has to go to which partition but in buckets it's not like that imagine so this is not partition now imagine this is bucket now you are sending a record us record but there is a chance this us record can go to india bucket also or the us record may go to uk bucket also this is what happens in bucket so we cannot tell this particular record please go to first bucket second bucket that you can't say but you can say that in the partition now you can ask me then how come bucket is advantage we can go for partition itself right okay park that question for now i will give the answer for that question as well now so this question there is one question let's hold that question for now now let's understand what is the internal mechanism of bucket how bucket is deciding which record has to go to which bucket so bucket internally uses an algorithm called a hash partition which is very important for you to have this concept in your mind because in interview people used to ask this for to you okay so hash partition is the algorithm which internally bucket used to decide which record has to go to which bucket so this algorithm has a formula hash of the column hash of the bucketed column okay so hash of the bucket column mod of number of buckets okay now we can take our example so we have given amount column as a bucketed column right so we have some values like this uh, 15 some amounts we have some amount like this and mod of what is the number of buckets we had three so that means so hash of bucket column now what bucket will do the hash what hash partition will do it will take this number three and it will populate a hash value for this three imagine you will be getting some value like uh, 30 okay so we don't know what hash value so i'm generating it's my own i'm giving an example with my own hash value so now this 30 divided by 3 and what will be the remainder obviously zero because mod function means it, it it goes to remainder so we don't want to worry about the quotient so it's all about the remainder so what this remainder value denotes so this denotes this denotes the position position of the bucket and that means so now we created a table with three buckets right in hdfs it will be like this 0 0 0 0 underscore 0 0 0 0 0 1 underscore 0 0 0 0 0 2 underscore 0 you will be seeing three buckets in your hdfs as a folders as a directories now what this zero is uh, denoting right the position so starts with 0 1 2 this is the position so we have three buckets starts with zero so this zero is denoting the first bucket so which record for, for which record we got the remainder as 0 for this record 3 so we have two more columns serial number and then name so serial number is one name something okay imagine my name Gautam and then 3 so this particular record has to go to first bucket only because the amount column of the first record generated 30 as a hash value and this 30 has been divided by 3 and the remainder we got 0 0 denotes the position of the bucket so the complete record will go to first bucket so this is what internally hash partition is doing the bucket is doing so here if you want to override this then you have to write a custom partition which means you have to go for partition no other go partition is the place where you will decide but bucket is something that bucket itself will decide now we understood the internals of bucket and why bucket behaves like this this is what important to understand okay well we'll stop here so we understood now we come back to the previous question so why we have to use bucket when when the data is not going for the respective partition we can go with partition itself right in which we'll say go to this partition this record has to go to india record has to go to india us record has to go to us so in bucket means india record is going to us bucket right so that is what your question is why we have to use bucket then okay let me come to that point i will explain you that point so if you see here we have uh, let's let's go for partition let's take partition and i will give you some sample records so you have serial number name 
and then country so one two three four name a b c d and then we have india us india and then us now here you can consider this country as a partition column and why not serial number and name why can't you choose these two because in serial number there is no duplicate it's unique value and even in the name it's all unique value so we have to group based on something right then only we the the, the read uh, the need of partition enter into picture so here if i go with country then these two record goes to one partition and these two record goes to one partition so we have two right so we have two partitions so we are doing this partition based on the country now imagine some bucket cases okay so we have serial number account number phone number serial number 1234 account number 1001 1002 1003 1004 phone number 9876123456785614 and then like 0014 now based on which column we can do partition now tell me so serial number is unique account numbers are also unique phone numbers are also unique so in this case what happens so if you go for the partition case right in partition so in the first partition you will be having india records and in second partition you will have us records now i am writing in query select star from table where country equal to india so in this case this query directly goes to only this partition it will query the data if there is no partition what this query will do it will do a full scan it will read record by record now imagine if there is no place for us to do a partition you see here all these three column the values are unique and there is no place for us to do the partition then what happens full scan will happen right so you can ask me we do have such tables in real time of course you will have you will have some tables in which you can't do partitions okay so when you write some query for example i want to do a select star from where account number equal to 1004 it used to scan full table no no we can't achieve partition here and we should not have full scan also then what we can do we can go for buckets now what buckets will do now i'm giving this phone number as a bucket column then it will take the first value it will do a hash and then it will divide by number of buckets you are giving three so here the partition is based on the value itself but here the partition is not based on the value of the column the bucket is based on the hash value of value of the column that is very important so here directly partition is considering the value directly so here it's not like that it is taking the value of the phone number of first record and then it is doing the hash value and then only it is deciding the bucket so here even though the first number and the last phone number are different imagine they give same remainder as zero yeah chances can happen right so here we get a hash value as 30 and here we get hash value as 9 now 30 divided by 3 and 9 divided by 3 obviously what is the remainder zero zero so that means even though their phone number are different they can end up with coming to a single partition not partition single bucket right so now you you can ask me now in this case how you are avoiding the full scan okay let me tell you that now you have two buckets in the first bucket you have 9876 and then 0014 and then in the next bucket you have 1234 and imagine you have 5678 the remaining two records now when i write us this query and i'm giving the phone number as 00174 when uh, when i write this query it directly goes to first bucket only it will not go to second bucket because second bucket doesn't have that value but you can ask me in the first bucket we, i have one more value also right that is fine so what this query will do it will go here it will read the first record okay this is not and then it will read second so here is here also it is reading unwanted records but it is avoiding we are trying to avoid the full scan we are not completely searching in all the buckets right we are not doing that some buckets we are eliminating and that is a good thing right so we don't have any solution so you can't do partition and you have to avoid full scan in that case you can go for buckets so many of you are aware of partition with bucket use case but only bucket use case no one aware means as means in my experience i'm saying so people whoever comes to me or even if, if i am an interviewer when i ask them what is the need of bucket and you have any bucket only table people will say no we don't have bucket only table we have partition and bucket no we do have some tables i have worked in so many use cases where tables only with buckets because we don't have options to partition so when i ask the question to the people if i give this table as an example when i when i ask them to give when, when i used to give this table as an example and i will ask them can we do partition here they will say no because they are unique values and what is the solution they will say we can go with full scan only but they no one will say bucket is the solution for this so bucket is a solution when the table is not possible to 
create a partition and you have to avoid full scan of course you can go for buckets partition is with bucket is different okay it's a different thing because first you are doing a partition and then only you are doing a bucket so that is different that is easy to explain but this is what not easy to explain okay fine so uh, we we have been discussing uh, the the need of bucket only we have done in the beginning of the video i have said two things right one is like a map side join because you perform join on bucket table is called map side join the performance will be really good and second i said data sampling right i will explain you this later I, I, within two to three minutes i will explain so uh, let me just go through uh, means let me just give a walk through on these ddls for you okay so if you see here so i have created an uh, bucket table and then i have do i have done an insert into as well so just let me try to query this bucket table for you i will show you this okay so if you see here i have that 10 records in this bucket table and you will not see anything here any changes here but i will show you the location in which this table gets stored in hdfs so create table and then the table name enter so if you see here this is the this is the location let me go to this location in uh, hdfs okay so you can see three buckets that got created and you can even you can even uh, copy this path and you can do a cat command hdfs cat and you can see which records so i showed you 10 records right so which part of record goes to first bucket which part of record goes to second bucket you can able to see that as well because i have this 10 records so these 10 records has been splitted into three buckets and maybe some bucket could have empty also because if the remainder was not coming for the prospective hash value then it will never go to that bucket right so some ex empty buckets will also be there okay fine so now one more last thing i want to tell you is sampling okay i i i i i was it to say that right so if you see here sampling is all about you want to perform a test run for a particular amount of data but not for the entire table so you want you are training a model or you are training a data set for a model for in a data science or some reports you you want to do a thing so first we are do a sample on it and then we do a full full we apply the same logic for the full records so in that case there is two types of sampling in hive one is block sampling and one is bucketed sampling so bucket tables how to do a sample is imagine so if you see the query select average of amount from the bucketed table and then you have to use this keyword table sample and here we are mentioning bucket one out of three i'm considering the first bucket data only out of three bucket i'm not consider i'm not going to run this average command for all the three buckets i'm going to run only for one bucket and and i'm picking that based on random okay so that is based on random or you can give a column name also so remove that random function and just give amount that is also fine so this will just apply the average function only for first bucket records not for the complete once you see that is good and you can apply it for uh, for all the records so that is what sampling is all about so you can even test this query in your machine so thanks for watching how to decide the number of buckets count in hive in this video i am not going to explain you what is bucket and what is the use case of bucket and i just wanted to mention that here so we are going to just see how to decide the bucket counts in hive is there any special formula or is there any special calculation access to do that yeah we do have so that is what i'm gonna show you today let's get into the topic so before getting into the actual topic i just wanted to show you how the bucket uh, table creation syntax will be so here i created a table bucketed user and you can see here i'm using the clustered by is a syntax we used to create the bucket stuff and here state is my uh, column which i'm going to use it as my uh, bucket column and then here i'm giving the count as 32 buckets now the question how you have decided the number 32 so that is the question so is it some random value i can i can make it or like is there any specific way to derive this value so one important thing please don't go with a random value bucket is very important because it's like a sub partition so when you are going with some random value even though you have buckets your performance of the table will be still goes low and people will think like i even though i have partition and bucket but still my table is going very low when I means my my queries are running very slow 
people used to ask this question the reason is you haven't uh, chosen a correct bucket count and that's why the performance is going down and here is a formula that I'm, I just wanted to share you in my experience I have used this formula in many of my uh, uh, domains and to my different clients and it worked out and I'm going to share you that with you and this is going to be quite a, a, a pretty long video more than 10 minutes uh, please uh, you have to watch each and every piece of information that will be very helpful for you okay so here is the formula to decide how to go with the bucket count so the very first thing you have to take the table size okay so table size so it's going to be a new table then how can i go with the size okay and that means you have to go for some kind of a dry run for some days like two to three days and based on that you have to predict what will be the value something like that or you are migrating it from oracle or some mysql some traditional db to hive then you can check with your uh, source team what is what will what is the average volume of the table will be uh, because when i say table size is the first thing you have to consider then people will say no hive is a new setup in my cluster and i don't know what what size is going to be uh, comes to my hive table so in that case check with the source okay so first thing is table size okay let me go with some number 2300 mb is my table size and then the block size in your hdfs okay so my block size is 128 so that means you have to do 128 mb now you have to divide this 2300 mb by 128 so i have already calculated this so the number uh, the output is 17.96 is the output so this particular value you can use as your bucket count but here again there is a twist when you go with this number and soon like your performance may goes down like may or may not but this is not the uh, 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 fulfilled formula for this we have to wait for few more time few more minutes i will tell you so and i will tell you why i means why i should not consider this value because i will not recommend to take this value as your bucket count please don't go for it i will tell you i will tell you the reason why the actual formula is now 2 power of n equal to 17.96 greater than or equal to so you have to find this n okay so uh, always the bucket uh, uh, the n should be the power of 2 uh, that means the deciding the bucket count it should come from this formula okay so now let's go for uh, excel what you can do you can use log log or manually you can cal calculate so log number comma base number is your output that is 17.96 and base is 2 okay now you will find the n so if you see here i will i will just select here and you can see log 17 comma 2 i didn't use 17.96 instead i'm going to use 17 comma 2 and that means i'm getting 4 so that means of uh, 17.96 like whatever i'm i'm, I'm giving us is, is 4 but we need some kind of an accurate and round number so the n should not be a decimal value the n so this 4.0 is actually the n so the n has to be in some round value so we go, we can go for 2 power 5 okay the n can be 5 so this is 4 right 17.96 is coming around 4 point some 8 something so let's go with 5 so that means 2 power of 5 okay 2 power of 5 what it's 32 right so this 32 is your bucket count so this 32 is what your bucket count okay now i will tell you few more points uh, which is very important to remember whenever your table size get increase the calculation will vary and this number can get changed and that means you have to update your bucket count whenever the volume of the table get increases so how frequent this will happen because i cannot do it regularly okay i will tell you so this formula will will be very good because uh, it won't take that much uh, frequent uh, uh, frequent changes for you so in a year uh, it you you may you may you may take only like four to five times that you may update your table uh, the bucket counts okay so it, it won't be very regular because it's all based on the volume of your table so even if this table volume get increased like again it increased like uh, now it's like two three zero zero right again it is increasing like three four zero zero also still it will be less than 32 
okay so the, when you when you derive it just do this divide by 128 or whatever number you get it will be still less than this 32 and that's the reason i am going for this this one not this one okay so 17.96 so some people ask me shall i go by creating the table with 20 safe and side yeah you can go ahead you can go ahead with 20 buckets 17.96 or you can round it as 18 you can create 18 buckets but still uh, uh, the buckets will be get filled soon and you will be getting some performance problems in your table so that's the reason we go for this round value whatever the n is 5 right it should not be less than 17.96 but it can be greater than 17.96 so we go for 32 okay that means 5 n is 5 so when you go for 32 it's like even you get this number also still it is less than it's going to be less than 32 and you are safe inside but still if if you are getting double the amount for example 4600 mb your volume of table is getting increased then this value will change it may cross 32 mb maybe imagine 64 mb like now i am getting 64 as a bucket count for output when i do this calculation so you have to update your table from 32 to 64 as your bucket count and how frequent this will happen so that's what i told you it will it will not be that much frequent uh, it, it may be like six months once or even three months once or two months once and that much frequent only it will be because in my experience i'm telling you i have worked this formula in a different domains and for different clients and uh, uh, the table needs to be get updated that is for sure because the volume of the table will get increased but it is not that much frequent that i have done that i have uh, updated the table the bucket count is not that much frequent it's just two to three times in a year that's it okay now i will tell you the steps how you have to update your bucket count in the table whether it is a straightforward or we have to do some other way okay you cannot update the bucket count in your current table as is like 32 to 64 you can't do that because whenever you change the bucket count the table has to be get repartitioned so that means see this is my table one bucket user and there is a table name and 32 is a bucket now imagine there is a scenario i have to increase this 32 to 64 so because uh, you have decided the formula 32 and you are running your queries and it is running fine all of a sudden by end of third month uh, your your query performance is going down for the particular table means you can suspect that the volume got raised so that we have to update the uh, bucket count uh, that's how we will come to know so um, all of a sudden one day my table performance was down now i am coming to the point okay i have to change the bucket count i am taking the volume of size of the table that is easy you can easily you can take the size of the table and then you can divide it by your block size and then you can come with the formula means the number count so i am deciding i am coming with the count as 64 now i have to update this so you can't update in the actual current table now what you have to do the next step is you have to create a new table with access the same structure only thing you have to change the bucket number as 64 now you have to do an insert overwrite to this new table bucket user 1 select star from bucket user so what happened here internally the map reduce job will get start and uh, you from the first table it is coming to the second table and uh, the repartition will happen and the data will be get split to all the 64 buckets okay so here uh, this is the step you have to do and uh, this insert overwrite while you are doing whatever the job that is writing to this table or reading from the table hold the job for some time it won't take more than uh, 30 to 40 minutes for you to complete this query irrespective to the volume of the table it won't take that much time and again it, the the insert overwrite may take long time that depends on your cluster but in my experience i'm telling you uh, even for billion uh, uh, well, the billion records of volume of table i have done the insert overwrite it is not taking much time not more than 30 minutes or 40 minutes it won't be in that much time so till then you have to hold your jobs which is writing to this table and reading from the table hold those jobs and complete this insert overwrite once that is done rename this table uh, bucket user 1 to bucket user that means you have to drop this table or you can take a backup of this table then the new table needs to be get renamed to your old table because your existing jobs are pointing to that table name right so this is how you have to do and if you if some people used to feel like for every uh, like three months once or six months once i have to change the bucket as a complex test don't think like that you are supposed to do that there is no other go because based on the volume get increased the bucket count should get changed and that is how the performance you can achieve hive partition with the bucket so generally we do partition or we do bucket in hive but there is a 
place and there is a use case where we do both partition and bucket so before getting into this video right i just wanted to tell you you have to uh, brush up few topics as a prerequisite so you need to know what is partition in hive and how to implement it and you need to know what is bucket in hive and how to implement it so, okay now let's get into the topic so now uh, generally when we do a partition so why we need to do a partition so generally we do a partition so that the full scan of the table we we don't want to do we are just trying to avoid the full scan and the, whatever the data that i want to search for it goes to the actual partition and then i want to query it so that is how the performance will get increased the time will get reduced so that is the reason of partition now imagine when there is no columns in your data for partition imagine now i'll just remove the last column from this data which you are seeing now so let me remove this okay if you see i have three three columns serial number let's make it a serial number and then phone number and account number so if you see all these three column has unique values and then you cannot do partition scale if you have repeated values on any column then you can do partition based on that the grouping should happen so whenever you see some files some input like this you can go ahead for buckets so buckets used to take pick one column so we have to decide which based on which column the bucket has to create for example if i give serial number column as a bucket column then it will do a hash of that serial number and then based on that it will put values in buckets different serial numbers can have same hash value so that these two different serial number will go to one particular bucket also okay this is bucket use case fine so now imagine i have one column you can see country india and us now i can do partition so now imagine i am doing a partition based on the country and after doing the partition still i want my performance to be boosted so i am checking whether we can do a sub partitions or not so for example uh, year is the first partition and then you can you create a sub partition for month and then you can create a sub partition for date so and then you can create a sub partition for district state something like this right now this is sub partition because you have the option to do it so you are doing in the data you have all these values so you are able to do the sub partition but consider my case so i have only country and country based partition i have done already now i am trying to do a sub partition but i don't have any columns see if i if i remove this value now sub parti partition is done now i have only these three columns to be get partitioned for sub partition but i don't have any repeated values so now what i will do just to increase the performance of the table once the partition is completed based on the country now i'm i'm i want to do a bucket on top of it so if partition is really uh, only with the partition your table performance is really good yeah please go ahead but if you need more performance you try to go for sub partition if sub partition is not possible at all with the data then go for buckets only there is no other go so now i am going to create a partition based on the country then i am going to create a bucket within that partition based on any one of these first three columns okay as i told you bucket will consider whatever the column you give for bucket it will make a hash of it and then it will load the data now i'll show you in practical so here you can see create table partitioned bucket with five columns and then partitioned by country okay clustered by is what bucketing bucketing okay clustered by first column pid into four buckets so when when you create a bucket table who will decide the count and how to decide the count now i have given four so for this the third video i said you have to see three videos right the third video uh, gives you the complete explanation of how to decide the bucket count in hive so please do watch that video as well fine so now into four buckets and then row format delimited field terminated by comma stored as text file now i am going to create this particular table so after creating it you have to do insert into or insert over right that means a map reduce should run while inserting the record then only the partition and bucketing will be get created so what i am doing i am just creating a normal uh, table at, with a text file storage format and i am loading some 10 records to the table now table first table name is table 1 now i am loading this table 1 select star from table 1 to this partitioned bucket table that means insert overwrite table partitioned bucket partition country equal to india so i am creating an partition while loading as an in india all 10 record that gets stored into this table should get loaded as india records and from select star from table one so now here the partition and bucketing both will happen for this 10 records let me show you so first i will just i have created the first table i will show you select star from table one so this is the table normal table now i I'm, I'm going to load this data to the bucketed table so i have triggered the insert overwrite command also i will show you that 
yeah so he here you can see insert override table partitioned bucket partition country equal to india select star from table one so the map reduce got completed now if i do a show create table show create table the table name partitioned bucket i will show you the structure also you can see partitioned by country clustered by pid into four buckets okay and i will just do a select for this table data got loaded so partitioned bucket okay 10 records and finally you will see one column which is india that is the partition column we used in insert override to load now i will copy the location and i will show you how it gets stored in hdfs that's very important because in interviews people used to ask this actually so hadoop fs hyphen ls enter okay you can see there is one file and there is one partition country india copy this hadoop fs hyphen ls again so now you will see four buckets see the 10 record has been get stored across these four buckets it got got distributed between these four it just got splitted so based on the pid it it does the calculation so how internally buckets is calculating which record has to go to which bucket so this is something i have given in the bucket video i have detailed explained in the bucket video hive ORC file format. So in Hive we have various storage format. Also we can call it as file format. So one such very familiar and uh, useful file format or storage format is ORC. Let me show you an image. So this image is cut copy paste from Artanox website. So we have various formats like text file format, RC file format, parquet format and then ORC and we have sequence file format as well. So the very familiar file formats are parquet and ORC. So when, when you store a data while creating a table itself in Hive you have to mention the storage format. So if you mention it as ORC and you are creating a table. When you store some file, when you load it into that ORC table, your actual uh, size, for example if your actual file size is 100 GB, when you load it to ORC it will be just 25 GB. 75 percentage of compression rate it's been available for ORC. So that means your file size will be get smaller, it will be get compressed when you store it in ORC. That advantage of it your processing time will get reduced and then your performance will get increased and I'm showing you the example here the text file 585 GB imagine you have a hive table which text file format that is a very base format so when you store some 585 GB of data in text file format it will be still 585 but when you store the same text file as RC it will be like 505 14 percentage of compression rate and then when you move it to parquet then it is 60 percentage of compression rate when you move to ORC then it is 75 percentage of compression rate so you can ask me a question so if i use orc file format the only advantage that I, that i get is the compression rate no we have one more advantage the data that gets stored in orc file format will be columnar so generally we have row oriented storage column oriented storage when you use column oriented storage the the, the aggregations the query will be very faster so for example if you see i have a record gautam and then my age 30 and then imagine some salary 100 and then there is a next record with age of uh, 10 and then I have 200 as a salary just imagine now if you want to do a sum of age imagine I have to do a sum of age if it is a row oriented storage then first the SQL will read the complete row and then it will fetch 30 and then it will read the second row completely then it will fetch 10 so then it will do a sum of but what column oriented will do directly it will fetch 30 and 10 it won't read the entire row so that means the lot of time you are saving so that is an advantage of column oriented storage so the ORC gives you the column oriented uh, format of storage the full form of ORC is optimized row column so now I am going to show you an example as a demo I create a table, table 1 with 5 columns and in the storage format what I am using is text file. And I am loading a file called data30l which has like 30 lakh records. I am loading twice so that means 60 lakh, 60 lakh records. So the more data volume I, I load the more I can show you the difference between the ORC and text file. Then I am, I am going to uh, uh, create another table, table 2 with ORC as a storage format and then I am doing an insert overwrite. So when you create a table with ORC, you cannot uh, do a load data. You have to do insert into or it has to be come via insert override. 
okay so now i am inserting uh, table 2 with the data from table 1 so insert over a table 2 select star from table 1 that means the 60 lakh record from table 1 will be get loaded to table 2 as orc format now i am going to do a count star and i am going to show you the difference time difference and also i will show you the volume of the data after the load for both the tables okay uh, let me uh, go to uh, my terminal so if you see first let's uh, let's see the count of it so if you see here i have table 1 here the count is 60 lakh twice two times i have loaded as i told you already so 30 lakh plus 30 lakh 60 lakh and then let's see the count of table 2 as well if you see here this is table 2 count star from table 2 okay so this is again 60 lakh so table 1 also has 60 lakh count and table 2 also has 60 lakh count so i have shared all this ddl in my blog and the blog link has been provided in the description box you can get this because i have already executed and i am showing you so you can run it practically uh, within your machine i will show you the count command which i have executed so if you see here select count star from table 2 where the total amount is 110 and i am getting my output here you can see here 6474 and the total time taken is 21 second let's keep it as 22 second this is table 2 which is orc file format now let's i'll show you the count command of table 1 the output okay so if you see here select count star from table 1 the same condition total amount 110 so if you can see here the same output but the time taken is 29.1 second so the ORC format uh, when I execute the count command it took only 22 second but here it took 29.1 second so now the time is getting reduced for the execution time is getting reduced for the ORC table so that the performance will get increased now I will show you the compression stuff as well. So now I'm I'm giving uh, uh, the ls command for uh, you can do you can get it with show create table command. I will show you how can I get the table path where it gets stored. You can give show create table table two and this is the location of your table. Now next uh, you can give this so again the location has been given here for table one so now i'll going to give ls for table two and you can see this is the uh, like one file which i'm showing here the volume you can see the size this is in bytes okay now i'm going to do an ls for table one and you can see like i have two files now i I'm, i want to tell you one thing because people will get confused like why in table two location i'm seeing two files but table two i'm seeing only one file so i'll recap it again see we, here we did load data in path twice and so here it is showing as a two file but for table 2 what we did is we we inserted table 2 with select star of table 1 so it will merge it these two files when it is storing as ORC file format that's why here we are having as one file so to verify this only I have showed you the count of these two table as the count was ma matching both has 60 lakhs so that means obviously the files are perfect now if you see here I will go for calculator you can see the size 11946286 into 2 this is the actual volume for 60 lakh record in table 1 but if you see in table 2 the volume is 49149012 which is very less very less compared to this number right so obviously the file is got compressed with ORC but not in text file and the execution time also got reduced and the performance got increased that I've showed you with the count example and there is one more information I want to tell you is ORC file format is it's optional uh, when you create a table you can use whether it is required or not you can decide but there is one case where ORC file format is mandatory if you create an hive AC table then for sure the storage format need to be ORC only you cannot use text file or park it then you cannot achieve the ACID ACID table means the table that allows you to do insert and update so you have to enable the ACID while creating the table during that time the storage format needs to be ORC so in this video we discussed about ORC and text file hive acid tables so hive acid is a concept which uh, entered into picture in the version of hive 0.14 and hive was predominantly used for OLAP and that means online analytical process so that means we'll have only inserts we but we won't have any updates okay so we use only for analytical purpose but later hive also supported acid acid means in RDBMS we have this concept called acid atomicity consistency isolation and durability and that means in simple i can say a table which allows you to do insert update and delete 
so in hive insert update delete was launched into picture only after this hive 0.14 version and previously hive was predominantly used only for OLAP that means only inserts and now people started using hive insert update delete uh, functionalities because it supports it and also now hive is also used for OLTP that means online transaction process so the table which has inserts and updates both right we call it as OLTP table okay so now uh, in in real time people are using acid tables or not if you ask this question i will say yes most of the people started using the acid functionality in hive a lot so if you are entering into the interviews right if some in the interviews people are asking this question whether you worked in hive acid table or not and most of the time i have seen in my experience when i when i am an interviewer when i ask this question people will say no we haven't used but that's completely fine for me but when I ask them, can you tell me how to create an asset table? So that is what required. So even though you haven't used in the real time, but at least you might have studied this for your own personal interest, right? So that is what people are expecting. So you need to watch this video completely. It's not a big deal. So at least you are not going to practice. This is fine, but just have a knowledge of this video so that at least in the interview, you can explain and make sure, as I told you, people started using asset tables in the real time. Okay, before getting into this video, I have given this uh, playlist link called Big Data Course in the description box where you can find the complete Big Data videos start from lesson one and I will be keep on adding new videos to the playlist. So you can have a look on that playlist. So you don't want to go for any special course to learn Big Data. This playlist is completely enough for you. Okay, now before you start doing this acid stuff, you need to set all these properties in your Hive shell just directly you can run this so I have shared a link where you can find this code okay it's there in the description box where you can find the details okay so now when you run this what happens so uh, I will enable you to do all acid related stuff okay so now uh, we are entering into the create table syntax and okay uh, when, when, when it comes to the set property once again I want to tell you something so this for, if you want to set this permanently then you have to set these properties in high wife and site.xml but in real time most of the time they will not set this in high wife and site.xml for sure so you have to uh, attach these set properties along with your HQL that means you create the list of uh, DDLs in a file and you will run that file in the real time so in the real time you will not go and type each and every query in hive shell you will not do you will create as a file and that file will be get executed so in that file in the beginning you have to add this okay now create table so when you try to create an acid table there is four rules that you have to follow and this is what an interview they are expecting from you how to create an acid table the very first thing your table should be an internal table so in hive we have a concept called external and internal table if you are not aware of this concept in the same playlist what I said before in the description box you can find that video in the playlist internal and external table in hive please refer that video for more information so internal table is default so this is internal table when there is a keyword called the external in front of the table name then that table name then that table is external table so this is an internal table so now I have the columns and the data types and then second rule your acid table must be an bucketed table it has to be bucketed second rule third so you have to use storage format ORC file format so we do have parquet file format ORC file for format text file format sequence file format so we do have various storage format in hive but for acid tables you have to use only ORC this is rule number three rule number four you have to enable transaction equal to true in the table property so there is four rules that you have to use to create an acid table the table must be an internal table it should be in bucketed and it should be used ORC file format and finally the table has to be transaction equal to true that's it now you can do all inserts updates and delete okay so let me show you the table I have created the table I will just show you the table there is a command called show create table table name so this will uh, show you the DDL of the table the complete create syntax you can able to see so this is an internal table and it is bucketed and it uses ORC file format and finally transaction equal to true now select star from the table name so I have one record here let me show you so there is one record one Saravana Chennai okay now I want to do an inserts insert so I'm gonna do an insert here so let's do an insert so I'm going to insert a value one Gautam Chennai so let me make it as two here because I do have one already I don't have a primary key but I'm just saying so to have it clear 
So let me clear the screen and then paste this insert command. So this will trigger the MapReduce job. So once this MapReduce job is completed, you can able to see the data. Let's wait for the job get completes. Okay, so now the, now the insert is completed. Let's do a select. So now we'll have two records. So one Saravana Chennai and then two Gautam Chennai. So now we're going to do an update. So update acid example set name equal to, okay, it's Saravana is already there. Let me change it to ROM where serial number equal to one. Okay, so go back, clear the screen, paste, enter. So now let's wait for the update get complete. Okay, so the update is completed. Let's do one select. So now, uh, yeah, so the name has been updated from Saravana to Ram. So the final step is let's delete the record. So I'm going to delete serial number one. So delete from table where serial number equal to one. So, so we're going to do a delete here. So again, the records will be get de deleted. So this is what ASCII table. So if you are from RDBMS background, you might have seen this is so simple, but that is true. But creating an ASCII table has some uh, rules, regulations, something like that. So we need to be aware of it. So, uh, and, and also, so make sure one thing people started using ASCII tables in the real time so you need to know that as well if you are not aware of it that's completely fine you can still say you haven't used ASCII table but when they ask you what is the syntax of the table please tell these but how to write a hive UDF so what is UDF user defined function is what UDF so first of all what what is function in hive so only if you know that then only like uh, you will come to know what is UDF that is what is user defined function so first I will show you what is function is all about so just I, I have just logged into my hive so you can run this query show functions Okay, when you when you execute this, uh, I'm sorry, it's so functions. Okay, so when you execute this query, I will list all the predefined function that it has. So if you see here, min, max, uh, like UKs, and then hashing algorithm. So you have a lot of function that you use for columns, right? So for example, if you see here, I will show you one example. Select UKs is a function, so which will convert lower case to upper case. Okay. Okay, if I give this, so I'll get Gautam in capital letter. So that means like this U case converts uh, a particular value in the given column to uppercase. So uh, this is just for testing. So any function that you call, we used to give only the column name, but I'm giving the value here. So the reason is I'm just doing a testing, but generally what we do is we used to do like this. So if you get confused, because sometimes people used to get confused, what is this for the function you are giving the value directly? Yeah, it will work, but just that is just for testing. Okay, so generally what we do, U case of the column name imagine name is my column name and then you have to give from table name okay so whatever the table is so you have to give like this so this is how uh, we used to use the function right but I'm not, uh, if you see in my first query I'm not giving any table name and also I'm not giving the column name I'm directly giving the value that is just for testing whether the particular function is working fine or not so all these functions what I've showed you here it's like predefined functions it's it's there within hive itself so I want to create our own my own function because my requirement doesn't fit with any of the function what hive gives so in that case whenever I write my own function the custom function is called user defined function so to do that I'm gonna write it in Java so with this I I'm, I'm, we can achieve that so here I've, I've just written this with Java and then I will tell you like I will show you how to create a project setup and what to do and then let's uh, have a walkthrough with the code and then we can run it so if you see here I created a project as MR and then I have my hive UDF Java within my package org sample hive training so uh, what you have to do two things you have to do after creating the project uh, you have to uh, add all the library files and then only uh, you will not get any error so if this libraries you have not added that means the dependency was not added you will get all errors in the import statements if you are using maven project then that is completely fine add hive dependency and hadoop dependency if you are not aware of maven or something like that that's completely fine you just create a folder lib in your uh, project like just right click new uh, go for folder and create a folder as lib whatever okay and then what libraries you have to add here so you have to add all Hadoop libraries so that so Hadoop libraries will be within your Hadoop uh, folder so you have to untar this Hadoop folder and then you can copy all the libraries and then you can paste it in the lib folder that is point number one and second you have to copy all the hive libraries so just go to hive folder and then uh, I, I will show you just list you will see a folder lib here so you have to I will just change my directory to lib 
ls hyphen lstr so you will see lot of jar files you have to add all these jar files and make sure that you are not copying any tar file or zip file or folders you have to exclude that so with if you copy all the jar files with some other format of uh, files other than jar then you will be getting an error okay in your project so make sure you are copying only the jar file so in between you will see some pom files and tar, tar files also please exclude it so copy all these jar files and paste it in the lib folder so you have to copy hadoop jar files and then hive jar file so once that is done right click your project go to properties and then java build path and choose library tab here and then add jars and expand this project map reduce and then you will see lib folder expand this and then select all the jar files uh, you are not seeing the jar files because i have already done the build path that's why you are not able to see but you will be seeing all the jar files whatever you have added in the lib folder just select all the jar files from top to bottom and then click okay and finish if you see here see the palm file got added the, i haven't added it i have excluded it that's why it is showing here so if you have while copying itself please remove all these extra files just copy only only the jar files okay so i've just copied so just click okay and then here okay so that you will see all the jar files got added here in the libraries okay so then you will not see any errors if you still see errors in the import statement and in the code then your dependency uh, addi uh, addition with respect to the code was not properly done okay now i will explain you the code so i have uh, whatever the imports required i have and then i created a class as hive udf extends udf so this udf is a base class the source class which i have to extend and then i am creating an object for test uh, data type uh, which is string but in map reduce and hive we use text right so text uh, result equal to new text and then i am creating a method so this is one udf so i have written two udf within this class so one udf so this is to convert uh, uppercase so you can ask me uppercase is already there in hive right yeah it's there but just i want i'm, I'm just showing you how to do the udf uh, with step by step but the logic can be anything you can even rewrite some other new logics as well okay and then i have one more uh, udf in which like i used to pass two columns to my function and these two columns will be get concordinated and with the delimiter of hyphen so you can even ask me the question this can be done with the select query itself right yeah so i'm, I'm repeating again so i'm just trying to explain you how to implement the udf and how to execute it but the logic whatever it's completely depends on you you have to uh, uh, rewrite the, remove this and have your own logic so uh, i have written some logics of custom hashing algorithms so that is something i have done and also like uh, converting the time date function the time date into a newer format which is not there in hive function or you can't do with select query so such use cases i have written and uh, uh, the code i have written so this is just to make uh, things simple i am going with this very uh, small example okay so i don't want you to confuse by showing all those uh, hashing codes or something like that so these logics are very simple for you to grab easily so that you will feel okay udf is something good so udf is something really needed so you don't uh, think like okay we can do everything with hive predefined function no it's not like that udf is compulsory you go for any project and check uh, whether they are using udf yes of course they will use and not only in hive even in spark also we have written several udfs and i will show you uh, in my upcoming video how to do the same with spark as well okay fine so uh, i will explain you what i have written with the uppercase thing so i have created an uh, evaluate function so this function name should be same so you have to use always the evaluate function only don't give your own function name just always go with evaluate function the return type is text and here i am passing only one argument and if the name what i am giving is equal to null and it has to return null so that is completely fine i am doing a, a null check and i am returning the null if the value of the column is null and then i am i am just creating a simple function that is string res equal to name dot the the name what i'm giving here to string to uppercase that's it and then i'm passing this uh, result to the text object whatever i created result and then i'm returning the result that's it so simple and then the second udf as i told you already i'm concatenating like if you see this evaluate function uh, accepts two argument that is two columns and here uh, integer dot two string id column iphone name column so that is something like two columns if i give as an input for the function it has to concatenate these two column with iphone as a delimiter okay and then i'm returning the result now you have to create the jar file for this so right click export and choose jar next and then you have to give the jar path and then click finish that's it your jar will be get created so if you see here my jar is get created in this folder in desktop under jar folder i have this udf
that's it so once this is done you can uh, you have to uh, follow few more steps to add this jar file with your hive and then you have to uh, run your own function so uh, here if you see i i'm 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 running my hive hive thing and hadoop cluster sorry hadoop thing and hive and all those things in a remote machine okay so it's an issue uh, it's a cloud ec2 machine so don't worry if uh, so you people uh, used to have within your own uh, means in your machine right so you don't want to follow this extra step what i'm going to do here so i'm using this winsap uh, tool to copy my uh, files from local to my remote machine so this is something you don't want to do uh, if you are cluster and your working machine everything is a same machine means you don't want to do this you can skip this okay fine so i have copied my jar file you can see here so this is my uh, uh, cloud machine and this is uh, in left hand side what you see is my local uh, thing and then I, I can move it just like drag and drop here but it's already there so i will sh i will show you okay so this is my remote machine ls siphon lstr so you can able to see my jar file right okay so now uh, you have to enter into okay let me get the path of my uh, jar file okay it's in home slash ubuntu okay get into hive and then next what you have to do is you have to add your jar in the hive shell okay this way add jar and then full path of your jar and the jar name okay enter so jar is it will it will be get added so just to check whether your if you you can see here the jar got added just to check whether your jar is added or not you can run this command list jar so it is there now what is the next step you have to create a temporary function so i am creating a function create temporary function my function you can give any name because it's your own function right you can give any name as so you have to give your package name dot class names okay what is your package name in the code so i'm sorry okay so if you see here this is my package name org samples dot hive dot training so i have the same in my uh, eclipse org dot samples dot hive dot training and then your class name which is hive udf right so now uh, you have to create this function let let me create this function in my uh, hive okay the function got created now we have to test this function whether it is working as expected or not so select you give your function name and then i'm gonna give the small case because i have two functions right so one function is to convert whatever given uh, con uh, let us to upper case enter so it it will convert yeah it's it, it just got converted to upper case now next so uh, next is like you have one more udf right you have to give two columns and one integer column and then one uh, string column so now this two columns will be get concatenated and it it will have hyphen as a delimiter so that is what my second udf see you can see here as i told you already this can be achieved in select query itself but i am completely showing you how to do udf step by step and how to uh, create your function with the uh, your own jar file and your own function in hive and one more thing very important thing this point you have to remember for sure so whatever the jar that i have added and whatever the function that you have created it's temporary so once you come out from the hive shell your function the jar file what you have added will not be there so very important whenever you enter into this hive shell you have to add and most important thing is if you are um, if you are if you are uh, select queries or in a file imagine in real time it will be like that only right so you will have all the insert and select query in a sql file dot hql or dot sql file and you will run this file in the production right so you have some select query with your own udf and very important uh, whatever the file whatever the file has that select query should also have this add jar and create temporary function make sure that you add these two lines along with your hql file because the whenever the file get executed this jar file and temporary function will be get created and then your select queries in the select query whatever the custom function that you use will work imagine you are not adding this but you are using uh, your function in the select query and that select query is in a hql file and when you run this hql file in the production it won't work because you haven't added these two in your uh, script file means in your hql file make sure wherever you the, the function that you are using as a file or as a command as a sql queries add these two lines part of it okay so don't forget that okay so that's all with respect to the session so uh, apache spark it's so in big data so we have so many solutions for the data problems so familiar very familiar solutions like you might have heard about hadoop or you are already experienced with hadoop so similar to that we have something called spark okay so spark is also a data processing framework and that comes under big data so what is the uh, prerequisite for me to jump into spark so that is the very first thing we have to see so prerequisite with respect to spark 
So you need to be aware of some of the Hadoop components. For example, HDFS, MapReduce. MapReduce very basics is fine, but HDFS, uh, the, the complete stuff of HDFS you are supposed to know. And then Hive. Okay, so these three components are uh, like very important for you to learn before you start Spark. So I will tell you uh, the reason. So why Spark is uh, sorry Hadoop uh, these three components is required as a prerequisite for me to learn Spark. See Hadoop and Spark are two uh, frameworks, two solutions for data problems. And you may ask me like why should I have to learn Hadoop? and then Spark. Directly I can learn Spark, right? Okay, so they are two different components and uh, there is no mandatory dependency should be get created. There is no such thing. They can be installed separately. You can work on these two components completely in an in a independent way. But in the real time, uh, the, the, the dependency has been created. So Spark and Hadoop are tightly coupled in the real time. But just to just for learning purpose, yeah, you can go ahead and learn just Spark without having Hadoop knowledge. But in real time, as I said, it is tightly coupled. So on this point, I will explain more in upcoming, uh, uh, in the same video in upcoming topics. Okay. So this is the first thing. You may ask me like why uh, in Hadoop we have so many other components, right? Like Scoop, Uzi, HBase and Ambari. So you haven't added that in the list. So those things are not required for you to learn Spark. Okay, they are optional, but these th three things is mandatory for you to learn before you start Spark. And next, with respect to Spark, so you have to be very good in any one programming language. Uh, it could be like Java or Scala or Python. Okay, so Spark supports these three languages. So you can be like you, if you are very new to programming language, then just pick any one of these language and you you have to brush up the basics and the core concepts. That would be fine. And then um, Linux. So Linux is very much important uh, for any big data frameworks you go. And even programming languages also like even I have a video called Hadoop framework, which was my previous video. I have explained uh, like what what what. Uh, programming languages and what are all the stuff uh, as a prerequisite for the entire big data framework. So Linux is very much important and any one programming language and SQL. So SQL SQL knowledge is also required. So not very core or depth. So basics is very much enough like DML, DCL and DL, DDL commands are very much enough. And before all these, so before these two prerequisites, you, you need to be you need to be very clear on what is the problem big data is all about and how we are giving solution and uh, what are all the data components we do have under big data and how this big data came into picture. So the entire uh, history and uh, use uh, the need and uh, things about big data you need to know. So I have a video called what is big data. It's like almost uh, 40 minutes video. I recommend you to watch that video first. So that is going to be the very first video of my big data playlist, which we call it as big data demo or what is big data, whatever you can you can call it as. So that will be my first video. Just please have a look on what exactly big data. And then I have uh, uh, the prerequisite I'm just uh, explaining you here, like Hadoop stuffs and then and these uh, Hadoop stuff and then programming language Linux and SQL. So, uh, so once you are very good on these prerequisite, you are good to start with Spark. Okay, and I've just I'm still I haven't answered you that in real time how Spark is tightly coupled with Hadoop. Okay, so that question I will answer you in some time. So if you uh, take Spark, so we need to know what what are all the components we do have in the Spark framework. So if you if you see in Hadoop framework, there is a diagram, right? HDFS, Map, Produce, Hive, Pig, Scoop, Uzi, so something like that. In Spark also we have a framework diagram. So I will explain you that. The very first thing is Spark. Okay, so this is your engine in Spark framework. This is your engine. The remaining components got uh, means which got built on top of the Spark Spark SQL. So Spark SQL that it's like a, a, a SQL query engine, uh, but uh, it's it's not exactly like Hive, but it's a SQL query engine. Uh, through which there is some uh, very good structured APIs are provided so that your data can be in you can have a structured uh, uh, name value pairs. So the, the more the more into Spark SQL, I'll be explaining you in the upcoming videos. It's like it's like you are you are you are just writing a program 
and your data will be in the format of you can give names column names for your data in the program itself and then you can able to uh, uh, do any kind of transmission in very easy way not like 100 200 lines of code it will be very less you can do any kind of transformation in just two to three lines you can do so that way of rich apis was provided by spark sql and spark sql is also used to, to connect hive in hadoop so you can read the data from hive and you can do all the transformation via spark sql so uh, spark sql is again used to connect with hive to retrieve the data from hive and run it on top of spark so this point i will explain you later and then you have something called spark streaming spark streaming okay so if you take uh, uh, like spark uh, it, it's it's completely a data processing framework so in data processing you have two types of data processing batch processing and stream processing so batch processing means your input is already stored in a file or in a database on top of which you are doing some kind of an processing and you are getting the output so this is called a batch processing okay so i'm giving an uh, uh, a quick one liner description of what is batch and stream processing but if you want to have a detailed uh, 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 content about these two then i have a video link in the description box batch process versus stream process you can watch that video but i will be telling you here so batch processing is something the data is already there and you are doing a processing and the stream processing is something like the data is coming in live that means it's not get stored anywhere in in, in a storage system your data is it's coming in live from the application and and you are processing the data in the live itself and then you are giving the output for example i'm i'm just going to a supermarket and i'm just swipe my uh, debit card in the swipe machine so immediately i'm in getting an sms saying that your transaction has been done and this much amount has been debited so that means uh, the, the time when i swipe my card immediately the data is going in live in the bank side it's getting processed in live and then i'm getting the output and then only my transaction details are getting stored right so here the stream processing will not wait for uh, i will wait until some 10 to 20 records comes uh, into my picture so it's not like that so any transaction that happens whether it's one transaction at a time or 10 transaction at a time it will immediately process it won't wait saying that at least 10 to 20 members has to swipe their card at the same time and then only i can process no it's not in that case so in batch processing data will be get stored first and then you will do process so in stream processing so in live you will be doing the process and then only your data will be get stored okay so spark supports both batch processing and stream processing so in a single framework you can do both the things but if you take before spark hadoop hadoop is doing hadoop is only for batch processing you can't do stream processing in hadoop so before storm um, sorry spark entered into picture there was a technology called storm so storm is used for stream processing and hadoop is used for batch processing where whereas in spark we can able to do both so whereas if you go for storm it's only for streaming there is no batch processing and in hadoop only batch there is no stream processing but spark we can do both and then next so there is a component called mlib in your spark which is for machine learning libraries where you can do all machine learning activities and there is something called graphics so this is a graph related data store where you can uh, 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 write the apis gives you an uh, very easier way to do any kind of graph uh, related data processing like if you go for linkedin and facebook you will see mutual connections and mutual friends the person a is also interested on the the thing uh, there is a there is a relationship you are finding the interest between the persons right the person a uh, this is a person who knows by a also knows by b so there is a relationship is building in the graph format the nodes it just vertex kind of stuff so this is especially created for such use cases so as a data engineer especially as a big data engineer so as a big data engineer so we need to be very good in this three components only so mlib and graphics is highly optional for data engineers to learn so these three are very important for the data engineers should know and especially big data engineers and the priority goes like this so priority spark batch spark sql and then spark streaming 
okay so spark streaming a comparative if, if you compare spark sql and spark compared to these two the spark streaming is used very less okay it's there but compared to this spark streaming will be very less but the priority of your uh, uh, learning uh, learning the roadmap will be like this you have to learn spark badge and then spark sql and then you can go for spark streaming or once you complete spark badge directly you can go for spark streaming also if you have a, a requirement to learn fast means you don't have spark sql in your project but you have spark streaming then you can go ahead with spark streaming after learning spark batch so it's not like you have to go only through spark sql so it's not like that okay fine so here i have just given you the one liner description of uh, these but these three components spark batch spark sql and spark streaming so we'll be seeing more detail in upcoming video okay so now i'll go for the next one okay so uh, now like if you see in in the spark right so i will just uh, have the framework diagram once again so spark sql and then spark streaming mlib and then graphics okay so uh, categorize these components into data layers okay so data layers means if you go for any data projects there will be some different data layers right so data storage uh, like data storage data processing uh, data scheduler so data visualization and then data testing so you'll be having data pipeline data pipeline uh, is something uh, used to transfer the data from one place to another place so we have these many varieties in the data projects right so any data projects you go uh, as a very uh, basic stuff what we need is we need a storage layer and we need a processing layer and we need a pipeline layer which used to transfer the data from one place to another and we need a visualization layer in some project we will not have visualization but we do have processing and storage for sure we used to have so any framework that you learn uh, that you are going to learn in big data make sure uh, th there is one step that you have to do is categorize the components what you see in the framework whatever you are learning into these layers we have to do a categorization just just for uh, our own uh, understanding and for learning purpose and this will help you to give an solution when there is a problem comes into picture so if you take storage so we don't have a storage uh, part right so there is no storage part in spark so if you take spark and spark sql spark streaming they are completely into processing data processing and mlib is also into data processing but it comes under analytics and graphics is also for data processing so on the whole the entire spark is comes under only data processing but if you take hadoop right so we do have hdfs hbase hive uh, and pig and then Uzi, um, uh, Flume, uh, like we do have uh, Zookeeper, MapReduce, etc. So if you if you if people comes from a, a big Hadoop framework, so that is that will be the very first framework that people used to uh, work and people used to learn. So when people come from the Hadoop framework, they they will be having a mindset like this. I will tell you what what what's the mindset. See if you take Hadoop, HDFS and HBase is for storage. So in Hadoop we do have storage and Hive, Pig and MapReduce for data processing. So Hadoop comes under data processing and Uzi is for scheduler. Yeah, we do have scheduler here and Flume and scoop is used to retrieve the data from one place to another place from then some different technology to Hadoop so for migrating the data we use flume and scoop so this comes under data pipeline so that means if you see like Hadoop is covering more than four data layers so people used to think all Hadoop uh, all big data frameworks also covers these many uh, layers but that is not the true fact see each framework like Hadoop Hadoop and the Hadoop frameworks has been developed by different people and different group of community and different companies and different individuals so Hive was contributed by Facebook Pig was contributed by Yahoo uh, HDFS and MapReduce was invented by Duck Cutting who is father of Hadoop so this things are all invented by different people and if you see Spark again invented by a different set of community members so it's not like uh, like Hadoop has all the layers and Spark should also have all the 
other airs by default no it's not like that so that's a different framework and this is a different framework and something like that we have some other framework as well in the market that also in big data if take strom so strom comes under only data processing again strom doesn't have its own storage or its own query processing and all it's it's it just a framework and that do only data processing so your mindset has to be in that way so it's like all the framework will not comes under all the data layers so you have to first of all have that in your mind fine so now the question comes so that means in spark how can i store the data or in spark how can i schedule the stuff or in spark like how can i migrate the data from one, one place to another place so you will be having these many questions so i'll give answer for those questions so uh, if you take first data storage okay so spark by default the framework doesn't support any storage but still you can integrate some of the other storage technologies with your spark so that is possible so when you take storage two important things database and then file system so database it's it's, it's a db and uh, file system is all about like uh, you have file system right in your windows the windows file system name is ntfs new technology file system and the linux file system name is ext in mac we use mac file system so these file systems are called standalone file system and in file system we have distributed file system so in file system you have two types so standalone file system and then distributed file system so standalone file system example windows file system ext uh, mac file system etc distributed file system so hdfs yeah we already aware of hdfs so i add hdfs and in amazon there is a, a object store called s3 like hdfs in aws they use s3 so i can add s3 also or any other distributed file systems and in database two types so rdbms and then no sequels no sequels or the modern database in big data world db is all a, when you say db it's a no sequel okay rdbms is the old one so rdbms like oracle mysql db2 etc no sequels like the top 3 no sequels in big data hbase hbase is a no sequel that comes with your hadoop right and there is a database called cassandra mongodb so cassandra and mongodb are two uh, like independent products so they are not uh, tightly coupled with hadoop uh, but still you want to integrate with hadoop also yeah you can do so if you see data storage in db spark can be connected with any rdbms and spark can be connected with any nosql database and spark can run on top of standalone file system as well and distributed file system as well so if you take spark right so spark uh, is something like uh, 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 it runs on hdfs it runs on uh, s3 so sp the data will be get distributed if the data gets stored in a distributed file system so you have 10 windows machine and you you are trying to store one gb data in very first windows machine it will not be get distributed right even though they are created as a cluster still the nature of file system in windows will not distribute the data so, but if you take hdfs or s3 if there is a 10 s3 machine or 10 s3 hd sorry a 10 hdfs machine if whereas in one node you load some 1 gb data the data will be get distributed across the nodes and on top of which you write some spark program will be get distributed so you can ask a question here in that case when i run spark on top of windows you are saying like spark can sit on top of windows linux directly without any distributed file system how come spark will do a distributed processing so spark has a talent even though it runs on a standalone file system still spark can able to read the data from the standalone file system and then it will it will distribute the data in the memory and then it will do the processing okay so that is where we call it as in memory processing spark supports in memory processing okay but uh, but i will tell you that later so spark in memory i will tell you that part later so here storage part uh, we have completed so spark supports all a uh, type of storage so now i am going to explain you the other data layers how spark is giving support on scheduler or pipeline so that part i will be explaining you and uh, and now i am going to explain you one more thing like how spark is uh, tightly coupled or is there a possibility to integrate spark with hadoop framework and if so why we are doing doing that so i will tell you that so for that i need to give you the diagrams of the framework diagrams of both the, uh, the spark and uh, hdf hadoop so first let me uh, have the hadoop framework diagram so hdfs map reduce and hive pick scoop uzi 
and flu mahout hbase so we do have few more components but these are the uh, 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 kind of a solid uh, components which we do have and we call this as hadoop framework yeah as i told you we have few more components as well so let me put some dot like this so but this can this is considered to be an uh, a complete hadoop framework as a base and now let me go for spark here spark and uh, spark sql and spark streaming mlib and then graphics okay now if you see here uh, I, i will tell you some kind of an a kind of an a real quick story here see uh, when hadoop was there and people migrated their existing uh, technology the data from the existing technology to hadoop and they were enjoying the performance of uh, the data processing and storage and everything and within a year or two like spark entered into picture after hadoop and then like uh, companies started uh, uh, explaining to the client saying that spark is 10x faster than hadoop so we can migrate the things from hadoop to spark so that uh, we can have more performance but initially client was not uh, that much uh, okay to migrate immediately the reason is uh, that the generation gap between hadoop and spark is very less it's just an uh, year like one year or two year within that we got a new technology so clients were saying like so just now we migrated everything to hadoop and the performance what i'm seeing is really good then why should i have to migrate to spark and the companies have explained that it is 10x faster will be getting more uh, cost savings and then the performance will be really high the 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 downtime is less some blah blah things they have explained it's a proven one but still they have explained and and the client have asked one question okay so i accept everything i agree spark is faster everything is fine but here the problem here what client was raised to as is see we do currently we have written all our programs and the and the job data processing programs and hive pig and some in map reduce right so that means do i need to uh, convert all these hive scripts prick scripts and the java code of map reduce to something else in spark or directly hive scripts will work on spark or directly pig will work on spark so the question they have asked so initially when spark entered into picture so uh, the the companies have said like no you can't uh, directly run hive scripts on spark you can't directly run pig on top of spark so you have to convert uh, to the logics into some new language what spark Spark supports new syntax. So then client said, "No, we can't do it." Then so just now why created everything to Hadoop. So now you want me to convert it to Spark, and again I have to hire some new resource, or I have to make my existing resource to learn what to Spark, the new syntax, new programs. So that that will take again one or two years to, to migrate from Hadoop to Spark. So it's it's not that much gonna be the easy the easiest part. So they are not agree to migrate it to Spark. So this made the Spark contributors like. like the sad thing right so the spark contributors they can't able to sell their product in the market the reason is even though it's faster than hadoop uh, the 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 need is not required as of now see imagine spark has entered into picture after 10 years after hadoop then people will consider even though it has new syntax migration everything is okay but it's just one or two years spark entered into picture and you want me to migrate everything to a new syntax and new coding from hadoop then it's not going to be the good part because i am enjoying the performance in hadoop itself so this made the the hadoop spark contributors they couldn't sell the product so what they have done is so they have just seen what are all the components they are using lot for data processing in hadoop so spark has enabled the connectivity to hive pig scoop uzi flume mahout hbase and everything even hdfs so that means now spark can integrate with all the components in your hadoop okay and that means what is i means uh, in in hadoop component which particular part is replacement of spark okay so this map produce is like the spark is replacement of map produce so now initially map produce was the only engine in hadoop now spark is another another engine so all these component initially were running on top of map produce engine now these components will run on top of spark engine simple so you don't want to uh, convert your existing hive or pig scripts to the new syntax uh, it can run as is on top of spark but maybe for the new requirement you can start doing some coding with spark or directly you can again write hive queries also that's fine it will run on top of spark 
so uh, why i'm coming uh, means i i have two things about um, uh, the topic what i explained you is, is for two things one is uh, uh, we need to know what are all the components that you can integrate uh, in the hadoop components that you can integrate with spark okay and we need to know what is the replacement of uh, uh, in hadoop which part can replace spark or spark is replacement of which particular component in hadoop yeah so we uh, we come to know that map reduce can be replaced by spark now the next thing is uh, like few uh, years back from now uh, one of my friend like he told me that i am working in spark and hadoop is dead completely hadoop is dead so spark is everything hereafter so then i asked him a question can you explain me the tech stack that whatever you are using in your spark project so my question was what is the storage layer he said hdfs so what so the data is coming from the source right so what is your source he said rdbms okay which tool you are using to bring the data from rdbms to your spark so he said hdfs is used as a storage layer and i bring the data from rdbms to hdfs via scoop scoop is a component which we have in hadoop which will migrate the data from rdbms to hadoop and hadoop to rdbms so he said scoop then what is the scheduler that you are using he said uzi uzi is again the scheduler part of hadoop then he said the no sql database is such base so then i asked him a question so you said you are working on spark project but when i ask for the text stack so far you haven't said spark you are saying hdf scoop uzi uh, you are saying uh, like all the hadoop components and then finally you are saying that your engine is spark and then that's called a spark project so in that case how come spark, hadoop is dead so you use all the component of hadoop in your spark project and then you say hadoop is dead so the statement is wrong so he sh he should say in this way map reduce is dead or map reduce went for the corner where spark replaced it so that is a correct statement so hadoop is not dead when you say hadoop the whole thing is what hadoop okay hadoop framework so the whole thing is hadoop framework so still people in in the real time so this is how the dependency got created so the very first question i raised right so i can learn spark directly why should i have to learn hadoop so this is the answer so for learning perspective there is no dependency you can learn spark just like that from the day one without learning hadoop but the in in real time hadoop and spark were tightly coupled okay so you can see uh, hadoop projects in real time Uh, the statement is important uh, just please listen in real time you can see any uh, big data projects without spark you can see only hadoop you will see such projects but you will never see spark projects or spark infrastructure or a spark cluster without hadoop you will not see okay so in, the, in, in any any cluster you go any infrastructure any uh, cluster setups you go hadoop will be installed first and then on top of it they will install spark so hadoop and spark by default that comes with your cluster and the dependency got created that that they are tightly coupled the reason is for spark the underlying storage people always use hdfs and that means you are using hadoop system right so on top of it we have hadoop and uh, sorry spark and which like spark reads the data from hdfs hadoop and then it will do the processing so as i told you you cannot see only spark without hadoop in the real time but you can see in reverse there will be a project still going on only hadoop without spark that you can see but you cannot see that other way so this way the real time in real time the the dependency has been created uh, so you uh, that gives that that is why i am saying that you need to know at least hdfs map reduce and hive before learning spark okay so now we are discussing all about the integrations so spark can be connected with hadoop for 100% with all the components but not with map reduce because spark is a replacement of map reduce so there is no need or use cases to connect map reduce and spark not, it's not required at all so now spark and in future some other system can come and sit in the engine so hadoop turned as a platform it incorporates all other engines into hadoop and that way hadoop has been got mutated okay and how about integrating spark with any other big data technologies other than hadoop so in big data you have 10000 plus technologies even in the hadoop framework video i told all big data framework not only hadoop not only spark if you go for any big data frameworks one big data framework can connect with another big data framework for sure 100% okay so spark can be connected to any big data components like any no sql database or any data pipelines like flume scoop kafka or any other uh, cluster manager like uh, uh, zookeeper or any other systems it can be connected for sure 
Now integration outside big data. How about Spark can connect with some other technology outside big data. So most of the technologies existing demanded existing technologies traditional demanding technologies like any RDBMS you can connect with Spark. Any ETL tools like Informatica or Abinatio you can still able to connect or any visualization tools like Tableau, ClickView, MicroStrategy you can connect and even you can connect uh, spark with any AWS uh, components and Google Cloud components and Azure components you can able to connect for sure. So uh, like I can say uh, Spark or Hadoop can be connected with the existing technologies that's outside the world of big data. 90 to 95 percentage of technologies can be connected any mainframe technologies testing technologies it can be connected but more uh, specific to the component if you ask me if i'm not aware i have to check and i have to research and then only i can able to say but if you ask me the question like how about spark and hadoop can connect with any other big data technology i can say 100 percent blindly i can say yes it is possible you can connect with any big data technologies okay so the integration part we have discussed and like we have discussed hadoop framework diagram and the integration and the layers okay now we can move on to like into spark like slowly right so now the very first question so what is spark so i already explained you spark is a data processing technology which uh, which will do both uh, batch processing stream processing and also for analytics right so next what programming language does spark support so spark supports three programming languages java so scala is very first priority goes to scala java and then python and for analytics we use r okay so scala java python they are like uh, people are using evenly like these three languages scala java and python is like used uh, very very uh, like 50 50 percentage it used so it's not like scala is used a lot and java is very less and python is overused and it's not like that so people across the projects if you see like 10 spark project of out of which three project will be in java three will be in python and four will be in scala so it will be like that actually so if you are going to learn spark you have to pick any one language you can go ahead with scala or java or python anything is fine so so the language which you are trying to means which you feel which is very easy you can pick that and you can start learning and one more important thing is when you start uh, looking for job change and in the job description you will see like we need spark with java developer and spark with scala developer spark with python developer so uh, the some people used to understand this wrongly and they will not not attend the interview so imagine I'm 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 spark with Scala developer initially so that means I, I'm just seeing a JD in which they have given spark with Python so I'm, I'm thinking so I've, I've been in spark for three years or four years I worked with Scala only but uh, uh, the the next I means the company to which I'm going for an interview they said we need spark with Python so that means it's not like you should not get panic or something like that I've seen some people will 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 say like I'm not interested the reason is they're asking for spark with Python but I'm aware of spark with Scala so don't do that mistake please attend the interview so you are not going for a Python developer you are going for spark developer and the the they are asking for python with spark so you already aware of scala with spark is completely fine okay just go to the interview and just say like you have been done in scala but you can still code in python and with spark see the syntax wise if you see in spark all these three languages will have similar syntaxes only okay so uh, when it comes to spark syntaxes in this three language the syntaxes will be very similar it will be very easy and especially scala and python the programming way you see it will be more similar actually so don't do that okay people are doing that repeatedly i'm i'm i'm, I'm trying to uh, convince them by saying this don't do that see you are agenda is your aim is to be a spark developer Sp whether you use spark with java spark with scala spark with python is completely fine just attend the interview okay so the next thing is uh, the the general prerequisite of spark as i told you you need to know linux you need to know sql and then any one programming language as i told you right and then the next thing uh, like uh, daemon process in spark 
daemon process is background process so you are installing spark uh, so once you install spark in linux or windows when you install just a spark so what are all the background process will be there so uh, when you when you uh, when we say in, if you install any big data framework in your machine so there will be some background process running which will be the backbone and that will uh, actually uh, controls your entire cluster whether it's single node or multi node it will control the entire cluster so you might have heard about name node data node uh, job tracker uh, resource manager node manager allies uh, uh, task tracker in your hadoop right so similar to that we have daemon process in spark so there is two daemon process in spark master and then worker so when you install only spark and then when you check for the process you will see master and worker but an upcoming video i have a i will explain you the installation of spark and then i will show you all this process so daemon process which is called the background process and the deployment mode deployment modes so spark can be deployed in uh, uh, three may, may in major three types so standalone cluster or standalone and then so standalone so what is mean by standalone so people will think standalone means installing spark in single node no that is wrong so installing just only the spark in single node or multi node but you are installing only spark so that is called standalone in single node or standalone cluster okay so only spark you can ask me we are going to install only spark right so then why you are calling it a standalone you can call it a spark node or spark cluster no so uh, we can install spark with hadoop also okay so there is a different so installing only spark is different and installing spark with hadoop is different so when you install only spark in your entire cluster there is one technology stack called spark and that only running in your cluster means it is standalone whether it is single node or multi node doesn't matter standalone means installing the spark only with multi node or single node so installing uh, spark with hadoop is called yarn mode of deployment so in hadoop there is one more component called yarn which allows uh, having more than one engine on top of your hadoop so mapreduce was the only engine initially and uh, hadoop will not support any other engine on top of hadoop other than mapreduce so in hadoop then they have introduced something called yarn yet another resource negotiator which will allow other engines like mapreduce like i told you i showed you in the previous diagram right like mapreduce there is spark and tomorrow there there can be one more engine can come and sit on top of your hadoop so that was allowed by this yarn. On. so if i am i am developing a new engine and i want uh, this engine to be deployed on top of hadoop then i have to integrate i have to write a source code to integrate that with yarn as a I means as the creator of the framework i have to do that okay so when you install spark with hadoop it's gone uh, it's called yarn uh, deployment so when in, in an interview they if they call you I means if they ask you right uh, have you done spark yarn deployment that means they are asking whether you have installed spark with hadoop or just spark only just spark means standalone but in real time there is no standalone it's completely yarn uh, i mean that means spark installed on top of hadoop yarn mode of deployment only and there is one more called uh, mesos so this is not this is not that much used in the real time but still uh, similar to yarn there is something called a mesos yarn and mesos are like cluster managers okay so mesos is not part of hadoop it's not part of spark it's a different cluster manager uh, so it can be used in mesos uh, cluster manager as well so we have discussed about uh, deployment mode now the important thing about uh, spark is in memory computation what is in memory so in memory means so you have um, ram so ram is called memory right so in your machine you have hard disk cache and ram so the recently accessed records and files will be stored in the cache so that whenever you try to open it again it will be very faster right so that means so the data in memory will be very faster for your processing read and all but the data that comes from disk will take time so in memory processing is all about the data will be get distributed in the memory of spark in each node in the ram and then the processing will happen but the in memory data processing in detail I I'll explain you later but in memory is one of the biggest advantage like why spark is faster than hadoop because in memory processing map reduce supports in memory but but it's it's not very much big extent actually so that's why in hadoop we can't use in memory processing with map reduce okay it, it supports there is a concept which supports in map reduce called a distributed cache but but it's not that much efficient as we think like how we have in spark okay so and then like uh, next point 
so spark repel so what is repel read evaluate print loop repel is all about uh, having a, a, a command line uh, shell do uh, ta for for the testing for example i can i can tell you in this way in command prompt if you just type python enter you will get a python shell right and in mysql when you type mysql in command prompt you will be getting mysql shell so this shell is called repel read evaluate print loop so we are not aware of what is repel but but we are using it in our daily life right so when you whenever any technology you use the shell then that technology supports repel so oracle has a repel python has a repel scala has a repel java from 1.9 it has a repel so repel is used for testing the piece of line of code rather than writing the complete code in ides like intellij or eclipse and building that as a jar file so just for testing the piece of code why should i have to deploy write a whole project and convert that as a jar file and run it in the cluster so i have to do all this stuff so repel is widely used for testing purpose right so in python also you use repel first to test the logic and then you will deploy that as a script or a file right similar to that spark supports repel so spark has two repel the first repel is spark shell so spark shell is all about it it invokes scala internally and there is one more repel for python called pyspark so if you enter pyspark it will go for python shell for spark and if you enter spark shell it gets into scala shell for spark okay so there is no uh, shell for java in spark only two repel pyspark and spark shell so but java as a code you can write it as a, 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 a file and you can build it as a jar that is supported in spark but just for a shell it provides only two repel spark shell and pyspark and this we call it as a repel okay so the next point eight okay so uh, three important apis that spark has so uh, all your uh, programming syntax uh, will come under these three apis so it means either you start with scala or java or python so for example you pick java or scala or python so your syntax and the way of code will be uh, comes under these three important apis so the apis are rdd data frames and data set so on the whole these three are uh, and, and um, these three concepts are like it's distributed and uh, uh, fault tolerant so what these three apis will do it will distribute your, your, your the, the code what you are writing will come under any one of these three so that means these three on the whole what it will do it will process your data in in distributed way and then it will uh, uh, process your data on a parallel mode and the fault tolerance will be provided for your data so all these three uh, uh, APIs, the basic characteristic is this. And apart from that, RDD will be like you have to be more code specific. And whereas in data frame, uh, the for your data, you can give a structure in the coding like column names and rows and columns. You can give it in that way. And the syntaxes will be very easy. And then the data set is an extension of data frame. And data frame is an extension of RDD with added new components. It's like generation 1, generation 2, generation 3. So that way it will be but as a detailed explanation i will be giving you in upcoming videos so i'll make a separate video for rdd data frame and data set alone okay so on the whole your coding syntaxes will be get categorized into these three apis only next so uh, transformations and actions so uh, uh, all your uh, programs that the coding whatever you are writing you pick scala and you use data frame or data set or rdd so then your your programs the syntaxes will be categorized into two okay so first you have to start with the coding you choose one language and you choose one api and uh, uh, and within that api there is one more categorization of your syntax transformation and actions so transformations means anything that you transform the data for example map is a transformation and you are you want to do a group by is a transformation and then you have to do a short and then you have to do a filter etc so all these are transformations so action so you want to do some count operation or you want to show the output or you have to save the file um, 
save as text file etc so these are some keywords that you will be seeing in your spark so uh, how can i differentiate these syntaxes or transformation and these are in action that is based on the experience you will get but by seeing the name you can able to say this these all transformation so show is not a transformation it's an it's an action right but shard and group is a transformation it's it's not the action right so uh, this transformation and action is how your codings will be get categorized into okay and based on the transformation and action i want to tell you one more important thing lazy evaluation what is lazy evaluation okay now imagine you are writing some 100 lines of code okay so i'm i'm doing map and then output of map on top of it i'm applying and filter and on top of it i'm applying and group operation and on top of it i'm applying and short operation etc it's going in this way okay now and finally you are not doing anything and the last operation will be like uh, again you are doing group and then that's all your code is completed you are trying to run this code so you have done a map filter group short etc and then like 99 line of your code is transformation but but what is the use of it finally you are not getting any output you are not printing you are, you are not doing any print statement or show statement or save as file state nothing you are doing nothing only you are doing transformation so spark executes all these and finally comes to know you are not performing any action so then what is so spark will ask you a spark compiler will ask you so then why i have compiled all this i have just spent my entire resource from the uh, cluster i utilized ram i utilized cpu and finally there is nothing for me to uh, perform the as an action i did all the transformation but what is the use of it right so that means uh, spark started working uh, something called lazy evaluation that means at end you have to call an action so it could be count or show or any other actions so imagine i am giving save as text file so when you compile this code spark will not see all these first spark will first see is there an action in your uh, code so once it finds the action only the compilation will start from bottom to top and that is where we call it as lazy evaluation that means some people used to do only transformation just for testing purpose but without uh, performing the action and that means spark will say like why should i have to spend my time when there is no action why should i have to run only the transformation what is the use so spark will do lazy evaluation only when it finds the uh, uh, action then only the compilation will get start so the bottom to top approach is what we call it as a lazy evaluation so you have to have some action and then only your transformation will be get started so that is we call it as a spark lazy evaluation so whatever we have discussed so far so i will just give you an overview like we discussed spark framework uh, diagram and then spark integrations and data layers and spark integrations with hadoop and spark integrations with outside the world of uh, uh, big data and then what is spark and we discussed about in memory and we discussed about demons in spark and we discussed about spark repl and then uh, deployment modes and the three apis rdd data frame and data set and transformation and action and lazy evaluation so for this particular introduction video whatever we have discussed is very wide enough so in upcoming videos i'll be uh, uh, i'll be entering more uh, deeper into the architecture and the practical the installation and everything so this will be your complete introduction video about spark so this will be wide enough how to install apache spark on linux in standalone mode so uh, the flavor of in a, uh, apache spark means the flavor of spark which i'm going to install and show you today is apache so you can just go to google and search for apache spark download that will take you to uh, spark.apache.org the first link when you search you will get this so you can download any recent version or recent version minus one you can download and then uh, you can have it in your machine now uh, i'll show you how to uh, install and what are all the prerequisite uh, components need to be get installed before installing spark so everything i'll show you so uh, the very important thing for any big data component we need java so you can install any java uh, uh, greater than 1.7 version greater than or equal to 1.7 so i'm having 8 java 8 here so i have downloaded this and then i have downloaded spark 2.4.6 with hadoop compatibility so today i am going to show you how to install spark on linux in standalone so standalone means uh, people used to think it is single node no single node is different and standalone mode of installation is different standalone means uh, it could be single node or multi node standalone means you are installing only apache spark and you are not installing apache spark on top of any other big data technology so i'm installing only apache spark in three nodes or four nodes or single node that is standalone
okay so standalone single node cluster or standalone multi node cluster you can call it in that way but standalone is not single node i am installing only spark today but in real time spark will be installed on top of hadoop so you will not see just spark in any project uh, in any infrastructure it will be sitting on top of hadoop but today i am going to show you just spark installation in single node and the same can be done in multi node even without hadoop is also fine you can still do it but in my upcoming video i'll show you how to install spark on top of hadoop then you may ask me a question so in real time spark is going to sit on top of hadoop then why we are just doing only spark installation on top of linux directly for uh, running programs and testing and for your spark learning it could be anything it could be on top of hadoop or just a standard or a still file only when i use all the hadoop related components and the uh, uh, resourcing uh, matter means resourcing stuff of hadoop then i need this integration or else i'm just going to do only with spark nothing else uh, like for example i'm not integrating my spark with hive or spark with uh, hdfs then you can go ahead with just a spark so when you are going to integrate with hadoop components then you need spark with hadoop or else you can go ahead just with uh, linux installing spark on top of linux in a single node or multi node is still fine so uh, i have a video uh, prior to this call spark introduction i recommend you to watch that video before you start this installation video fine so uh, now the very first thing you have to un untar this uh, java and spark either you can do with your gui like you can right click and there will be an option like extract here or you can use linux command so in real time you will not have any guis it will be like a remote machine completely a black terminal everything needs to be in commands so as much as possible like you practice with commands it will be very good i recommend you to go in that way so there is a command so i'll give pwd uh, it's my present working directory home slash test test is my username so home slash username is your home okay so i you can see my java tar file is here so to untar this there is a command okay so tar space hyphen eject text vf and the file name okay so uh, i have already uh, un extracted this particular uh, jdk file you can see here there is a folder jdk 1.8.0 underscore 45 when you untar this file this star file you will get a folder like this now the next thing is you have to set this jdk in environmental path so in linux unlike windows there is no option of like next 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 and install so it's all about configuration and setting up in the path so that's that that's what call, we call it as installation in linux so uh, the environmental file similar to windows when you install java or python you used to set the environmental path right so similar to that we have in linux as well and in ubuntu especially the file name is called bash or c if you want to see the file name just give ls with iphone a iphone a is option to see all the hidden files because we used to have some hidden files as well but just ls will not show you that hidden files the files and folders that starts with dot as hidden files and folders so whereas you can see this bash or c is a hidden file so this is a file in which we are going to set the environmental path and variable enter so you have to come to the last line just give shift g is a shortcut in ubuntu for end of the line okay so you can see here so uh, after when you, after you coming to the last line you have to give all your uh, variables and environmental variables and path and the end of the line in bash rc and that is recommended so the content what you see uh, above like these content will differ uh, os to os so don't uh, worry about these content just come to the last line in your bash rc file and then you have to enter means you need this particular line so anything that you install like it could be python or java or hadoop or spark or any no sql database or any other component when you install it please uh, it's a recommended way to set the home path in the bash rc file but java is highly recommended and it's mandatory because when you start spark spark search for java so you have to give the java path in your bash rc file and this is not only for spark even for hadoop and even for any no sql database java is mandatory uh, to set the path in the bash rc file so this is the line java home export java home is a environment environmental variable and equal to the path is called environmental path home slash slash home slash test and then the file name so to get the path you can you can just uh, like windows just right click and go to properties you will see the path and then the file name slash the file name 
now once you've done with this line go to the last line so we need this export path so this line should be uh, always as a last line and any uh, home that you are setting here we need to add it in the path variable so export path equal to dollar java home so this java home i am referring with dollar and then slash bin colon dollar path so so you are going to inst uh, set set the path only for java right so i will remove this hadoop home slash bin okay so you have to give like this so first you have to give export java home this line whatever the whatever your username and whatever the folder name of us after extracting the jdk and once you are done with this next you have to give this line export path dollar java home slash bin colon dollar path so this dollar path should be the last word so i so i have hadoop home and hbase home yeah if you want you can add that as well like uh, after bin colon you can add next hadoop home and then slash bin colon hbase home with the dollar symbol so you can do in that way i will show you you can see here so you can see here so after java home slash bin colon dollar hadoop home slash bin colon dollar path so any home that you have you can set before this dollar path so once you have done this you have to give escape colon wq for save and quit so you don't want to save only quit then escape colon q exclamatory symbol okay so now i am not going to save anything so escape colon q exclamatory and if you want to save it so then you have to give escape colon wq for save and quit so once this is done you have to execute this file whenever you do a changes in bash rc file you have to execute so dot bash rc or you can give there is a command called source space dot bash rc okay so once this is done now you have to untar the uh, spark folder you have to extract this same command tar space hyphen hxvf and then the file name or directly you can do extract here so uh, when you install spark you have to give java home in two places one is in bash rc and one more time you have to uh, add this export java home inside spark configuration folder so uh, in a config file in spark config file now change your directory to spark folder and then ls so you can see a file folder called conf so change your directory to conf ls so you can see a file spark env.sh template so just rename the spark env.sh template to spark env.sh it's very important step instead of renaming it directly you can take a copy like this spark env is environmental file template space spark env.sh so if you do this so it you are taking a copy of uh, spark env.sh template in the name of spark env.sh so finally you need only spark env.sh file now you can open that file it's an environmental file for spark so here you have to set so if you are integrating spark with hadoop or any other technology so you have to mention that home path here also so here i am if you see i'm giving java home export java home slash home slash test and the jdk file name so after just add this and save your file so you can do with gui also uh, directly you can open this conf and then you can rename this file or take a copy of this file and rename to spark env.sh and open this with gedit or text editor or whatever editor that you are seeing in your machine so you can add it here save the file and then close it now uh, once you have done this so what you can do is uh, now in my previous video spark introduction video i have explained that spark has repl repl means spark has shell for you in which developer will use to check one liner or two liner code testing so we don't want to go for uh, ids like eclipse or intellij just to test one line of code creating a project writing the code by creating a scala or java file and then building that as a jar file so that's not required as a developer i will just first test with the shell so shell is for developer testing right so, so any technology that support shell we call it as repl it supports repl repl is nothing but shell so here spark supports two shell scala shell and python shell and spark does not support java shell since spark supports java but spark doesn't support java shell there is no shell for java 
So if you want to go for Scala shell, then you have to execute the command spark and shell. So spark and shell will take you to Scala shell. Okay. And similar to that, you have uh, Python shell as well. I will show you that. Okay. Now bin slash PySpark. So this will take you to Python shell where you can type uh, all uh, Python Spark APIs only the Spark supported Python syntax and this window is for Scala you can see here Spark supported Scala APIs you can type you can test here and here it's all about Python. Okay, and now if you if you noticed one thing I haven't started Spark yet. Okay, so if you see in my previous video, I have I, I've told you that Spark, when you start Spark, there is two services, background services will be get started and that is backbone for your Spark cluster. So either it's a single node or multi node, whenever you start Spark, there will be two demons called master and worker. Okay, so master is like a master and worker is a slave node. Okay, so master will assign the task, slave will execute the task. So, so far we haven't started the uh, Spark, uh, means we haven't started the Spark. So, but shell will still support you, but you can't do the real distributions and all. Only when you start it, the, the, the Spark as a cluster service, then you can do everything. So, here I'm going to, I, I'm, I will show you how to start Spark, but still this particular installation is a single node. I haven't showed you multi-node installation, like one master multiple slave, but I will be doing that later okay in my upcoming videos you can check that videos in my playlist if the video is not there please wait i will be doing i will make a video and upload so now uh, let me open a terminal uh, so uh, i will change my directory to spark and now i will be starting my service so uh, for shell it has bin slash but for to start and stop the script it is available under a folder called sbin and the script name is start and all that as such so when you start this it will start master process and the worker process so if you want to see the process running, what is the name of the process that is running in background, you can use a command called JPS. JPS is not Spark command or Hadoop command. JPS is a Java command, which is called Java process status. So this JPS will list all Java process running in your machine, not only Spark and Hadoop. So even if some Java based program is running or game is running or Java based, uh, like some Eclipse or ID, some IDs are opened. Uh, so it will show you all Java process. So now in my mission like I'm having uh, uh, these many Java process are running so in which you can see worker and then master so this is your spark uh, daemon service so like that in Hadoop you might have heard about name node resource manager data node node manager secondary name node and similarly in hbase you have hmaster and then zookeeper quorum and then region server and similar to that in spark we have worker and master so you can see there is few more uh, Java related process running. So Spark submit. So we are running to shell, right? So so for that we have once uh, like we have Spark submit, and then this JPS itself a Java process. So it is also showing that JPS command as well. And today I'm not showing. I, I'm not gonna show you any programming stuff here. So one final step still we have. So Spark is ready or cluster mode. So now you can write programs in IDE. You can build that as a jar file. You can run it in cluster mode because your master and worker are running and the last one is you have UI for spark so the port number localhost colon 8080 so this is your spark master UI so localhost 8080 is the web port number that you can go ahead and see your spark master UI and it shows there is one worker running which is one slave and this spark UI where you can run all your programs monitor your running programs or killed one or, or, or the fail status success everything and you can see process by process like uh, what, what what level of program got completed what percentage of uh, spark jobs got completed so everything I don't want to explain you in two technical terms and in next video upcoming videos anyway we are going to see all those stuff I will explain you there and uh, you can see uh, the spark uh, master uh, URL 
so spark colon double slash and test virtual environment is my host name uh, and then 7077 is rpc port number of spark so if you take any technology like even in hadoop and spark we have two port numbers one is web port numbers and one is rpc port number web port number is used to monitor the stuff in web and rpc port number is used for process level communication rpc full form remote procedure call so for example i want to write a program in spark so in in when you write a program in your spark you have to say in which particular node and uh, port number the master is running so in that case in the code if you give localhost 8080 that's wrong you cannot give web port number so you have to give this particular url in the program to say where the master is running because the request goes to master and then only master will decide in which particular node the work has to be get distributed so we have rpc port number that has to be used in your uh, program so for example you are writing a program to connect spark with some ui or spark with some nosql database or only in spark you want to do something for anything that you want to do to say where the master is running you have to give this url so you don't want to mention how many workers and workers url under that spark master will take care okay so rpc is what you have to mention in your code process level communication about the word count program in apache spark so uh, uh, if people are very new to this big data field i, I would just wanted to tell you one thing so uh, uh, in in spark or in hadoop or even in any other technologies in big data the very first program people will use to go ahead is word counted similar to how we use hello world in other programming languages so similar to that people used to go with this word count program so uh, today i'm going to show you how to do this with scala in apache spark so the same way you can go ahead and do with python and java as well so um, uh, so I, I just have the program here and then I do have the input file as well so here the input file is in local that is in Linux but not in HDFS so in my upcoming video I'll show you how to read the data from HDFS also and process in spark okay so uh, here in spark I'm going to show you this in spark shell which is actually Scala spark supports two shell spark shell which is Scala and then there is PySpark so you can do with Py shell, python and shell but for java we don't have shell here for java you have to go with ides like eclipse or intellij you have to do a setup and then only you can able to uh, run the program so in my upcoming video i'll show you like how to uh, set up eclipse or intellij with spark uh, dependencies how to set up an id for spark and then how to build a jar file and submit in the cluster mode so this now i'm going to show you in in spark shell but not in the cluster mode i'll just start the spark shell so i, I will i'm not going to start spark service also so just for your practice it's not mandatory that you have to start the spark service the demons master and worker it's it's enough to just start only the spark shell or pi spark okay so let me start the spark shell so uh, when you when you start spark not spark shell when you start spark the service the master and worker you will be having an ui right so we we do have a ui localhost 8080 so now my spark service are running master and worker is running so this ui is actually the cluster mode web ui where you can monitor the list of workers and the list of application which is running but anything that you run in spark shell you will not able to see in this ui okay for if you want to see uh, whatever the program that you run in spark shell and if you want to monitor that you have a separate ui for spark shell which is actually localhost which actually runs on localhost 4040 okay okay let me see whether my spark shell okay i haven't started the spark shell okay let me start the spark shell so then you can able to see uh, the spark shell uh, the web ui for spark shell it's getting started so uh, you can ask me like what is the difference between this web ui and this web ui content wise this two web uis will show you the same thing like how many applications and how many tasks are running and everything will be the same the common one the only different is so this is for shell the separate web ui has been built for shell and that is for your cluster mode okay let us wait for the spark shell to get start okay so the spark shell has been started and so that uh, you will get the spark shell ui 
now so and one more thing uh, like uh, once the spark shell is started like you can you can just like that whatever the code that you with that you type inside spark shell is actually scala and for python there is a separate py shell uh, let me show you the code in the meantime uh, like we don't want to wait for the ui let me go ahead and explain you the code and then we can see the ui so this is the code and you can see it's just two lines of code so this is one line and i do have another line here and that's all and this is my input file which is in my local so hi welcome to my channel 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 is two times and then a to z knowledge now if you see here so uh, in general uh, spark and hadoop are like it, it, it process the data in parallel so if you take uh, the parallel any parallelism technology we call it as mpp massive parallel processing technology if you go for any parallel processing technology there is two things you have to do first you have to you have to process the data in parallel and finally you have to bring it to one place so that means grouping so we call it as whatever the parallelism task that you are running is called map and then at last when you do grouping we call it as reduce it's a general term so when i use the map and reduce in spark don't think this is map reduce in hadoop okay so it's a general term even in map reduce first we call we do parallelism with map and finally we group it and we call that as reduce right the same thing so the the same analogy the the words we are using the same words the terms we are using uh, but it's it's actually spark it's not your uh, map reduce what you see in hadoop okay like the word is same i'm just using it so now like uh, you can see where so uh, as i told you already in my previous video spark introduction video so you need the prerequisite you need to know scala or java or python or any programming language the basics will help you to understand the coding what you do in your spark so where and val there are two types of keywords which we use to declare a variable with the keyword var or val so var is a keyword which we use to uh, um, uh, which we use uh, in the in the spark uh, declaring in front of the uh, variable and val is also we used in front of uh, variable so var and val it's it's just uh, it's like a, a keyword what you use static and final in your uh, java so similar to that so var is something immutable and uh, where uh, immutable is sorry var is mutable that means you can able to change the value throughout your program and if you assign it as a val it's immutable that means you can't change the value it's similar to final keyword in the java okay so you can use anything for now so val a sc okay what is sc here okay so let me show you one more thing we started the spark shell right and you can able to see here spark context is available as sc so spark context is like an entry point for the spark compiler to start uh, processing your code so in normal in programming languages we do have main method right so similar to that here we used to have this sc spark context so since the spark shell you are you are starting spark shell the spark shell itself will initialize and create the spark context for you as a, as a name in the name as sc but if you are uh, writing the same code in id is like eclipse or IntelliJ. you have to create spark context for your program okay but as i told you i will show you in the upcoming videos fine back to the code so i'm reading the file which is in my local and then i'm doing a flat map uh, transformation on top of uh, the word what i have so it means the file what i have so if you see here i'm writing some kind of an inline function so flat map so what is flat map so if i am giving string to a flat map gautam so that's my name so i'm giving gautam string as an input for flat map the output will be g comma o comma w comma t comma h comma a comma m so it's it's it just split the words okay so here flat map is a function which will flatten your data so for inside this i'm just writing in function line uh, uh, dot split by uh, space so the delimiter in my input file is space so first i have to process this uh, uh, words right so which i have to do it in parallel and finally the count should happen in the grouping part so the process in the sense like i have to check for i have to fetch the word burst based on the delimiter which is space so that means my final output will be like hi space welcome space to space um, my channel channel a to z knowledge now then i am just passing that output to my map transformation so in map transformation i'm splitting i'm i'm, I'm creating a key value pair so word is something the input uh, the, the words and one 
I'm just hard coding one with all the word because at least uh, the word will be have will be in one occurrence right at least one will be there so one occurrence will be there so I'm just hard coding one so the output of this particular line will be hi one welcome one two one my one channel one channel one because I'm not doing any kind of grouping here so still you will be seeing the duplicates and then one will be hard coded to hard coded to it and finally comes to the grouping part I'm, I'm i'm just doing some kind of a shuffle operation a grouping operation called reduce by key so this reduce by key what it will do it will first uh, take the key and then it will check for the value so it will first take high and then zero it, it it will it will start with zero so zero plus one so that means one this one the value so zero plus one is equal to one again and then it will take welcome so then it will do like uh, uh, it will check for is there any other repeated word no so then it will take welcome and then one so it, it will do zero plus one again and then two my everything same but when it comes to channel what it will do first it will check for for every word it will check for the duplicates so if you see here it, it checks that there is a two occurrence of channel so it will group those two words and then it will group only the key which is very important uh, the reduce by key function it's it's it, it's only will do the grouping and sorting based on the key but not on the value so still if you see the value has not yet grouped instead the value has been stored as a list so the channel has been grouped as one word and then one comma one so the it, it, it gets stored in the list now this reduce by key will take this channel and then it will iterate this values so it will start like 0 plus 1 1 there is one more one again one plus one two that's all the list the list is empty now so it will it will give the answer as two and then it will go go ahead with the next key and then again it will start with zero plus whatever the value you have given okay so if you run this you will be getting the final output so let me run this code in the spark shell okay so if you see in spark we used to call spark as lazy evaluation that means your transformation will get start only when there is an action in your code so uh, that is we call lazy evaluation which is bottom to top approach spark uh, programs whatever the apis and syntax what, what you are writing has been split into two major thing transformation action transformation is something you do all type of any transformations if you see in our code we use like text file flat map map produce by key all these are transformations and and finally I have to perform some action and then only like I can able to something like you have you can save it to a file or you can you can show the output you can print the output you can collect it so we do have some keywords for actions as well so only when there is an action spark will start compiling the code okay that is a lazy evaluation and it's an added advantage in spark actually okay let me see why my spark shell is not getting started okay so it says 4043 okay so because i can able to see here uh, it's tried with like 40 40 and then it's it's it, it couldn't bind it so it just created the spark uh, ui in the port number as 40 43 so you can see the ui is named as spark shell so anything that you run shell you can able to see those applications you can monitor here so i have executed the very first line of the code but I'd, i'm not seeing anything here the reason as i told you it's a bottom to top approach until there is an action like once you perform an action and then only you can see all the uh, uh, progress here so what is the next line um, it, it is the reduce by key okay so even now if i refresh uh, the page i will i will not see anything because this reduce by is key is again a transformation now finally this b dot collect is an action it will just uh, show you the output here so collect is actually an action now the transformation will start the processing will get start once the collect when you execute this collect then the map transformation and reduce by transformation everything will be get started so if you see here welcome one my one a to z knowledge is one high one two one and channel is two times so this is the final output so now if i refresh my web page i can able to see 
yeah you can see the collect action if and the four task has been created and four task has completed and you can click this so you will be seeing the direct, direct cyclic graph visualization it will show you the stages of the code spark standalone architecture so spark has various deployment modes so spark with yawn spark with mesos and then spark standalone so when we say spark standalone architecture so spark as a cluster you are you are just installing only spark as a cluster in single node or multi node so only you are installing spark and you are doing all your activities the jobs everything only with spark so you are not using any hadoop or any other technology integrated so which means we call that as spark standalone cluster so even with spark standalone cluster you can build multi node clusters you can do uh, distributed parallel processing jobs execution and all those things but in real time mostly we used to integrate with hadoop that we call that as spark yawn deployment mode okay, and spark with yawn deployment mode i will make a video in my upcoming uh, sessions okay so uh, let's get into uh, the topic so uh, this will be completely and uh, uh, theoretical stuff it, uh, we, it means not in this video i'm not uh, explaining i'm not going to explain any practical stuff but in my upcoming videos i'll be doing it okay so uh, before getting into this like few terminologies we need to know so uh, the f very first thing when you install spark as a cluster when you start the daemons uh, when you start the spark cluster you will be getting some daemons when you say daemons uh, when we say daemons it's a background process which act as a backbone for the cluster so uh, with respect to hadoop term i can say like you have name node data node resource manager node manager secondary name node similar to that when you start spark you have uh, two daemons which is called master and then worker so master is a uh, same like master what we say in hadoop name node so similar to that here the daemon name itself a master and worker is uh, a slave node master means a master node worker is a worker slave node spark comes under master slave architecture so uh, master and worker are the two daemons which you will be seeing when you give jps command after installing and starting the spark cluster and the next one next one is uh, the term that which we need to know is driver program so what is driver program okay so uh, the program what you write so in spark you write some program uh, that could be word count program or whatever you write in scala or uh, uh, java or pyspark whatever it is fine so you write a program so in which you will be having something called driver part where you will be uh, 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 declaring the spark context so spark context is an entry point for your program which act as a main method in other programming languages like java and uh, uh, python and all we have main method Method, right so main method act as a starting point for the compiler to start the execution so similar to that in spark we have spark context so our hype context or whatever it is so uh, the, the that area of code which you are doing we call it as a driver program and this driver program is the service which will be get started in the spark master and then the driver program will do all the activities of your job job to task and all those stuff so that is again i am going to i am going to explain you so driver program under which we will get the complete program and the main part is spark uh, the context uh, so which is the entry point for your compiler to start the uh, complete execution okay so now uh, i am a client so i'm i'm writing a program i'm i'm build a jar file and then so i'm i'm doing it from my client node so client node is a node uh, which will be connecting to the cluster so now i'm sending an spark submit request with my jar file so this request goes to spark master so spark master machine okay so this in in this spark master so there will be a process get started which is called driver program so this driver program that will be get started for each and every job that you submit so i am submitting a job so i i will get one driver program so similar to that like there is one more job request is coming from a client so uh, you will be getting an another uh, driver program so so this driver program is the one which will be act as a main source or point of contact for the complete job execution so in this driver program uh, now it it tries to start your execution plan so this driver program will communicate with another person uh, 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 as a, as a uh, main thing we call it as a cluster manager 
So cluster manager is a service that runs within your Spark itself. So Spark itself has a cluster manager. So what is this? The, what is the main job of this cluster manager is? So driver program will communicate with cluster manager. So because driver program uh, want to run the job, whatever you have submitted, and to run this job, so the driver program has to connect with cluster manager and cluster manager. So the, it's a request. So driver program will send a request to cluster manager asking for resource. When we say resource CPU uh, resource and then uh, RAM and all those stuff so uh, for a particular given program how much memory I have to allocate or how much cores I have to allocate so the these things and all as a developer you have to say uh, you have to specify when you uh, submit your spark submit command so how to determine that it's a, there is a special calculations are there in my upcoming videos you will be seeing that as of now just imagine I am requesting for 4 GB RAM and some CPU cores so this request from the driver program goes to cluster manager and uh, its request to cluster manager asking for I need this much RAM this much core and what this cluster manager will do this cluster manager will will allocate that resource, the particular resource whatever requested by the driver program so what this cluster manager will do so we have slave nodes slave nodes in spark is called worker node so worker node 1 worker node 2 worker node 3 and then worker node 4 so this cluster manager will launch something called executor so driver program is asking for the resource to the cluster manager now cluster manager is allocating the resource uh, in the in the form of executors so imagine I, I'm, I'm running this jar file to an input file of size 1 GB and this 1 GB data has been already distributed in my uh, hard disk okay so just imagine like uh, this 1 GB has been splitted into two so distributed so data has to be get distributed before you start your parallel processing that is the agenda right I want to do a parallel processing and that means your data has to be get distributed before so now in my uh, uh, I'm, I'm using some storage system in which data has been already distributed now on top of it I'm submitting some spark job I'm assigning some task so here uh, imagine this 1 GB file has been splitted as 2 so we can call it as blocks B0 B1 so B0 has been stored in uh, so we can have a number for the nodes okay it's already there so W3 which is worker node third mission I have B0 and then B1 is in fourth mission okay so this cluster manager will 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 identify this B0 and B1 and that is we call it as data locality so I want to start my job only on which my data has present only on the node in which my data is present that is called data locality imagine now cluster manager is trying to assign a task here and what is the need the, in in this node I don't have any of my data right so it's it's it's, it's waste so data locality is something uh, and I have to understand in which node the particular requested data has been stored only in that I have to assign the task so all these informations will be there with the cluster manager now this cluster manager will assign the uh, uh, whatever whatever it is assigning is nothing but it's 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 like a resource it's creating a resource okay it's not uh, assigning the job what you have written in jar file so cluster manager will not do that so cluster manager is, is, is just allocating the resource whatever requested by the driver program in this node so this cluster manager is uh, allocating a resource in the name of executors executors just imagine executor is a box in which your task will get executed okay just imagine like that so now this executor once it got created this executor themselves they will registered with the driver program they will send an heartbeat to the driver program once it is created also cluster manager will inform I have created the requested uh, resource in the form of executors so cluster manager will inform at the same time this all uh, this particular worker nodes uh, they will send the heartbeat to this driver program saying that this executor has been created now this driver program will start monitoring this worker nodes and the executors and also this driver program will assign the job whatever you have written in this jar file to this executor for the computation see I have a job I have to fetch top one from this B0 and then I have to fetch top one from B1 so my agenda is to fetch top from top first from this file but this file has been splitted into two so first I have to fetch top first from this and then I have to fetch top first from this and finally I have to fetch top first from these two output 
okay so now first i have to do a parallelism and then finally i have to do a grouping now imagine i am having 1 gb data which has been splitted as two and the job what i have written is to fetch top one so the job the same job will execute on these two nodes uh, uh, this executors will launch a task and this task will take this b0 as an input and then it will start doing the processing and this executor again it will launch a task and then it will start taking this b1 from the disk and it will start doing the processing okay so these two tasks runs at the same time at the same time this this empty worker nodes will also send heartbeats stating that we are live so that will happen so it's it's not only the node which has the job and data will send the heartbeat it's not like all the worker node will send so this particular uh, heartbeat that is going to driver program so these were uh, these uh, particular uh, heartbeats from the other worker nodes are going to spark master okay so this driver program uh, is responsible for these two nodes because the data present on these two and this driver program is monitoring and also assigning the tasks tasks the task is nothing but the program what you have written okay now these two executor runs at the same time and then it will it is also doing the monitoring thing now what this executor will do as i already told you this executor will launch a task and once the task is completed the output of the task will be get stored by this executor so where this output will be get stored you can ask me this question so spark will store the output in, in it, but that is what we call it as persist in spark so persist is a separate topic i will explain you in upcoming videos but here just i'm going to give you some one-liner definition of what it is so we have uh, a persist like disk what intermediate data so this is not the final output right we call this as an intermediate data so this is intermediate data right final output is the final top first okay so this is intermediate data so the intermediate data can be stored in the pers it can be persisted in three way three ways disk only memory only and then both disk and memory okay so uh, memory only is most efficient because it's uh, the spark is all about in memory so disk is something uh, we will have disk io so memory is it's the best one so imagine like uh, you have a problem with memory so that you can go with the disk okay this is how the traditional map reduce will work so the your intermediate output will get stored in disk so uh, here you have both options and final option is disk and memory so wh what is the need of disk and memory is so uh, like uh, for example the output has been stored in memory and this output will be get transfer to a, the next transformation is to fetch the grouping part the, i have to group it and get final one so that will be acted as a separate task will run in a different machine so uh, while while uh, while i'm transferring this data for the next action for next task so during that time if the memory has been crashed or something the intermediate data will get lost so if i use both disk and memory so even if the memory got crashed the data can be get retrieved from the disk it's up to you your cluster based on your cluster resource based on your design you can decide which persist mode that you can go with okay so here what is the next step is so this output will be get stored based on what persist method you have given so once these two tasks got completed so driver program will come to know this is completed so next to what is there okay next thing is i have a grouping part in my code so the grouping can be like uh, reduce by key or short by key some uh, a grouping action uh, like uh, sorry grouping transformations you have written some shuffle transformation you have written so now the driver program will decide to go with some other machine which is free to run the shuffle task okay let me pick this i mean driver program can pick this the driver program can also pick these two node also it's it's uh, until and unless when the node is free it you it will use it so imagine just driver program is using this node and executor will be get started here again the driver program will communicate with the cluster manager and it will get the resource to start the executor here and this executor will uh, send heartbeat to this driver program and this driver driver program will start monitoring this executor now this ex executor will start the task and this task will read the data that means this intermediate data the shuffled data so when it comes here the shuffle operation will happen and then the final output so this task is something again the code what you have written for grouping okay so that code will be get transferred here this executor will run the task and then finally the executor will decide where to store the final output so that can be in disk or it can be again in memory so that can be used by the next program for the computation or whatever it is so finally i can store this in uh, hdfs or i can store it in some rdbms or i can store it in some nosql database that is up to you okay so now 
whatever we have seen so far is a successful case right so driver program to executor so once the parallelism is completed final grouping tasks so all these stuffs we have discussed and uh, the technical terms master worker driver program uh, persist methods and then tasks executors everything we have seen and heartbeats monitoring thing client mode all those things we have seen now we can jump into the failure scenarios which is very important to consider now imagine uh, so here if you see I'm having an executor which is running in task what if this executor get failed due to some problem some temporary memory issue or network issue so if this particular executor only got failed so the spark the driver program will retry to create one more executor on this node and then the task will be get recomputed so due to this one executor fails it will not affect any other executor for the same job which is running in another other nodes in other nodes okay so only this particular executor fail it will relaunch it now the next point what happened if the whole the, the the node itself goes down the mission itself got crashed the hardware itself got crashed okay that was one good uh, kind of question that should rise in your mind so when this particular worker node itself is got failed so the data what you have in this will be get failed and the and the, and the task what got what what was getting executed in this will get will be get failed and because of one a particular task got failed you will not get this intermediate output from this node so without this output you cannot complete your whole job output right I cannot miss some piece of output and then finalize a, a finalize the final output which you can't do so that means your whole job will be get killed and again you have to read the data because this b1 data is missing due to the worker node crash again you have to read the complete data from the source and then you have to re-trigger the job once again so how to avoid this scenario okay now imagine so I have only one copy of B0 and B1 so if the, the storage the storage system what you, you are using in this worker node imagine if it is HDFS okay if you are using file systems like HDFS which will distribute the data and also which will replicate the data am I right so that means when you have replication so imagine now I am not using any uh, 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 HDFS file system the architecture what I wanted to explain you is a standalone uh, spark that means you will not have any replication strategy in the disk level so in that case what will happen the replication will not be there for the data so your whole job will be get killed but spark itself has a option to uh, create replication in the memory uh, you can use RDD to create replications so imagine your replications are, are okay uh, let I don't want to confuse you by including HDFS now so imagine this b0 and b1 can be reconstructed in the memory itself so because in spark standalone architecture uh, means you are reading the data from uh, Linux file system or Windows which is standalone file system which is not distributed so when there is no distributed uh, file system uh, uh, where the data comes from is not a distributed file system then spark itself has the talent to distribute and create replica for your input data in the memory itself okay spark has the talent so now imagine when this data has been getting uh replicated so b0 b1 and i have one more copy b0 b1 in this node also but these these all these blocks are in memory imagine in that way now this particular node itself got crashed so i have one more copy so all these informations will be maintained as a metadata information for the driver program and uh, this driver program will get all this information based on the heartbeat that receives that it receives from the worker node so when i say driver program combination of spark master and driver program it can able to understand uh, uh, which node has what data all these metadata informations okay so uh, you can ask me like uh, the metadata information is really hold by the driver program and spark master yes because this is standalone architecture this is not yawn okay so now this driver program will recreate this executor by discussing with this cluster manager for getting the resource and this driver program uh, this cluster manager will launch the executor in this node because the second replica of b1 is here so the executor will be get created here and the task will be get created here only this particular task will be get recomputed and then it will use b1 and it will be, it will give the output so other tasks will not be get impacted so as a developer i will not come to know this is all happening internally uh, that means some node 
nodes got down and the executor has been relaunched in some other node so this as a developer i will not come to know okay so that is uh, a important thing failures with respect to uh, uh, the hardware as well as software failures both the failures we discussed with the executor means with the worker node perspective nothing happens bad even if it get get fails when the replication is available your job will not be get impacted so the impact the, the serious condition is only when there is no replication your entire job will be get failed and again you have to read the data from input source and then again you have to load it distribute it and then again you have to read on the job now the condition is now the next failure case is what if this driver program got failed okay so when you submit uh, 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 spark submit command uh, in the standalone mode uh, you have to specify an parameter called supervise when you do this when you pass this supervised supervised uh, parameter when driver program get failed spark master will recreate a driver program and then all your jobs tasks will be get started from first okay so this driver program once get failed what will happen is all your worker node executors with respect to that job will get failed now when you give supervise the spark master will recreate the same driver program for you and then again it will start recomputing all the uh, uh, program the tasks whatever created whatever required for this particular job so this is also fine now the next question is what if my spark master itself goes down okay that is called a single point of failure so even the problem was there in hadoop even i mean in the earlier release version and even in spark also in the earlier release we got the problem of spoc which is called a single point of communication and single point of failure spof so when you have spoc you will have spo yeah single point of failure so we have a technology called zookeeper which helps us to bring ha ha means high availability client used to ask this question whether this cluster has ha that means high availability even if master goes down still the running jobs will has to run good so that is what ha high availability so in the spark and hadoop initial version there is no ha and later point of time with the, with the help of the zookeeper they have introduced more than one master so that means you can have like uh, one active master and more than one passive master passive master is a masters that will be ready in position when active master goes down the passive will become active at any point of time only one active is allowed at the remaining uh, all masters will be in the mode of passive okay so that thing will be taken care by this zookeeper so i i configured like four master for my spark one will be inactive remaining will be as passive master so now zookeeper is a daemon which will monitor all these master nodes once when the active is goes down the zookeeper will do an election and it will consider any one out of this three as active master and uh, once uh, okay this will be an active master so jobs will not be get impacted now i am repairing this node and i am adding it back to master means it will get the position as passive master it will not get active because already active is there okay so now here uh, what passive masters will do active masters what active master is doing is it's speaking with cluster manager getting resource and then allocating tasks to the executors that is worker nodes and monitoring it what passive master will do right passive masters will not allocate anything but all passive masters will get heartbeats from all the worker nodes that is the one thing what passive masters will do so even though passive master is not doing anything but it will get it will get heartbeats from the uh, uh, workers uh, why it is getting heartbeat when the active master goes down when the passive become active it will be in sync so so that's the reason even though passive master is not doing anything it will be uh, getting heartbeats from worker nodes so that means all these worker nodes will send heartbeats to passive masters also so this is passive master at the same time it will send heartbeats to active masters also so but active master only will speak with cluster manager getting resource allocating task all those thing will be done by only active uh, master okay so here we discussed about uh, ha with respect to spark so zookeeper now you can ask me uh, what happen if zookeeper get fails okay so uh, that is an interesting question people used to ask me when i explain this ha high availability if you take any cluster computing right there is two major cluster computing master and slave peer to peer master and slave means this architecture peer to peer means uh, uh, there is no slaves no master concept that is peer to peer each and every node in the cluster will act like a friends 
so if, if this node goes down no issues nothing will be goes down so there is no spoc that is that means there is no single point of communication so there is no single point of failure but zookeeper comes under leader and follower this is a cluster type that means so one leader will be there two follower will be there when the leader get failed the immediate next follower will become leader so this is how zookeeper works so that means at any point of time th there is no need of uh, monitoring zookeeper so zookeeper itself work as leader follower we don't want to uh, uh, worry about what happen if zookeeper get fails so how installing one zookeeper is a bad idea so you have to install more than uh, three plus zookeepers then only your zookeeper will be in HA okay so but uh, handling ha for zookeeper it itself will take care okay so in this video like we discussed most like the main agenda is when i submit a job what happens internally and the failure and success case we have in, uh, discussed so uh, I, this is completely called a spark standalone cluster architecture i'll be explaining you spark with yawn as well so uh, you will not see much big difference okay with yarn but uh, spark with yarn is what really people are using in real time but still uh, from the spark perspective standalone architecture how it works is also important for us to understand thanks for watching this part one video i highly recommend you to continue watching the part two video also so i have given the link in the description box of this video where you can find part two video thanks for watching